Behind You Book 6 in the Warrior Series By Ty Patterson Chapter 1 Five Years Back The three men took turns raping Elena Petrova. One of them was bald and built like a retired boxer, another was of average build and had a pockmarked face, the last one had long straggly hair tied back in a ponytail. The first one finished, the second ponytail took his place. They cracked jokes while they were at it, commented on her body and went at her until she faded out. Ponytail slapped her face and brought her back to consciousness. She looked at him with dull eyes, her body jerking with every thrust he made. Her feet were spread apart and tied. So were her hands. Her mouth was the only part of her body that was unrestrained. She had screamed when they had grabbed her, shouted until she went hoarse. They had laughed. There wasn't anyone to hear her. They were now in a small shack surrounded by miles of nothing. Flat land, sparse vegetation, the occasional coyote that didn't care if Elena screamed her heart out. It was Boxer's turn then. He looked at Ponytail and made a crude remark. They all laughed. He was vicious and brutal, drew blood. Elena didn't feel it. She had lapsed into darkness again. Boxer shook her awake, punctuating his motion with light slaps. She came to sluggishly and then jerked in shock when Pockmark threw a bucket of cold water on her. Boxer's mean eyes narrowed at her as he squeezed her breast cruelly. This is the first warning. This is the only warning you'll get. They left her in the shack still tied down with nothing but the dark to keep her company. She heard them driving away and then the silence grew on her and mocked at her. Elena shouted in the dark, but no one came to her rescue. Her head fell back. I am going to die. Her eyes couldn't even squeeze out tears. Present. Elena Petrova woke up screaming in the night. Her hand clawed out and knocked over a glass of water, and its shattering woke her fully. It was a balmy night in Cheyenne. She was in her two-bedroom apartment, in a block not very far from the governor's mansion. She listened keenly but heard nothing alarming. Nothing other than her own hoarse breathing. She looked at the night clock, 2 a.m. Such nights were common, especially since she had restarted her investigation. She got out of bed, gingerly stepped around the shards of glass, went to the bathroom and washed her face. She rinsed her mouth, ignored the hollow eyes set in a pale face looking back at her in the mirror. She brewed tea, let its warmth fill her as she powered on her computer. She read all that she had typed, made some corrections and wrote some notes. She would start making calls the next day. Today, she reminded herself. Next day was now. Elena Petrova was an investigative journalist. Her hard-hitting exposes on the misdeeds of politicians and government leaders had landed her accolades on the East Coast. After working for more than three decades with the country's biggest papers in New York and Washington, D.C., she had retired eight years back to her family home in Wyoming from where she freelanced. She was 50, single, no immediate family, a few close friends, not weighed down by debt, a lifestyle envied by many. Her articles were sought out by the big publishers both coasts of the country. Now that she was not a hostage to deadlines, her exposés went deeper, hit harder, and at least two city governments had toppled because of her writing. Six years back she had come across the man in Wyoming. Everyone knew him, but no one really did. That was his knack, projecting an image but keeping his personal life very private. He had enormous wealth. No one quite knew how he had amassed it. He had power. He was power. The few people Elena spoke to told her to forget him and drop her investigation. Elena scoffed. She had been to several White House dinners, had the country's senior-most politicians on her speed dial, and had hobnobbed with the richest entrepreneurs. Some guy, however rich and famous, wasn't going to scare her off. One night a brick smashed through a window of her pickup truck. There was a note tied to it. Back off. She took the note to the sheriff. He shrugged, said he would look into it. Nothing much happened. 
Elena continued asking questions, interviewing people. It became a project that nagged at her. Then she was raped five years back. That memory was like yesterday. She had managed to free herself the day after her rape. Her wrists were bruised from rubbing the rope against the sharp edges of the wooden posts in the shack. Once free she had washed herself dressed in her clothes which were scattered on the ground. She had walked five miles before she hit the blacktop. Another two hours of waiting in the sun before she thumbed a ride. Going to the cops wasn't even an option. Boxer, Ponytail and Pockmark hadn't bothered to cover their faces. It was the man's message to her. He was power. She went to a discreet clinic where she was tested and then thanked God, who she no longer believed in, when all the tests came back negative. She dropped the story. Journalism was in her blood. However blood required a living heart to pump. She sold her family home and moved to Cheyenne. Bought an apartment close to the heart of the city and felt safer. The story didn't leave her though. It shamed her in the quiet times of the night. It popped up from nowhere when she was with friends, when the tendrils of steam from her tea enveloped her face. It occupied her mind when she went to the theater. It made her stand still when she was performing routine chores. It made her feel small. She started again a year back cautiously, using all the guile she could command. She created several false identities, using those to email questions. She used disposable phones to call people. She traveled under other false identities and used a wig and dark glasses as a disguise. She thought she was getting somewhere, getting the full picture on the man. What she knew scared her. What she would find out would terrify her. She was sure of that. She never got the chance to find out. A week from the nightmare, Elena Petrova returned to her apartment after her weekly grocery shopping. She dumped food in her refrigerator, stuck the electric kettle on, and turned to head to the bathroom. A scream burst through her, her bag fell and scattered its contents on the polished floor. Boxer was lounging against a wall. Ponytail was sprawled on her couch. Pockmark was chewing on a toothpick as he fiddled with her TV remote. Elena Petrova hyperventilated. Gun? No guns in her house. She didn't believe in them. Knife? She was too far from the kitchen counter. Nevertheless, she whirled and darted to the knife rack. A rough hand grabbed her hand and jerked her back. She screamed again. Shout all you want. No one out there. Boxer said carelessly and backhanded her. She fell, her lips burst and bled. He hauled her up and slapped her again. Slowly, methodically, the way he would build a rhythm with a speed bag, her head rocking with each blow. She struggled, clawed at him and kneed him. There was no effect on him. She was against a rock. When he finished she lay bruised, bleeding and semi-conscious. Pockmark flicked his eyes at her. She ain't done yet. She ain't told anything. I know. Boxer pulled out a knife and turned Elena on her back. She opened her eyes and saw the blade. One last scream escaped her before he went to work. They bundled her body in a carpet and drove through the night. When dawn came, they were in the foothills of the Wind River Range, in an area so remote that Google Maps didn't know of its existence. Boxer knew the area well. He had buried many a body there. They dug a grave, made sure there wasn't any trace left by them, and departed. They should have burned her body, but the man had a peculiarity. He thought the dead had to be buried. Who was going to argue with him? You sure it won't be discovered? Ponytail looked back at the receding grave. Boxer rolled down his window and spat a stream of tobacco juice. Betcha my life on it. Never seen another human there. Dumb folks go to all those hiking trails. No one comes here. Ponytail was satisfied. Boxer was the best at getting rid of bodies. They drove back, consuming miles of tarmac, discussing where they would stop for lunch. Boxer was right. 
People didn't go to that burial spot. It wasn't on any map and didn't have any trail or a view. It lacked water, vegetation, and even wildlife gave it a wide berth. Boxer hadn't reckoned on the one man who went camping in just those spots. One man who was restarting a vacation he had abandoned a while back. Zeb Carter discovered the grave a week later. Zeb looked around. No grave marker. After scanning the ground, reading what he could into it, he dug up the grave. He widened the grave further and drew a breath when he saw the woman. The body was still recognizable, full decomposition hadn't set in and scavengers hadn't reached it yet. He dug carefully and paused when he saw the slashes. He sat back on his haunches, studied the body, stepped back and looked for tracks. There weren't any other than his own. Wind, rain and the elements had erased whatever trail there had been. He sighed and looked around. This was going to derail his vacation. He was the only person in the visible universe, the only one who could be questioned. He pulled out his satellite phone, made a call, and set off a chain of events that Boxer had never anticipated. Chapter 2 The Wind River Range, a part of the Rocky Mountains located in western Wyoming, was over two million acres of rugged beauty and wilderness, and divided three watersheds, the Columbia River, the Colorado River, and the Missouri River. Zeb had camped in the Bridger Wilderness area for a week, enjoying the solitude and the vastness of the land. He had broken away from the usual trails and hadn't seen any other human being, which suited him just fine. He had seen a black bear and her cubs, coyotes, bald eagles and elks. Most hikers didn't see bears, and when Zeb spotted her, he followed her at a distance and watched as she played with her cubs. Coyotes had come out at night, smelled the human curiously, and on detecting no threat, had gone their way. After two weeks, Zeb had skirted to the eastern slope, and it was there, in the shelter of a rocky outcrop, that he had found the grave. He wouldn't have spotted it, but a midday thunderstorm had made him seek shelter in the outcrop. He had noticed the loose layer, contrasting sharply with the hard surrounding ground. He examined the layer curiously, scanned the surrounding area, and found no other such soil. He knelt down and tried to read the ground for tracks, but it was too hard and weather had erased any footprints. He drew a foot-long knife from his pack, and when the blade sank in relatively easily, he knew this was a man-made hole that had been covered up. He dug carefully and slowed down even further when he saw the pale flesh. He used his bare hands to remove the soil, ignoring the chips from stones and the cuts on his hands. He sat back on his haunches when he had uncovered the upper body and studied it. A woman's sightless eyes stared back at him, her mouth twisted in a rictus of horror. Decomposition had started, but her features were still recognizable, the knife wounds on her body were obvious. His eyes were drawn back to her face, and he wondered if she had been tied down when attacked. There were some marks on her face that suggested she had struggled, but he wasn't certain. Somewhere out there would be family and friends who would be waiting for her. They would wait, then fear would set in and the first call to the police would be made, and the system would swing into action. If they were lucky, the cops would get back to them, and there would be some kind of closure. If they weren't, the wait would go on and one day would turn into another, and when time had killed hope, days and nights would blur together and resigned acceptance would set in. In the here and now she lay still and motionless, with just him and the elements for company. He drew out his phone and took pictures of her body. He took close-ups of the wounds that had led to her death. He was certain she had died slowly and in great pain, and when he rose, the paleness of her body contrasted sharply with the beauty of the range. Her sightless eyes brought up another pair in his mind. Blue eyes that hadn't stopped smiling until the very end. Cold air filled his lungs but it couldn't keep away the darkness that flooded him and with it came the beast. It surged through his blood, bayed silently and demanded action. Zeb forced himself to move away from the grave and unclenched his fists. This is for the cops. I cannot avenge every dead woman. The beast howled in rage. I can't get involved every time someone is killed. He battled with the beast and slowly the darkness began to recede the beast dissolved into his blood. He made his call when his breathing was back to normal, his pulse was back to its low, steady beat. 
He settled back after he made the call. It would be a long wait. Pinedale, to the southwest of where he was, was the closest town and was the county seat of Sublet County. The town had a sheriff, but since the body had been found in a park ranger district, Zeb suspected there would be some interagency discussions and handing over. No motor vehicles were allowed in the wilderness, and given the terrain, Zeb suspected a chopper would be deployed to get the body, or a ranger vehicle would approach as close as it could get. He drank from his canteen, fastened it to his waist, and settled down against another rock. His phone buzzed. How's your vacation going? There was a smiley after the message. He ignored it. The sender persisted. You need backup. Broker said you were going soft and might need help. He sighed and thumbed back a terse no. Zeb was ex Special Forces, and on leaving the military, had worked for a few years as a private military contractor. His career as a PMC had come to an end quickly when he had received a call from an ice cool, gray eyed woman in Washington, D.C. Claire was the first female director of the agency, an organization that did not officially exist, which undertook missions no one heard of. The agency went after terrorists, despots, international criminal rings, all kinds of threats to the nation that couldn't be dealt with by conventional means. It recovered stolen weapons of mass destruction, wiped out drug and human trafficking mafias, and dealt with the shadowy powers that funded terrorists. It wasn't a policing organization. It delivered permanent solutions and took on the most extreme missions that other deep black agencies couldn't or wouldn't touch. Zeb called their missions exothermic, so hot that only the agency could execute them. Claire reported only to one person, the President of the United States. On assuming the role, Claire wanted to overhaul the agency so that it had the smallest possible administrative footprint and be completely deniable. She was discussing these challenges one evening in Washington, D.C., with Cassandra, her close friend and confidant. Cassandra and she had studied together at Bryn Mawr and had then pursued careers in the political jungle of the capital. Cassandra had joined the State Department while Claire started at the agency as an analyst. During dinner, she noticed a man outside their restaurant, a man who blended in, and yet something about him made her watch him. Traffic moved around him the way water flowed over rock. He was furniture on the street, and yet there was a liquid ease around him that reminded her of a cheetah. Cassandra noticed her distraction, followed her glance and laughed. That's my superhero brother, waiting to walk me back. He was in the special forces, worked on stuff he never talks about. She replied when Claire crooked an eyebrow. She smiled and continued. I asked him once about his missions, and he said if he told me he wouldn't have to kill me. I would kill myself. What does he do now? Claire swirled a stirrer in her drink absently. He works as a private military contractor. More money, Claire nodded knowingly, at which Cassandra's laugh bubbled. Money. Money has never motivated Zeb. He lives frugally and has done well with his investments. As far as I know, he doesn't need to work. It's not wealth that drives him. That man out there is the most principled human I have come across. He's also the most lethal man I know. Intrigued, Claire had pulled Zeb's file, the non-redacted one, and had blown her breath out softly when she read it. She called Zeb the next day and made him an offer. To her surprise, he turned her down. She was even more surprised when he made her a counteroffer. After she had considered it, she looked at him with new respect. Zeb's proposal was to staff the agency with private military contractors like himself, whose primary allegiance would be to the agency, but would be free to pursue other assignments during downtime. You get total deniability, the best people, and no administrative hassle. She greenlighted his proposal and gave him freedom to pick his agents. She wasn't disappointed when he presented his initial five nominees to her. They all came with exemplary services records and unquestionable integrity. All of them worked in the private sector, and that cover was maintained when they joined the agency. Broker was their intelligence analyst and logistics provider. 
He ran a successful information services business that catered to multinational corporations and world governments. He had an extensive network of agents all over the world who fed human intelligence to a highly sophisticated artificial intelligence software engine, Werner, which spewed out analyses that went out to his clients. Broker put his entire operation at the agency's disposal when he joined it. Broker was the oldest of them all, but his shaggy blonde hair, immaculate style and fitness made him out to be a decade younger. The majority of Zeb's crew were in their 30s. Broker, Bawana, Roger, Bear, and Chloe made up the original six-person team led by Zeb. All of them were New York-based, all former special forces, except Broker who had been in the Rangers, and Chloe, who had served in the 82nd Airborne. Beth and Megan Peterson, twins in their late twenties, were the newest additions to Zeb's crew. He had come across them when vacationing in Yellowstone National Park, and had rescued them from a gang of assassins. The twins, who ran their website consulting business in Boston, had no other family, and had pestered Zeb to join his team till he eventually gave in. They sold their business, relocated to New York, and now ran logistics and operations for the agency, leaving Broker free to focus on the intelligence gathering. The twins brought youth, sharp intelligence, vibrancy, and an irreverent sense of humor to the team. On one of the agency's missions, they had rescued the daughter of a high-ranking Middle Eastern royal. A grateful father had presented a check to Claire, a check that had many zeros on it. She had handed the check back to him with a smile. The agency didn't take rewards. The royal added two more zeros and pushed the check back at her. My daughter is my life. He said simply. Claire handed the check to Zeb and Broker, shrugged when they stared blankly at her. It's yours. Do with it what you wish. The six of them used the money to buy a 44-story building on Columbus Avenue, and once the sisters became part of the team, made them equal partners. They invested the rest of the reward, smart investments that multiplied and were each enormously wealthy, but they'd never worked for the agency for the money. Zeb was their team leader broker, the second in command, but they didn't have ranks. They were all equals, a tight-knit team that was family first and operative second. The president had once, in jest, referred to them as Claire's warriors. The name stuck. His phone buzzed again. Has the cavalry arrived? Zeb glanced at the message and a reluctant smile tugged his lips. All his crew wore GPS tags in their jackets and in their shoes. Werner kept track of them and flagged alerts if any of them were in danger. Werner had probably detected his call to the rangers and had alerted the twins which had prompted the texts. The twins took great delight in making Zeb speak, knowing that he preferred silence. A chopper announced the arrival of the rangers. It circled low over him for a while and landed carefully about half a mile away on a relatively flat surface. Zeb dug out his binoculars, trained them on the helicopter, and counted the people exiting it. 6. He settled back against the outcrop and waited. Waiting was natural for him. Waiting stalking and hunting. They were like breathing. Chapter 3 a tall man hailed Zeb when he was within hearing distance and came across and shook his hand. District Ranger Paul Rogers. He introduced himself. This part of the country comes under my jurisdiction. He nodded in the direction of another man wearing a ranger uniform. Chuck Bridging, my deputy. A third man approached them, studied the tall, rangy, brown-haired man and noted the lean hips and the sinewy build. He walked up and introduced himself as Jim Knoll, the sheriff of Sublette County. He waved at the rest of the men and introduced them as his deputies. The sheriff was as tall as Zeb, a shade over six feet, had thick brown hair that was combed neatly and viewed the world through dark sunglasses. He was breathing easily despite the steep hike from the chopper to the grave. He went to the grave without a further word, placed his hands over hips and eyed the body silently. The rangers joined him and the three talked to one another softly. Rogers and Noel broke away and turned back to Zeb. Take us through your story again, Noel's shades trained on Zeb his tone was even. 
The sun was lowering rapidly by the time the helicopter carrying Zeb and a couple of grim-faced men flew back to Pinedale. The woman's body had been choppered out earlier along with the rangers and Noel. Zeb overheard the conversation between the men. Rogers would be point man for the investigation, the sheriff would support with resources if needed. What about the FBI? Don't they get involved? Zeb asked them. One of them, a curly-haired man, shook his head. This is a ranger case. We don't get many dead bodies killed in this manner. Rogers wouldn't hand over the investigation to the feds. This could be his ticket to bigger things, the other man laughed cynically. Noel and Rogers were waiting for them when the chopper settled, and after issuing instructions to the men, the ranger eyed Zeb. You're heading back to the mountain range tomorrow. Yeah. Meet us in the morning before you go. Zeb stared back at him. That's one way of being polite. Why? Noel cut in before Rogers replied. Just procedure, Mr. Carter. Right now you are the only person who knows more than anyone else. Which isn't much. I just found the body. True, but that's still more than what we know. Zeb thought about it for a moment and nodded in assent. It's not as if I have anything pressing to do. He left them and after retrieving his SUV from a long-term car park, hunted for a hotel. Pinedale, a town with about 2,000 residents, was typical of many other small towns across America. It was organized around a main street, which in Pinedale's case was suitably called Pine Street, and was one of those towns that had no traffic lights. It was the gateway to the Wind River mountain range and the Bridger Wilderness, and while long-term residents prided themselves on knowing each other, a considerable number of visitors passed through the town every year. The town still witnessed the Green River Drift, one of the oldest and longest cattle drives in the country. The cattle drive, 70 miles long, ran in spring and fall, and saw cowboys move cattle between winter cattle allotments in the Bridger Teton National Forest and their home ranches. The town was also home to the Path of the Pronghorn, an annual migration of pronghorn to the Pinedale region, a migration that went back 7,000 years and was one of the few long-distance animal migrations in the West. Zeb checked into a rustic family-run hotel whose lobby was dotted with the mounted heads of animals, pronghorn, moose and deer. Their glassy stares contrasted with the warm smile the owner Don Besterman bore. She looked up with a knowing look in her eyes when he signed the register. You are the one who found the body? Zeb grinned. The speed of light had nothing on a small town's grapevine. Yes ma'am. Sheer dumb luck and all that. If you can call it luck. They say she was murdered? He put on his poker face. I've no idea, ma'am. The rangers or the sheriff will have a better idea. He was aware of her keen glance sizing him up shrewdly as he pocketed his credit card. My son joined the 7th Special Forces Group last year. You think he made a good choice? The best, ma'am. She handed him a slip of paper the next day when he was heading out early in the morning. Zeb turned it over. It was a voucher for lunch at Pete's, a restaurant he had seen on the main street. She read his look and her bright smile flashed again. No is not an acceptable answer, young man. He nodded in thanks and stepped out to fuel himself for the day. Traffic was still thin on Pine Street when he had finished, the occasional pickup truck, a horse rider, a few pedestrians were the only signs of life. He walked to the sheriff's office and was ushered into a room that was comfortable, intimate, and yet formal. Noel was on the phone when Zeb entered, he bobbed a greeting at Zeb, jerked his head sideways at the other occupant, Rogers. Zeb exchanged a cool glance with the ranger, seated himself and waited patiently for the sheriff to finish his call. You were in the army, weren't you? Roger shot as soon as Noel hung up. Zeb looked at him quizzically, and then at the sheriff. Yeah. So. You were in special forces, the guys who know all about killing. Roger went on without acknowledging Zeb's question. From the corner of his eyes, Zeb saw the sheriff roll his eyes. Rogers. The ranger held a palm up, cutting off the sheriff, and waited for Zeb to respond. Zeb didn't. 
He knew where Rogers was going with his questioning. I asked you a question, Mr. Carter. Or is that Major Carter? His voice was polite. Just about. And I answered it yesterday, a few times. Where are you going with this? You think it's just coincidence that a man who knows all about killing is the one who conveniently finds the dead body? Are you pinning this on me? Rogers, Noel began and was cut off again by Rogers' growl. I am telling you, you are a person of interest. Can you start by telling us where you were a week back? All your movements from that point on. Zeb crossed his legs and hid his smile. Rogers was going to be sorely disappointed. Zeb could not only provide him with what he wanted, he could also detail his movements to the minute. You got an email? Roger's angry look turned to puzzled, and reluctantly recited his work email. What has my email got to do with your movements? You'll see. Zeb drew out his sat phone, punched through a menu, and put it away minutes later. Check your email. Rogers hesitated, not liking where this was going, but since it was he who had opened that line of questioning, he unfolded his tablet and compressed his lips to a thin line when he went through Zeb's email. Zeb's phone not only had a GPS tracker, it had a program that could generate reports on movement for any time frame. The report Zeb had forwarded to Rogers had details of his locations from the time he left New York. Zeb looked at the ranger whose face was now covered in a dull flush and who refused to meet his eyes. Zeb felt a stab of sympathy for him. Rogers, he said softly, let this investigation run its course. Chances are you'll find the perp soon enough. Rogers nodded stiffly and made no effort to stop Zeb when he rose and headed out. Zeb waited outside for a second and felt Noel come up beside him. The sheriff donned his shades and surveyed the street which was now drenched in sun and was bustling with activity. My apologies, Noel drawled. Rogers never had to deal with an incident like this all his life. He's out of his depth at the moment, but he's an okay guy. Hope our welcome hasn't put you off our town. Zeb grinned at him, liking the easygoing lawman. No danger of that, sir. I like your town. It has an Old West feel to it. Best of all, I like the mountains and lakes around you folks. Noel nodded. Jim. Zeb. Noel pumped his hand with a firm grip. We have a mutual friend. He removed his shades at Zeb's raised eyebrow and polished them slowly. Kelly, Chief of Police at Jackson. He and I go a long way back, we started together at the police academy. He heard of the body, called me, and when I mentioned your name he jumped. He couldn't stop laughing when I said Roger saw you as a person of interest. He said you had a hand in cleaning up his town some years back. He looked inquisitively at Zeb, and when he got no reply he smiled. He said you wouldn't answer. Zeb shrugged. I was just drifting through Jackson then. Things happened, I got involved. Nothing to it. Kelly exaggerates. The sheriff laughed knowingly and shook hands with Zeb again. Will we be seeing you again? He queried Zeb's departing back. Nope, Zeb replied over his shoulder. The mountains will though. Lunch at Pete's and then resume my vacation, thought Zeb, as he donned his shades and swerved around a bunch of tourists. Pete's was light and airy. It had a dark oak bar at one end and about twenty well-spaced tables in front of it. A bald, round-faced man was behind the bar, serving customers. He nodded at Zeb and gestured, take any table. Zeb dropped into a chair, his back to the wall and idly picked up the menu. It featured a smiling, bald, round-faced man who bore a resemblance to the bartender. Zeb was digging into his steak when the three men ranged in front of him. They had seated themselves near him, and he had been aware of their glances his way. He hadn't paid much notice, figuring it was the town's grapevine at work. Zeb looked up and took them in. All three were of average height, the one in the middle was brown-haired, the one to his right was dark-haired, and third man had nervous eyes. All three wore range garb seen on many men in the town. No weapons visible, but then a knife or a gun is very easy to conceal. 
Zeb waited for them to speak, and when they didn't, resumed his eating. Brown hair came close and brushed his table with his thigh. That ain't very polite. Chapter 4 Wasn't meaning to be, Zeb told him and chewed on his steak slowly. Brown hair hesitated for a moment. He wasn't expecting a blunt reply, he wasn't prepared for indifference. You're the one who found that body, aren't you? Some folks say you killed that lady, buried her up there and then called the rangers, acting innocent. He spoke loudly, and in the relative quiet of the restaurant, his words rang out. Heads turned, chairs squeaked as the other patrons swiveled to see the show. Dark hair chewed gum and looked Zeb up and down. We don't like killers over here. We suggest you leave town as soon as you finish your meal. In fact, we'll see you off when you're finished. Brown hair chimed in. Zeb couldn't conceal his bemusement. Are you guys for real? Brown hair turned red and did the thigh nudging table thing. Why don't you find out? A family was seated right behind the three men, parents, and a young girl, maybe seven years old, the younger boy. The girl was looking at Zeb with wide eyes, and when he met her glance, she looked away. The mother whispered something to them, and they turned their backs on Zeb. Punks behaving as if this was the Wild West. Someone's put them up to it. Don't make a scene here. Pete was watching from behind the bar, but he made no move to intervene. Zeb took another bite and leaned back. Good steak. I might have a second helping. I want to try the apple pie too. But I can't have both. No room. What do you recommend? Steak or pie? Nervous fidgeted on his feet. Brown hair gave him an irritated look, leaned forward and placed his hands on the table. Listen carefully, prick. We don't want you in Pinedale. It ain't healthy for you. Finish up and leave. Yeah, and don't talk fancy. Dark hair backed him up. Zeb didn't respond. He was looking at the man's hands. His nails were clipped neatly and evenly and showed signs of good care. This wasn't a man who worked outdoors a lot. Zeb hefted his knife and fork and smiled at brown hair, who suddenly realized Zeb could have pinned him to the table. He jerked his hands away as if burned and his face turned red. He opened his mouth to speak and snapped it shut when Zeb glided to his feet, rushed past him and strode to the bar. Zeb passed the girl's table and felt her boring holes in his back. He turned smoothly on his heel and crouched next to her. Her mother drew a sharp breath, her father said something. Zeb ignored both. Someday you might come across such bullies. When you do, you can either walk away or walk toward them. Walk away and you'll sleep well. Walk toward them and you might get beaten. But you'll sleep much better. He threw bills on the bar, nodded at Pete, stepped out and walked swiftly, aware of several pairs of eyes following him through the glass front. Those guys want me out of town. Why? Who put them up to that dumbass play? They aren't local. He turned a corner and glanced back. The door to Pete's was opening again. He hurried his steps and brought the town's map up in his mind. Streets and alleys branched out from Main Street, and various establishments were located on them. His hotel was four streets away, but he had no intention of taking trouble with him there. He headed out of the corner back to Main Street, and just as he turned left he heard a shout behind him. He ignored the next street, darted into the next one, swung an immediate right again, and paused. He was in the backyard of an establishment, some kind of hunting outfitter's store. The small yard had three parking spaces of which two were empty, the third had an Escalade in it. Trash cans and black bin bags stood in a corner. Sunlight bathed the yard, a horse trotted somewhere, a woman's laugh floated up from Pine Street. The first shadow fell in the yard, two others joined it shortly. He heard whispers and stepped in front of them. Looking for me, guys? They rushed at him, brown hair first, dark hair and nervous followed. All neatly bunched together. Amateurs. The trash can's lid slammed deep inside brown hair's midriff and he doubled over. Before he could recover, the lid swung up and caught him flush in his chin. Zeb dropped the lid, pivoted on his left heel, and caught dark hair in a judo lock, 
and hurled him against the Escalade. Nervous slid to a halt, took one look at Zeb and fled. Zeb was back on Pine Street an hour later, seated under the awning of a coffee shop, watching the world go by as his drink worked its magic inside. Picture of a visitor relaxing. Brown hair and his companion hadn't given him much. He had gotten their names, that they were unemployed, and were en route to Jackson from Rock Springs. They had stayed overnight at a chain motel and had met a stranger in the bar, who had plied them with drinks and put them up to the play they had made. Zeb ran the questioning in his mind. He said you pulled a joke on him, and he wanted to return the favor. Brown hair had groaned as he clutched his stomach. How much were they paid? The dude said he would settle their hotel bills if they were successful. He didn't say why. Brown hair shook his head at that, spat blood and groaned louder. Describe him. Tall white neatly dressed soft-spoken. Zeb placed bills under the Escalade's wipers to cover the damage and left the men to their misery. Tall white neatly dressed. That'll fit hundreds of men in the town. He waited till he was sure the three men didn't appear again. He toyed with the idea of reporting the incident to Noel, but dropped it. The town being as small as it was, word would get to the sheriff. If he wants to talk, he has my number. Zeb checked out the bar the men had been to, it was in a side street, and from the outside he could see it was busy. I can ask the twins to hack inside their computers and find out who stayed there, get their details. However, this isn't an agency mission, and I don't want to involve them. Heck this isn't even a mission. I'm just satisfying my curiosity. He made his way inside and ordered a drink, and toyed with it for an hour. He made small talk with the bartender, asked him if he had seen Zeb's buddies, showed him their photos on his mobile phone. Zeb had just come to town and was hunting them. The bartender squinted. Yeah, he had served them the previous night. Wild bunch. He had to ask them to dial it down a few times. This was a small town bar. Did Mike, the bartender, remember who they hung out with? There should have been a fourth guy with them. The bartender moved away to serve another patron, and when he had finished polishing glasses, he came back. They talked with several folks. It was a busy night, and Mike wasn't paying attention. What did the fourth guy look like? Oh, you know nothing special. Tall dresses well, white guy. Speaks well. Mike shook his head with a rueful grin, gestured at the people inside his establishment. Three men fit the bill right there. That description wouldn't get Zeb far. Zeb thanked him and left, spent another couple of hours hanging around on Main Street, making himself visible. No one approached him, no one took any shots at him. No cruisers rolled up to arrest him. He went to the men's motel and found they had checked out an hour back. Their vehicle was absent. It was getting dark by the time he went back to his hotel. Dawn Besterman was behind the desk again, and a smile came up in her eyes. You're quite popular, Mr. Carter, she laughed. Zeb smiled ruefully. I've no idea what beef those guys had with me, ma'am. They weren't local, were they? She shook her head. No. Not from what I heard. You reported them to the sheriff? Nope. It isn't a big deal. I figured they were just feeling frisky. She printed his receipt and watched as he signed it. I am sorry you had to experience that in our town. Such incidents are very rare. You think they'll cause any more trouble for you? I don't think so, ma'am. It wouldn't surprise me if they've left town by now. And if they hassle you again, I am sure you can take them on. My son brought some of his friends home one time. A couple of them, you have their look, Mr. Carter. He looked at her and said simply, I'm just a guy on vacation, ma'am. It was dark by the time he headed to the car park and slung his pack in the SUV. He bent and inspected his tires. They were good. He straightened and stilled when the voice spoke from behind him. That was neat play. Textbook stuff on how to handle amateurs in a family place. The voice was rich, soft and amused. 
Car park has 30 spaces and leads to a rear entrance to the hotel. It's walled on three sides, the fourth side is the entrance as well as exit. He could be behind any car. Zeb's hand drifted to the Glock in his shoulder holster. No need for that, Mr. Carter. The voice chuckled. We are just having a conversation. The voice paused and Zeb strained to hear if the man was moving, was smoking, or was doing anything else. He heard nothing above the faint noises of the town. Somewhere a car door slammed, an engine gunned and tires squealed. That advice those guys gave you was good. Looks like you are taking it. Poking your nose where it doesn't belong, we both know what happens to such busybodies. The voice continued when Zeb didn't respond. Going back to the mountains, Mr. Carter. Or are you heading to New York? The voice laughed when Zeb stayed silent. You're a hard man to talk to. No matter. Wherever you are going, Mr. Carter, stay safe. Zeb waited, but the voice didn't speak anymore, and then moved softly and checked out the car park. It was empty. My inner radar didn't ping, didn't sense his presence. That has never happened before. This guy is as good as me. It was when he was heading to a trailhead that another thought came to him. Better than me. Chapter 5 The assassin was in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. He had been in the capital for four months, had established his cover, and then a lucky break had got him to the position he was in. He was a personal trainer to the royal family, the House of Saud, who ruled over Saudi Arabia. The royal family was huge and had more than 10,000 members, but the inner coterie, those who wielded the real power, numbered to no more than a couple of thousand. The assassin was the personal trainer to the family of the king's fourth cousin. The cousin held an enormously important position in the kingdom, and also represented the kingdom internationally, in specific policy matters. The cousin was the assassin's target, and even though the assassin had served the cousin several times, the timing hadn't been right. The assassin specialized in making his kills look like natural causes. Such killers were rare and his skills were in great demand, but he undertook only one or two commissions a year. Organizing such kills took a lot of research, effort and time. He had received the commission more than a year back, through his usual channels of cutouts and dummies, and had been intrigued. Saudi Arabia was the world's largest exporter of petroleum and had 20% of the world's crude oil reserves. Oil was not the only currency it was known for though. The country, because of its relative stability, played a very vital role in bringing some calm to war-torn Middle East. The country was an important ally to the United States, with the emergence of extremist groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, that relationship had grown stronger. There were many who suspected Saudi Arabia of playing an elaborate con game and secretly sponsoring the extremists. The assassin's target was known to tacitly approve of several terrorist organizations in the region, and had been seen in the company of leaders of such groups. The assassin's initial reaction had been to turn down the assignment when his cutout had told him about it. If he was successful, he would be the most hunted man on the planet. The United States would throw its massive weight behind the manhunt, and all Western allies to the House of Saud would follow. Oil lubricated relationships. The cutout had been most persuasive, however and had suggested the killer meet the sponsor's emissary once before making a final decision. The assassin had been bemused. In his business, sponsor or emissary and killer didn't meet. They operated via elaborate fake identities and scores of middlemen. What's the point? Is he going to reveal who the sponsor is? No. You know how this business works. Sponsor and assassin never know about one another. However, the emissary knows the sponsor's motives and will present his case. What do you lose? He knows he's taking a risk in meeting you. You could kill him in a hundred ways. I might still do that. He knows that too. The assassin met the emissary in Berlin, heard the man's impassioned plea, and held his hand up. Not interested. Tell me how you can help. 
no kill is impossible, but this one ranks very high on that scale. The emissary, one of the most powerful men in the world, looked in the cold eyes across him, swallowed, and told him about his connections to the royal family. He was an advisor to the king on international investment markets, and had brokered several deals for the king every year. And you want me to kill his cousin? The assassin asked in disbelief. I don't. I am just the messenger. The people behind this commission, some of the most powerful people in the world, he smiled at the assassin's raised eyebrows, yes even more powerful than me, have their reasons he went on to explain more lucidly, and this time his reasoning made sense to the killer. He took on the commission. The assassin's brand of killing required close proximity to the target, and after researching the royal extensively, he had come up with posing as a personal trainer. His dark skin meant that he could easily pass for being from the Middle East. He knew the language and spoke fluently with a local accent. It also helped that he knew all about body conditioning. He created a sophisticated cover and used the sponsor's contacts to add credibility to the cover. The cover stood up to the most penetrating scrutiny. It had to, the assassin's life depended on it. He started by becoming personal trainer to wealthy bankers and worked his way up, and in six months he was training billionaires. He moved to the Middle East, created a network of contacts, and got his name out. The emissary then referred him to a lowly royal in the family, a man who had more wealth than common sense. He improved the royal's fitness and stamina, fawned over him, and then started training his wife. Women gossiped, compared notes and soon Muhammad Rauf, the assassin, became masseur to more women in the royal family. He started coming and going at the palace at will. The security cordon around the palace relaxed whenever it came across Rauf. Familiarity always bred freedom, no matter how thorough the discipline and training. Word of his magical hands and sweet talk spread, and when the target's personal trainer was injured in an accident, an accident carefully engineered by the assassin, the target's wife whispered Rauf's name. The assassin had access now. Access led to a few sessions with the royal. However having sessions wasn't enough. The target had to die when he was alone without any blow back to the assassin. The assassin ruled out various rooms where the royal was alone. Bedroom, office, dining hall, several others. None of them were practical, none of them had an exit route. He considered the bathroom long and hard and tried to check it out, but it was too well protected. He looked into exotic poisons that worked slowly, but ruled those out too. The royal's food went through tasters, and these days anyone with access to the internet could research and detect poisons. No, it had to be death administered directly by the assassin. During one of the massage sessions, the royal had abruptly pushed away Rauf's hands and had left the gym without a further word. The assassin had looked at his departing back in astonishment. His surprise had cleared only when the target's assistant had poked his head inside and said his royal highness had gone for his prayers. Prayers. Prayer room. The assassin liked the idea. The royal prayed alone. No one was allowed to disturb him. The prayer room was two hallways away from the gym, and one evening, the assassin mistakenly ventured into the room. He was spotted quickly and hustled out by guards, but not before the nano cameras on his thobe, the ankle length dress that men wore, had captured the room from multiple angles. The prayer room was rectangular, air conditioned, had only one exit, and had small windows high up that overlooked an inner garden. The garden was accessible by women of the royal family, and in the evenings, was a busy place. The room could be locked from the inside, and the royal did secure the room when praying. The assassin ruled out using the windows as an escape route. He looked at the air conditioning vents. They were a possibility. He needed to get inside them or get their plans. Getting the plans took a month. The killer's sponsor got details of the contractor, who worked exclusively on the royal palace, and one evening the killer broke into their office. Security at the contractor's office was understandably lower than that at the palace, and the killer didn't need to draw on all his skills. He studied the plans late at night and ideas formed in his mind. 
Six hallways away from the gym was the laundry room. Personal laundry was washed in-house but furnishings were sent to a service provider. The laundry was bundled in enormous white sheets, tagged and labeled, and a closed truck transported the furnishings to the contractor. The truck had only two occupants, the driver and his helper. Clean laundry was stacked in a room, unpacked every week and stacked for future use. The clean bales were unpacked only after two days of entry into the palace. More ideas The palace had fire alarms in all hallways, and the assassins started toying with them, making them go off at random by using a pocket-sized device that tampered with their detection mechanism and made them go off. Guards in the palace rushed to an alarm each time it sounded, leaving just one man with the royal. Getting into the palace's computer network was far easier than he anticipated. He gave a customized training program to the lowly royal and told him everyone could use it. The insignificant royal uploaded the program on the network, and then the embedded malware did its work. The assassin worked with one trusted man, a hacker in Russia who could work magic with his coding skills. The hacker was alerted, was ready. As the kill day approached, the assassin made more fire alarms go off simultaneously by remotely activating the devices he had concealed in various hallways. The palace called in experts, but they weren't able to find the problem. They wouldn't. They were looking in the wrong place. They fitted new alarms, those went off randomly too. The assassin had made plans for leaving the Middle East. He made them visible now, he bought advertisements in newspapers, which announced his departure from the region to pursue his business in other countries. Kill week came. Monday was the usual hot day, it was in that part of the world. The killer greeted the security cordon, smiled and joked with him, stood patiently as sniffer dogs searched him for drugs and explosives. He was waved inside with a crude joke to keep his hands away from certain female body parts. He completed working over the royal's wife and other women in the family. In the evening, the royal lay underneath his hands and grunted softly as the killer's hands kneaded his shoulders and neck. The killer went to a canteen and had dinner, watched TV for a while, and when it was late, when the shift in the security cordon changed, he disappeared. The new shift didn't know him by sight, which worked in his favor. The killer kept his head bowed and walked purposefully in the direction of the gym, and when the hallway was clear, he darted to a concealed doorway in the corridor. The doorway led to a small passage that opened up to a narrow utilities room. It had panels of switches, coils of cables, a stool, and a ladder for workmen. The utilities room had never been opened in recent years, and new guards didn't know of its existence. The killer made the room his home for the next 24 hours. He had once been buried in sand with just his head above ground for three days. Twenty-four hours on a stool was luxury. At 10 p.m. that night, his hacker penetrated the security camera database and inserted images and videos of Mohammed Rauf leaving the palace. He altered the logs to show the personal trainer had clocked out. He destroyed the malware and exited the network stealthily. His job was done. Tuesday morning came, and the killer broke open a packet of high-energy bars, drank water, and warmed his body up. Once he had finished his routine, he lay on the floor and went into a dreamless state. Just before evening he rose, drank water again, wrapped up his packet of biscuits and pocketed them, and erased all signs of his presence in the room. He looked at his watch. Five minutes. In precisely four minutes, he fingered the remote in his pocket and set off several fire alarms simultaneously. He heard footsteps pounding and saw shadows crossing through a thin crack. Once the pounding faded away, he counted another minute, opened the door and walked out as if he belonged. The one piece of luck the killer was counting on came his way. The solitary guard outside the prayer room was looking in the direction of the alarms. He was also perfectly poised for the killer, with his neck and shoulders exposed. The assassin came behind him, and before the man could turn, squeezed a nerve on his upper body. At the same time, he applied a chokehold and caught the man as he collapsed. That particular hold and the nerve point rendered a man unconscious, but he invariably woke up not knowing what happened. Most people never mention such incidents out of fear of embarrassment. It was human nature. 
The killer was counting on the guard being most people. The killer dragged the man away from the hallway, propped him against a wall, and headed to the prayer room. He figured he had 15 minutes. Enough time. He picked the prayer room lock, shut the door behind him, and spotted the royal immediately. The king's cousin was on his knees, his head bowed. The royal sensed the killer's presence and started turning his head, but before he could complete his move, the assassin was on him. One hand moved to apply a familiar hold, another went across the royal's mouth, and the killer squeezed. The royal thrashed but the killer's body was deceptively strong, his hold didn't loosen. The hold required just the right amount of pressure in just the right spot. The killer had practiced the hold on several men fitter and stronger than the royal. All of them had died, not one death had been considered suspicious. The royal's thrashing slowed, but the killer didn't ease his grip. The target's legs became flaccid and still the killer held him up. It was only when the royal's body had stopped moving and his breath had paused forever, that the killer laid him down carefully and arranged the body. He wiped the man's face, cleaned him up, stepped back and surveyed the scene. He nodded once. Perfect. He unlocked the door and peered out. The hallway was empty. He knew it wouldn't be for long. The unconscious guard would awaken soon. The other guards would return. He made his way to the laundry room, selected a bale at the back, ripped it open, made room for himself by crushing the linen and folded himself inside. He removed a special sticky tape and closed the rip from inside. A casual glance wouldn't reveal the rip from outside. A closer glance wouldn't matter since by then the killer would have lost the game. He stayed in the laundry room for the rest of the night, heard the sudden shouting as the body was discovered, heard the sudden hustle in the palace as the entire dynamics of the royal family changed. He tuned himself out and went into his dreamless state again. The next day the laundry was hustled into the truck and transported out of the palace. Late that evening Muhammad Rauf came to the palace and sat in silence along with the royal's wife and shared in her grief. He bowed to her as he was leaving, paid his respects to the family members he knew and once he left the royal palace disappeared from Saudi Arabia. He allowed himself small smile hours later when he was in a private jet. There were a few killers like him, but he was sure none of them were as good as he was. Chapter 6 Zeb spent a week on the eastern slopes, enjoyed the glorious sunrises and sunsets, and one evening, made unexpected contact with the bear. He knew she was around, he could sense her, however he hadn't come across her trail or that of her cubs. He hiked down the slope, wanting to reach a clearing he had seen the previous time where he would make his camp. He moved soundlessly, his body flowing through foliage as if it were water over rocks. He heard the grunt first and then the black shape thrust out of a dense bush and Mama Bear glared at him from ten feet away. She was taller than him by half a foot and looked as if she weighed well over 150 pounds. She growled at him, blew repeatedly, and then charged straight at him. Zeb stood motionless, looked Mama Bear straight in the eye, a part of his mind admiring the black shape of fury hurtling toward him. Mama Bear broke off just as she reached him and circled him. She sniffed him, circled him again, and headed back to the bush without a second glance. Her cubs tumbled out of the bush as she neared and jumped at her. One of the cubs looked back at Zeb and then trotted behind Mama and disappeared in the bush. Zeb stood motionless for a full minute but the bear didn't emerge. He resumed his descent and thrust his palms out. They were steady. He made camp, boiled water and when he lay down to sleep later, under the canopy of stars, the image that he had tried his best to avoid came back. It was the dead woman's sightless eyes, her face twisted in fear. I can't get involved in all such incidents. The image didn't disappear, the sightless eyes didn't close. Frustrated, Zeb turned over, boxed his sleeping bag in shape. Just as he was drifting into oblivion, the woman's eyes appeared, but this time they were a deep blue in which he could drown. Had drowned many years back. Zeb headed to Pinedale the next day. Jim Knoll was brewing a pot of coffee when he reached the sheriff's office. 
He raised his eyebrows in astonishment, wordlessly grabbed a second mug, filled it, and thrust it at Zeb. What gives Zeb? Haven't you had enough of my town? I thought you'd be deep in the range by now. Zeb closed his eyes for a second, enjoying the steaming brew sinking through him. I was, now I'm here. Noel frowned in mock anger. You made me lose fifty dollars. His frown turned to a grin when he saw Zeb's face. Kelly and I had a bet. He said you would be back. He said you would want to know what was happening. Zeb raised his hands in surrender. What is happening? Any progress? The sheriff's good humor left him, and he growled. Rogers is more clued in than I am, but what I heard is the investigation is going nowhere. This part of the country, we don't have security cameras, heck we don't even have red lights. Zeb waited, knowing there was more coming. Rogers queried her prints and her DNA, and came back with a big fat zero. The woman is in no database. He searched missing person reports. There wasn't a single match. His fingers whitened on the file. We got Jane Doe on our hands, and no one is in any hurry to claim her. Zeb heard the same message from Rogers, who was initially stilted in his responses, but opened up when he realized Zeb was merely inquiring and not judging his investigation. Not the kind of progress you were expecting. Noel asked him when Zeb put away his phone. We are stumped too. We didn't think we would crack this open in a couple of days, but surely someone somewhere would have noticed a woman missing, and raised all kinds of hell. The sheriff slammed the file in a corner, and looked up angrily when a deputy poked his head, and thrust a pad at him. The sheriff scrawled his signature, and when the deputy disappeared, Noel had controlled himself. She was in good shape for her age, wasn't she? Tone legs, manicured feet. This was a woman who took care of herself, one who could afford to. Such women are noticed, the alarm when they go missing is raised quickly. Zeb mused. Noel narrowed his eyes. What are you getting at? That? She could be someone living off the grid. Zeb completed his sentence. However, I don't think that's what happened here. I think she was a woman who lived alone and whoever killed her made sure she wouldn't be easily identified. Noel's chair squeaked as he fidgeted uneasily. Heck Zeb, that takes a hell of a lot of clout and reach. Zeb rose and the sheriff accompanied him to the exit. Yeah. He shook hands with Noel and as he was heading to Main Street, the sheriff called out. What will you do now? Zeb swiveled back and for a fleeting moment the mask fell away from his face. I'll find them. Noel watching him was reminded of Kelly's words. He has this urge in him, his friends say he suffers from a Batman syndrome. He won't rest, he won't stop, and he won't give up. Kelly had chuckled and lightened the mood. Tell your ranger to get off his behind and crack this open. Once Zeb gets involved, it usually turns bloody. Zeb headed back to Pete's, and when he was finishing his coffee, the man approached him and frowned. I thought I recognized you. Zeb smiled easily. Blame your food. It's what drew me back. He looked questioningly when Pete didn't move. Those men are back, they came here yesterday night. I want no trouble at my place. You won't have any. Zeb paid his bill and patted the man's shoulder. He headed to the motel, smiled at the woman behind the desk. Bill Frayne and his buddies are still here, aren't they? Small town. There's a good chance such establishments will be less formal. She looked down back at him and smiled in return. Yes, sir. Mr. Frayne is in room 401. You can call him from a house phone in that corner. She gestured at a bank of phones. Zeb nodded in thanks, headed to the phones and when she turned away slipped up the staircase. Room 401 was in the middle of the hallway, which was deserted. Sounds came through the wooden door, a TV, someone whistling. Zeb inspected the lock, one of those that required a plastic card. No plastic card. The twins or broker aren't with me to make one up. He knocked on the door. The whistling stopped, 
A shadow moved under the door, and it swung open to reveal nervous Jake Wyndham. His eyes widened and he thrust it shut. Zeb slammed the door back, ignored the man's shout as he stumbled and forced his way inside. His practiced eyes moved swiftly. Tiny hallway, bathroom which is empty, bed, Wyndham by the door, brown hair Bill Frayne on bed, black hair, Paul Coomers on chair. Both watching TV. Wyndham yelled and grabbed Zeb by the waist and rammed him against the wall. He's back, he shouted at his friends. Zeb yelled over him, not resisting, wait up. I'm just... He broke off in a gasp as Wyndham's fist sank deep in him. Coomers came hurtling and joined the fray. Zeb moved his head just in time as Coomers' fist sailed past, couldn't move fast enough as a second fist met his neck. All the while Wyndham was pounding him against the wall. Can't hurt them. He gritted his teeth, freed a hand and slapped away another blow. His knee went up and caught Wyndham on his thigh, and the grip around his waist slackened. Grab the door, shove him out, Coomers panted at Frayne who tried to squeeze past them. Zeb had enough when a flying palm caught him on the side of his head. His hand blurred in a chop and Wyndham sagged. The hand rose caught Coomer's wrist, rolled it in a lock and the man screamed. Zeb pulled and shoved the man as a projectile at Frayne. He twisted away as the men cannoned against each other and sprawled on top of Wyndham. He moved into the room, dabbed at a split lip and straightened his clothes. Luckily, these guys are amateurs. I'm here to talk. Just talk. He said evenly as Frayne staggered to his feet, looked wildly at him, and then hauled his buddies up. Zeb moved further back and leaned against the window. Passive. Non-threatening gestures. These guys are more scared than angry. You guys okay? Any injuries? Frayne looked at his pals, turned back and shook his head. What do you want? We told you all that we know. I want more. He held up a palm in a placating gesture. Hear me out. He told them about the investigation, about its reaching a dead end. You folks are the only ones who might have something. That guy didn't pick me out from random. He wanted me out of town since I'm the one who brought in the body. Maybe he didn't want me to hang around. Zeb watched them tidy themselves, helped himself to a glass of water, and once they were seated, asked them. Why did he pick on you guys? The bar was crowded, and I am told there were quite a few young out-of-town guys. Why you? The three exchanged glances, Paul nodded at Bill who replied. We thought about this, and we figure he overheard us. We had a two-hour drive behind us, and probably had a few drinks too many. He looked away sheepishly. He probably heard us griping about not having a job, short of money. Let me guess. Next thing you know he's sharing his own down-at-heel stories, and the drinks start flowing and the pranks come up. Paul nodded. We aren't normally like that, Mr. Carter. We don't pick on people. The way he described it, it was just harmless fun. And we could do with the money. Zeb nodded in acceptance. Do you remember anything more of him? He frowned. He was as tall as you, clean-shaven blonde, probably the same age as you. He looked at the other two, questioningly. Green eyes? Yeah, Jake confirmed. He said he was Steve Morrow, a lawyer from Los Angeles. We had a good laugh at that. A lawyer playing such pranks. You said he was going to pay your hotel bills. Where was he going to meet you? Here. However, we didn't see him. We returned soon after our encounter with you, he laughed, and checked out quickly and headed out of town. We didn't see him, but we weren't looking hard. Paul spoke suddenly. I asked the lady downstairs and she said he checked out that same evening. He had toughness about him, Bill said reflectively. He looked Zeb over, a bit like you, Mr. Carter. You looked in his eyes and you knew how far you could push him. Paul shouted suddenly, I got his plates. He turned to the two excitedly. You remember, I hauled off to get our bags. He was there, he was getting his stuff too. His car was next to ours, it was a Toyota. I remember the plate because the numbers were in a sequence. 
he recited a number, repeated it again when he saw Zeb noting it down. He slapped a palm against his thigh. But the funny thing is, there was another plate in the trunk. It struck me as odd but I didn't ask him. He recited another number and beamed when Zeb thanked him. Say, why are you interested in this? Frayne looked at him, an undercurrent of suspicion in his voice. The cops should be the ones asking all these questions. And you should go to the sheriff with these details. Zeb told him. I'm just curious. I am the one who found the body and feels sort of obliged. I know it's stupid but there it is. He met the man's look and saw his doubts fade. Besides, don't forget Maro singled me out. No point in going into who I am. It'll muddy the waters. They spoke for a few more minutes but no new nuggets emerged, and Zeb left them after they promised to meet the sheriff. Zeb had hoped that one of them would have captured Maro on his cell phone, but they hadn't. There had been no reason. He left via the stairs and slowed down once he reached the sidewalk. Mystery man man in the car park sounded older, more polished than Maro. Maro's boss. The man behind all this? Possible but not probable. Men behind these kinds of incidents don't get involved. More likely mystery man was Maro's boss and orchestrated the killing. Decision time. Do I call the twins and get them to check out Maro? Should I get his details from Rogers and Noel? He grinned as he fired up his sat phone. It was no contest. Beth and Megan Peterson were playing pool with Broker and Roger in their Columbus Avenue office in New York, which bore the name of a security consulting firm, their cover. The firm was genuine and they had active clients but increasingly, agency missions took up most of their time. Broker ran his information business from the same premises, and that too had clients the world over. The office had three other occupants. A petite woman who sat on a couch with a bearded giant, Chloe and Bear, and an ebony-colored mountain of a man who lounged on another couch, Bawana. Bear and Bawana were the tallest of them all, both of them six feet four inches, all muscle and sinew. The two were also members of Mensa, a fact that not many knew. The office was decorated by the twins, and their free spirit came through in every accessory. There were very few desks on which computers hummed, the rest of the office had multicolored couches strewn randomly. Baseball mitts and bats lined the walls, a basketball hoop was nailed at one end. A small putting strip was laid by the wall-to-ceiling mirrored windows. The glass was bulletproof, and the entire building could withstand an F5 tornado. Roger whooped as he sank another ball and moved aside for Broker to line up for his shot. As he sharpened his cue stick, he glanced around and grinned. They were enjoying a rare bit of downtime. As Bawana had eloquently put it, all those who needed killing quickly had been dealt with. The others hadn't become annoying enough. Heard lately from the wise one? He drawled at Megan, using the twins' nickname for Zeb. Nope, her brown hair flew silkily as she shook her head. We exchanged texts about ten days back when he discovered that body. No peep from him since then. How's that going? Did they identify the body? Buwana called out. Nah. Beth and I are watching that case. She's still Jane Doe. Broker frowned. So where's Zeb? He was in the mountains yesterday. Haven't checked today. Beth bent to take her shot when the phone rang. Megan picked it up mouthed, it's Zeb and turned it on speaker. Hi Zeb, we were just talking about you. Zeb's voice came over a pause. Can you trace a number for me? Broker snorted before she could reply. Of course she could. That's what Werner's here for. He paused. We are getting worried, you've been too quiet for our liking. Killed anyone lately? Nope. Bawana's brow furrowed. You feeling okay, Zeb? That's not like you at all. Betcha he's annoyed someone though, Bear called out. Haven't you, Zeb? I'm not sure about that, but someone's surely interested in me. He gave them a breakdown of all that had happened while Beth punched in the plates and ran a search. 
Due to their security clearances, the program was connected to multiple intelligence databases, nationally and internationally. Broker also had a crew of trusted hackers in Ukraine in the event any system needed entering stealthily. The first number's false. No such plates were registered. The second is registered to a law firm in L.A., Beth recited an address and followed it up with a text to Zeb. You need any backup, bro? Bawana asked softly. Nope, I'm good. I just want to ask this Maro guy some questions. He hung up and they resumed playing. They would range beside Zeb if he was in the slightest trouble. They didn't have to discuss it, didn't have to articulate it. It was the code they lived by. Chapter 7 Zeb was in Los Angeles 15 hours later. He had made one last call to check with the sheriff who reported that Bill Frain had checked in with him. Noel had traced the plates to the same address Beth had read off. I haven't done anything yet with that address, other than passing it on to Rogers. It's his investigation in any case, Noel said carefully. His meaning was clear. Zeb smiled, warming to the man even more. Leave it that way. I'll look into it and let you know. He took the US-189, made a short detour to Salt Lake City, where he fueled up and napped for an hour and then hit the I-15. He kept an eye out for tails but didn't spot any. I am not yet a threat to whoever is behind the killing. He stopped a few times to catch up on sleep and to let his SUV cool down. The SUV was weighed down by steel plates, ballistic nylon and Kevlar in the body. Its floor and roof were reinforced similarly, its windows had half an inch of polycarbonate and leaded glass. It had GPS, Wi-Fi, a built-in satellite phone, and all kinds of gadgets that would have felt at home in the Batmobile. A six-and-a-half-liter turbocharged engine left other vehicles behind on the highway. He drove through the vastness of Utah, cut across Nevada, skirted the edge of the Mojave National Preserve, and hit LA's gridlock traffic late evening. He checked into a hotel in West Hollywood, and thought briefly of using one of several covers he carried. The hotel clerk tapped his desk impatiently and repeated, Name sir. Zeb Carter. I want to see how good they are. Zeb headed to Morrow's office the next day, a swanky mirrored glass building in downtown LA, he read a list of occupants engraved in brass plates in the enormous lobby. Morrow's law firm occupied five floors in the 20-floor building, the rest of the occupants were other law firms, accounting firms, and insurance companies. A young woman approached Zeb, smiled at him, and escorted him to the sixth floor. She led him to a bank of elevators and broke the silence just once to ask if he had an appointment. Her porcelain brow furrowed when he replied he didn't. She escorted him to a reception area, whispered something to another smiling young woman behind the desk, who asked him to wait. Zeb waited. Men and women in suits walked purposefully, many of whom looked at the tall, lean, brown-haired, dark-eyed man in a white shirt tucked in blue jeans. Many of them gave a second glance. This was LA the land of jeans, but still a law office was a law office. Appearances mattered. Zeb, supremely indifferent to appearances, crossed his legs and waited. It's a power game to them. He idly flicked through a magazine, the firm's in-house magazine that boasted how good and great the firm was. I can wait. Forty-five minutes later the woman behind the desk flicked her eyes at Zeb, whispered in her headset, and led Zeb to a glass office. A white-haired man greeted Zeb. Mike Lomax, senior partner. He shook hands firmly with Zeb and gestured at Zeb to seat himself. His suit and shoes could have fed a small village in a third world country. His tan spoke of vacations in far off lands. His teeth gleamed and sneered, my dentist better than yours. The tan face wrinkled in a smile. Mr. Carter, I'm told you're here to meet Steve Morrow. Unfortunately, he is no longer with our firm, he left us two years back. May I ask your interest in him? Zeb sidestepped his question. You still remember him? Lomax's smile faltered but came back brighter. No sir, but I looked him up in our system before meeting you. We like to be prepared. 
his hands spread wide as if to say, this is why we bill three grand an hour. You know him? You two had a business relationship? Lomax fished. Zeb thought about it for a second, and then told him about the prank. He watched the man's eyes widen and his mouth open in shock. Maro identified you. Specifically? Zeb nodded. Well I'll be damned. He apologized hastily. Pardon my language sir but I've never heard something like that and I've seen some grim stuff before. Zeb looked around his office, at the framed degrees on the wall, photographs of him with celebrities. What kind of law firm are you? Lomax fell into a practice spiel. We are mostly into corporate affairs, mergers and acquisitions, litigations, due diligence, international expansion, and every service that large corporations would need. We handle some divorce cases, since our clients have a funny habit of separating from their spouses. A laugh boomed out from him, all bonhomie and good cheer. And Maro. What kind of lawyer was he? The smile slipped and a look of distaste briefly flashed on his face. He was a partner here. He brought in a large client who turned out to be something else. We ended the client relationship and severed Mr. Maro's employment. He opened up reluctantly when Zeb looked at him. The client turned out to be a front for a drugs cartel, and Mr. Morrow was found embezzling from them. Needless to say, it became very messy. He shuddered theatrically. The FBI was camped in our office for a few months, and we got slaughtered in the media. Lost a few clients too. Thankfully that's well behind us. Yeah baby, we're back to the high charge out rates. Was he arrested? No sir. I believe the feds are still hunting him. Zeb looked behind Lomax's shoulder, through the picture window, at the skyline of downtown LA bathed in sunlight. In the distance was US Bank Tower, the tallest building in California. The 9-11 terrorists had originally planned to crash one plane in the tower. Zeb eyed the building, lost in thought. If Morrow was on the run, why didn't he use an alias? Do you have a photograph for him? I'm sure you would. Lomax hesitated a moment, relented under Zeb's unwavering gaze, picked his phone and whispered instructions. A knock sounded on his door moments later, and a file was thrust in his hand by a smiling woman. Lomax flipped through the file and removed a sheet of paper on which was affixed Steve Morrow's photograph and personal details. Tall, clean-shaven, blonde and green eyes. Zeb ignored the frown on Lomax's face as he took a picture of the sheet of paper. He memorized Morrow's addresses, two of them, and handed the file back. He rose and Lomax trotted behind him when Zeb headed out of the office. The lawyer shook his hand firmly and pasted another smile. Glad to have been of help, Mr. Carter. He stood watching as the elevator doors closed behind Zeb, probably to make sure his visitor didn't turn around and waste another billable hour. Zeb texted the addresses to the twins and turned his attention to fighting the traffic snarls that increasingly defined L.A., he spotted the tail 15 minutes later. It was a silver Toyota that flashed in the sunlight as it overtook three cars and fell in two vehicles behind Zeb. The Toyota stuck like a leech as Zeb swung through the city without any apparent reason. He took an evasive maneuver and lost it for half an hour before another flash of light announced its presence. That takes organization. Probably two more vehicles tailing me in rotation. He frowned. How did they make me? He had parked the SUV in a public lot and had hoofed it to the law firm. My presence at the law firm must have set off an alarm. There's probably a protocol in place when anyone comes asking for Morrow. That's why I was kept waiting to get the tails organized. Once they had eyes on me, the rest was easy. Not many organizations in the country have the resources to organize such a tale so quickly. He headed back to the motel, found an empty parking space, waited in the lobby, and presently three men appeared, walking at a rapid pace. They slowed when they saw Zeb, and the man in the middle broke off and approached him. He held a business card out. Mr. Carter? Leon Cottrell, special agent in charge, FBI Los Angeles field office. 
Can we speak in private? Zeb led them silently to a corner, seated himself with his back against a wall, and ignored the two agents who flanked their boss silently. How long have you been tailing me? Cottrell ignored him and fired a question of his own. What's your interest in Steve Morrow, sir? Zeb grinned. I didn't know he existed till about ten days back when he took an interest in me. He outlined the events for the second time in the day and watched the sack's face for a reaction. There wasn't one. Cottrell had on his poker face. Can anyone verify this story, Mr. Carter? Sure. Those three guys in Pinedale. He gave them Bill Frayne's number and made a mental note to give the man a heads up. Will you be in the city for long, Mr. Carter? They know I am not an Angelino. Fast work. Can't say. I wanted to ask Mara why he picked on me, but I guess I will never find out. I might hang around for a few days, take in the sights. Can you share a contact number, sir? Just in case we wanted to talk to you again. Zeb had enough. Look, Cottrell, I've no idea where your man is. You've done enough research on me to know I'm from out of town. If you had dug deeper, you would have found that Director Murphy knows me well. He'll know how to find me should you need to meet me again. He left them gawking and headed back to his room. Three men entered the motel at 3 a.m. the following night, glanced at the clerk who was fast asleep behind his desk and moved noiselessly to the stairs. They wore dark clothes, were average-looking, and anyone who saw them wouldn't remember anything noticeable. Their rubber-soled shoes gripped the steps noiselessly, and when they reached the sixth floor not one of them was gasping. They paused for a moment on the landing, checked the room numbers, and turned as one to the right. They knew their man was in the room, they had been watching the motel all day and had manned all its exits and had made a move only when they were sure. They passed several rooms and when they reached the one they were seeking, two of them flanked the door, while the third extracted a plastic card from his pocket. The three nodded at one another and the man slipped the card, fiddled for a couple of seconds and cracked the door open. He widened the door, took two steps inside, and fired six shots rapidly at the shape on the bed. He stepped back, the second man took his place and emptied his gun. The three men turned swiftly and headed down the stairs in controlled haste. Their guns were silenced, but twelve shots deep in the night could still draw attention. The hotel was still quiet by the time they reached the lobby, and they breathed easier. Maybe the neighboring occupants were heavy sleepers. If they had been spotted, the three men would have fired indiscriminately, and would have escaped in the ensuing chaos. If they were killed in the skirmish, that was the price they paid for living by the gun. They went to the parking lot, skirted dark vehicles, and headed to their space. The lead shooter opened his door, and just as he was slipping inside, a voice called out softly. Looking for me, boys? Chapter 8 The three men moved instantly. The one in the center dropped to the ground, fired in the direction of the voice, all in one move. The two by his side leapt sideways and fired. They didn't have a target to aim at though, and their bullets flew harmlessly in the air. Zeb crouched behind his SUV, took out the man in the center with a double tap. He was the easiest since he was lying on the ground, motionless. The two shooters poured fire in his direction, and bullets struck the SUV and pinged off. He crouched low and ran behind it, used the cover of two other cars to flank the men. Wrong idea. The thought came to him as a shape emerged from the darkness, one of the shooters having the same idea as him. Down. He threw himself to the ground just a bullet whined angrily through the air he had breathed moments ago. His gun came up and blossomed once, twice and thrice and the shape fell. Where's the third one? Zeb rolled desperately beneath a pickup truck and scanned for legs. Behind him was the surrounding wall of the lot. And a dead body. Ahead of him were wheels and a whole lot of empty ground. No legs. Lights turned on in the motel, voices raised, and the hotel staff rushed into the lot. Zeb remained where he was, wanting to be sure the third shooter had fled. 
It was only when the first black and white nosed into the lot that he rose and raised his hands when lights, bullhorns, and guns pointed his way. Zeb was released three hours later, after lengthy questioning once it was established he had killed in self-defense. The third shooter wasn't found. He knew he was lucky that the shooters were amateurs. Professional shooters wouldn't have bunched together the way the three had. They would have exited the hotel separately. All three would have sought cover instead of one dropping to the ground. They wouldn't have gone after an enemy in the dark. Two other men were found unconscious in cars, one on the street outside the motel entrance, one opposite a rear exit used for deliveries. That was me, Zeb said apologetically when a tired-looking detective looked at him questioningly. Zeb had come to the conclusion that Steve Morrow was a deliberate cover used by the man in Pinedale. He could think of no other reason for such an unlikely legend to be deployed. Pinedale man knew the FBI was looking for Morrow and would question anyone seeking him. That hassle would put off Joe Public from further inquiries. That's what Pinedale man was counting on. What if Joe Public was the persistent kind? How would they know he was minding his own business? They would watch the nosy citizen. Zeb hadn't found any tales, but on his third day in LA, he had spotted the two watchers outside his motel's exits. He had then booked six rooms closest to his and had settled down to wait. He hadn't expected shooters, he had thought they would send heavies to rough him up. Shooters meant the gloves were off. It also meant whoever was behind the events had juice to cover his trail. Zeb slept in his SUV for a couple of hours once the cops had released him, showered and freshened up in the motel, and when he went for breakfast, he found he had become a minor celebrity. Cell phones flashed as some patrons photographed him, some of them approached him for more details on the event. He couldn't do anything about the pictures, but the Zeb look, a cold, hard stare, was enough to send inquisitive patrons scurrying back. An hour later, he was in a modern building in downtown LA, that displayed different facets from different angles. It was the LAPD's new headquarters, barely a stone's throw from City Hall. It was where Chief of Police Jeffrey Hall had his office. Hall, an inch taller than Zeb, was coal black and built like a tank. His eyes were flat and hard, and every year cops pooled money and bet on when the chief would smile. The bet was yet to be won in three years. Hall and Zeb had served in Iraq, Zeb had saved him from a sniper attack that had taken out the rest of Hall's men. Zeb had wiped out the sniper nest and had carried the wounded Hall to safety. Hall greeted him silently and once they were behind closed doors in his office, crushed the shorter man in a tight hug. Hugging in front of the LAPD was a known no, he had a reputation to maintain. He patted Zeb on the back with large paw-like hands and guided him to a seat. He went behind his desk, his muscles rippling against his uniform, rose immediately again and stuck his head out. He stood there for a second without uttering a word and when he returned, he was followed by one of his men bearing a tray with coffees. A look from Hall and the man scampered out after placing the tray on Hall's desk. Hall poured for both of them, handed a cup to Zeb, leaned back and spoke for the first time with a gravelly voice. Tell me. Zeb told him everything, and when he had finished, Hall thought for a moment. He pressed a buzzer, and the same man came back. He handed Zeb's phone, which had the dead woman's photograph on the screen. Run that past M-I-S-S-P-E-R. I don't think your missing persons has anything on the woman, Zeb told him once the man had left. The Rangers and Noel checked nationwide and no description matched the woman. We have to try, Hall replied. You know the shooters were from the 38th Street Gang? The two you killed were on our wanted list. He smiled in the privacy of their office. That's two less. The third man, the one who escaped, could be one Pablo Diaz, the three hung together. The smile faded from Hall's face. Just what have you got yourself into this time, bro? 38th Street is one of the largest and most vicious gangs in the city. They aren't the kind of people you want on your tail. Zeb shrugged. I'm as much in the dark as you are. These guys, whoever they are, are very smart and well-connected. They found me pretty quickly, although I made it easy for them by using my name. 
Hall nodded in agreement. Agree on the smart bit, but well connected. Why do you say that? Zeb unfolded a finger. Steve Morrow. Only someone who knew about him would use that name. Another finger went up. The woman. She's been dead for close to two weeks now. Yet no one has her missing anywhere. I think her records were erased. Hall sighed. Gotcha. You plan to stay long? Dunno. Zeb smiled. Relax, I'll shoot only if I am shot at. That's what I'm worried about. You shoot to kill, and there's enough killing in this city without you adding to the body count. Hall grumbled as he showed Zeb out. Now what? Zeb stopped to put on his shades and used the moment to survey the street. Nothing stood out. No men ducked out of sight suddenly. Next steps. I don't have any. Till I know who I am up against, I'm playing a waiting game. He drove for a couple of hours randomly, dipping in and out of streets, cutting through red lights through Hollywood to Los Feliz, and he started to circle back when he reached the west side neighborhoods. No tails. No tracker on my SUV. His SUV was an anonymous black, and before heading to Meat Hall, he had changed its plates. The plates were registered to a dentist in Griffith Park. The address was genuine, the practice's phone number was manned by a calling service broker had put in place. He checked into another motel, this time using another cover, and chose a room which overlooked the parking lot. He freshened up and hit the street, and it was when he was idly reading a poster on a storefront that the idea struck him. He called Hall and learned that the LAPD had no information on the dead woman. He rang Nolan Rogers and found that she was still Jane Doe. He ran his idea past them, Noel was enthusiastic but Rogers demurred. He had to run it up the tree. Zeb hung up, thought for a moment, and dialed another number. He watched an ice cream vendor skateboard past, only in LA and focused on his phone when a cool voice answered. Claire heard him silently and when he had finished she said simply, go for it. I'll sort out any heat if it arises. She stopped him before he hung up. You remember Prince Abdul, the Saudi royal whose daughter you rescued? Yeah, that was a long time back. What about him? His brother died recently. He was wondering if anyone from us would be visiting to pay our respects. Zeb looked at the phone in bemusement for a moment and brought it back to his ear. Zeb? Are you there? Yeah. I was wondering if I heard you right. She laughed, yes I gathered that. He called me and said your presence would be appreciated. He doesn't know me. All he knows is that a black ops team rescued his daughter. He doesn't, but he wants the lead agent. He kicked himself mentally when she fell silent. Of course, there's a political element. They are our key ally. She can't and won't ask me to go, that isn't how we work. I'll go on Friday. Just me. No need to take the others along. That's fine, I'll let Prince Abdul know. Friday is five days away. Time enough for what I plan to do. Two days later, Zeb's advertisement ran on the front of two Wyoming newspapers and on the inside page of the Los Angeles Times. It displayed an edited picture of the dead woman with a call to help identify her. A helpline number was listed. By mid-afternoon, the woman's identity, Elena Petrova of Cheyenne, was established. By evening, a few people were unhappy on a ranch near Evanston, Wyoming. Chapter 9 The ranch was 3,000 acres and was stocked with cattle as well as a few head of horses and sheep. It nestled at the foot of the Uinta mountain range and its land was rich in water and feed its livestock were fat and healthy. Jason Studdlander, who passed for Steve Morrow in Pinedale, wasn't feeling happy. He had to report to his boss, Luke Wasserman, and it wasn't going to be a jovial meeting. The hoods he had hired in Los Angeles had failed. The 38th Street gang bosses said Carter had disappeared. 
They had feet on the street looking out for the man, but there was no knowing where Carter had gone. The men in Pinedale had failed too. Studdlander had underestimated Carter. However, when Wasserman had spoken to Carter in the parking lot and he had subsequently left town, they all had figured it was the end of the matter. Then the man had returned to town and had followed Morrow's trail to Los Angeles. The FBI's intervention hadn't deterred him, and at that point, Wasserman had ordered Studdlander to wipe Carter out. Eliminating men or women came easy to Wasserman and Studdlander. Both had military backgrounds and had become mercenaries when the private military contractor business opened up. Wasserman had initially served in Africa, assignments that had taken him to Somalia, Nigeria, Sudan and many other hotspots where he had built a reputation for coldly and ruthlessly getting the job done. From Africa, he graduated to Europe, where he worked in Serbia and several Balkan countries. He then moved to the United States, which became his base. He worked with a tight-knit team of fellow mercenaries, of whom Studdlander was one. All of them were known by different names in those days. Some of them, like Wasserman, even had different faces. Studdlander's career path mimicked Wasserman's but for the viciousness. Studdlander was comfortable with being a killer, but Wasserman was different. Wasserman was a psychopath. Wasserman's reputation grew in certain circles and reached a certain man in Washington, D.C., who was good at putting men in touch with one another. That man called another man who knew yet another person. Their principal's agent reached out to Wasserman, interviewed him, and hired him. Wasserman became the principal's chief troubleshooter, smoothing out the obstacles in his paymaster's path. Smoothing sometimes involved bribing, occasionally raping, and most usually killing brutally. The principal's enormous reach ensured that all such obstacles just disappeared off the face of the planet and were never heard of again. Until this man, Zeb Carter, stumbled across Elena Petrova's grave. Studdlander drew a deep breath, wiped his shoes on a mat outside the ranch's entrance, and headed inside. The entrance hallway was deep and wide, it opened into an enormous living room that had a log fire crackling in it at all times of the year. Rugs and throws were scattered on the polished wooden floor, and couches were strewn across the room. The walls were adorned with hunting trophies and the heads of animals. There were photographs of celebrities visiting the ranch, including a couple of presidents. Wasserman stood alone at a long table that shone in the dim light. He had a sheaf of papers in his hand, which he thrust at Studdlander silently. Studdlander read them swiftly. They had Carter's bio, his army history, his days as a military contractor, his security firm. His family, friends, associates, and clients were all listed. His shoe size and undergarment preferences were listed. His eating habits, his martial arts experience, his last recorded shooting scores, they were all there. Wasserman had access to the country's best intelligence networks. What's more, he could influence them. This isn't a concerned citizen. He's capable and dangerous. Wasserman's voice was smooth and liquid and was a stark contrast to his cold green eyes set in a hatchet face. That idea of going to the press with Petrova's photograph, genius. There was no admiration in his tone, just an acceptance of ability. The eyes blazed with fire when they rested on Studdlander. If you had picked better shooters and planned the kill better, it wouldn't have come to this. Studdlander's stomach clenched in the sudden silence. Wasserman didn't like mistakes, let alone two of them. He had seen Wasserman gut a man on that very wooden floor. A log crackled in the silence, but Wasserman didn't blink, his eyes remained unmoving on Studdlander. After long minutes, he reached out and took the papers from Studdlander's nerveless fingers and fed them in the fire. He turned over the logs with a poker, and after brushing his hands, he turned back to his lieutenant. Where's he now? We have lost him. He still has his room in the motel, but he's not staying there. We are calling every motel in a five-mile radius. I have men looking out for his vehicle, too. The LAPD has a security camera database and a facial recognition program. We have access to the LAPD, talk to our man, and see if the database has Carter on it. Wasserman gave a name to Studdlander and pinned him with his green eyes again. 
Find him. Finish him this time. Make it clean. Or what happens to you will be dirty. He didn't have to voice the words. They hung heavy in the air. He turned his back on Stutterlander and heard the man stumble from the room. Things had been moving so smoothly, the assassin had completed the Saudi royal job and would shortly get his next target, and then this Carter had to turn up. Carter had found the body. Then he had made the woman. He could. Wasserman erased the thought from his mind. Carter would be found and eliminated, and the principal's plan would progress. The principal wasn't aware of Carter's existence, very soon, there wouldn't be a need. Zeb exchanged furious texts with the twins, broker and the rest of his crew. I'm going alone. This isn't a mission. I'm just going to pay condolences to Prince Abdul. Everything turns into a mission sooner or later with you, broker responded. You need to be covered. That royal palace is one of the safest residences in the world. It isn't a war zone. Doesn't matter. We're coming with you, Beth chimed in. You went to Wyoming for a holiday, and look what happened. You are not. They got the message finally, and the texts dried up. He made another call to a private airfield in New York, and got their Lear ready to fly to L.A., and thence to Riyadh. The jet had been funded from the Royals' rewards, and their investments now more than covered its running costs. It had two pilots who were both ex-U.S. Air Force, both had seen combat, and knew their way around weapons. Both were part of their trusted crew. Zeb made a few more calls and went to meet another contact, the editor of the L.A. Times. Elena was one heck of a journalist. I was shell-shocked to see her picture in my paper and to read that she's dead. She was an amazing woman. Clint Parrish rocked in his chair in his glass-walled cabin that overlooked a vast floor filled with desktops and people scurrying about as they put together the next day's paper. Parrish's forehead shone in the harsh light, a light sheen of sweat on it reflecting the light. Zeb could see himself in the man's thick glasses. I thought she worked on the East Coast. Zeb queried him. She did, but she gave up the daily grind, moved to Wyoming and became an independent journalist. She wrote for us frequently. At least two of her pieces resulted in several Los Angeles City Council members being investigated and then arrested for corruption. Great woman. He shook his head and nearly fell off his chair. How did she pick her stories? Did she specialize in anything? Politics. Her stories were all political, either local or national. She brought down four senators for sleaze and corruption. She also interviewed the last three presidents. She was well known in D.C. and New York, a journalistic celebrity. You know what she was working on? Parrish gesticulated furiously through the glass partition at a co-worker, and when he had cowed the girl, turned his attention back to Zeb. Nope. That wasn't the way she worked. Once she had a story ready, she would call, outline it, and ask if we were interested. We always were, but she ran it like an auction. Whichever national newspaper paid her the most, got the story. That was okay with you. Sure. He snorted. Of course we would love to run all her stories since they were always punchy, but she had to make a living and we don't have unlimited funds. You know which paper ran her last story? He frowned. Could be us. It was the Domingo Perez one, I think. He read Zeb's blank glance. L, councilman who ran a porn ring. He cackled delightedly. That was one heck of a story. It ran for a few months and got us on top of ratings. He flung open his door and yelled at a flunky. Pete, get off your ass and get me Petrova's file. You gotta keep them on their toes. These days all they do is go on that Facebook and Twitter shit. Petrova, now she was a real journalist. He mumbled and tapped impatiently on his desk as they waited for Pete to turn up. Pete rushed in, threw the file on Parrish's desk and disappeared without a word. The editor shook his head, no respect either, thumbed through it and passed it on to Zeb. Elena Petrova's bio listed her date of birth, hometown, 
address degrees, and the various papers she had worked at and the awards she had won. There were clippings of her articles and details of payments made to her. No record of parents or family, no place of birth. Not enough meat. He posed the query to the editor and got a scornful reply in return. You think we're a dating agency, bud? He threw a last question at Parrish. She had enemies. Another snort. If it had more power, he would have had liftoff. Which journalist doesn't? You can tell how good a reporter is by the enemies he or she makes. Petrova was one of the best. Betcha there are many people who are secretly pleased she's dead. I would start with Perez, he yelled at Zeb's departing back. He said to have drug cartel connections. Zeb fired off another text to Beth and Megan. Need everything on Elena Petrova. His phone buzzed in reply. Your wish is our command master. Clowns all of them. I wouldn't have anyone else with me though. He thought of Perez and Petrova as he stood in line at a burger stall. Perez was sent to prison a year back on the basis of Petrova's story and her evidence. Would he have organized the kill from inside? Paul picked up his call on the second ring. Found another body? Or have you killed someone? Zeb laughed. Give me time. I've just started. He turned serious. Perez. Could he have arranged her death? Funny you should ask. LAPD is now officially liaising with the Rangers, and we are looking into this. If you asked my opinion, I would say there's no connection. I met Perez a few times and while he is a sleazy character, he didn't strike me as capable of this. But I've been wrong before. He carried on when Zeb didn't respond, bro let my men do their job. I'll let you know what they find. Hall's way of asking me to back off from a LAPD investigation. No problem. Next stop Cheyenne. Zeb thought when he had hung up. I'll check her home out. After I get back from Riyadh. He spent a couple of hours reading the information the twins had started sending through, and it was evening by the time he reached his motel. It was an unpretentious one that catered to traveling salespeople, visitors on a budget, and those like Zeb who didn't want a trail. He walked past the lobby, nodded at the woman behind the desk, and as the elevator doors closed in front of him saw her staring at him, wide-eyed, open-mouthed. Her look stayed with him, and he punched another number on the panel, two floors above his. The hallway was empty when he exited the elevator. The stairs were clear when he drifted down and reached his floor. He opened the entrance cautiously, saw a couple make their way to the elevator bank, nodded politely at them, and walked past his room. He turned back when they had disappeared and approached his door. No sounds emerged from within. The crack at the bottom showed no movement. Why that look on her face? I've seen her a few times, she's always smiling. He tried to remember if he had seen anything in the parking lot. Nothing had jumped out. Maybe a welcoming party inside? I can't wait them out nor can I enter the room till I'm sure it's safe. He eyed the hallway up and down and then an idea struck him. He went to the lower floor, waited for a gaggle of visitors to enter the elevator, and when it had reached the lobby, he triggered the fire alarm. There was no initial reaction and then doors burst and heads popped out. Fire, he yelled. The hotel's on fire. Get out. Heads disappeared back inside hastily, murmurs became shouts and pretty soon people began streaming out, cursing and swearing. Zeb joined them, pushed his way ahead of the now surging throng and when they reached the lobby, he made his way to his SUV. The hotel staff swung into action and directed people to gather in the parking lot where they stood huddled and shivering. Other staff went to each floor to check all the rooms were empty. Sirens could be heard in the distance, growing louder with each passing second. Zeb clambered into the rear of his vehicle, extracted a toolkit from a concealed compartment, and unfolded a tubular device. It worked like a periscope and gave a telescopic view around bends and angles. Residents will be scared or excited or nervous. 
the welcoming party will be wary and will try to blend in. They will also be the ones to get away in their rides. All others will stay put in the lot. He ran his eye through the crowd, about a hundred of them, seeking people who stood out, who didn't belong. He discounted people in nightwear, those in skin-tight clothing or those in flip-flops. Hoods will be wearing something loose to cover their guns. A few men looked possible, but they wrapped their arms around other guests and stayed with the throng. The crowd grew restive and shouted questions at the harried hotel staff, and the chaos increased when the first fire truck pulled in front of the hotel. Three men slipped out from behind the throng when most of the eyes were on the truck. Two of them appeared to be white, the third was Hispanic. They walked swiftly, casting darting eyes at other vehicles in the parking lot. One of them eyed Zeb's vehicle, but Zeb was deep in the back, and the darkened glass at the rear cut off visibility from the outside. They piled into a dark green Nissan and pulled out cautiously, and when they had disappeared outside, Zeb followed. He lost sight of them when he hit the main street, but there were only two options to go. Left or right? Left is the fire truck, right is free road. Right. They would want to put distance from the hotel. He floored the vehicle, overtook slow-moving vehicles, and when he was on the verge of giving up, he saw a flash of green at a light. He drifted closer, confirmed it was them and then hung back, leaving four cars in between. He pressed a button on the console, and a miniature camera popped up on the roof. The console display split, and one half now showed a magnified front-view feed from the camera. The Nissan stuck out clearly in the traffic. Not ideal. Camera is good for about 10 car lengths. Need a couple more cars to back up. My SUV is too distinctive. He thought about calling Hall, but discarded the idea. A cruiser would be too obvious. A slice of luck came his way at another light. An Escalade, black and powerful looking, pulled up beside him. He fell behind it when the light turned and used it as cover. He jacked the camera another inch to see over the Escalade. They drove down La Cienaga Boulevard, turned left onto Adams Boulevard, and drove for half an hour before entering Huntington Park. By now, the men had rolled their windows down, and Zeb could see the occasional elbow jutting through a window. Relaxed. So what if they didn't get me? They made out in one piece, they lived to fight another day. They slowed, crossed busy streets, and when they reached Walnut Street, a flasher lit and they turned into a residential drive. The house was typical of hundreds on the street, white walls, red tiles, and a yard that had seen better days. Litter lined the sides of the house and beer cans in the small front yard caught the streetlights. Zeb sped on without looking at the men, hung a right at the far end, circled and parked five houses away. He walked casually, just another resident enjoying the warm night, and scoped the house. It was lit up now and he could hear a pounding beat from within. No shadows crossed the windows, no dogs barked. He scanned the street swiftly, ducked inside the yard, and went up to the door and pounded on it. He darted to a small gate at the side, leapt over it, and ran behind the side. A window looked promising, but he carried on to the rear. House doesn't have air conditioning that I can see, maybe they left the rear door open for air. Jackpot. It was invitingly open. He entered noiselessly, went past a utility room, and then into a kitchen. The kitchen opened into a dining room that turned into a hallway that branched out to other rooms. He passed bedrooms and bathrooms, and then the living room opened up before him. He could hear the men arguing and calling out as they stood at the front. He heard them talking for some more time, then one of them swore loudly and the door slammed shut. Footsteps sounded and grew louder and halted suddenly as he came out of the dark and faced them. Two men were up front, a third, the Hispanic one, was behind. They looked at him unbelievingly for a second, and then one yelled, Shit, it's him, and clawed at his waist. Zeb brought his hand from behind and flung the jug of cold water on them. Shock made them freeze, by then the wicker chair Zeb had hurled was on them. Its leg caught the first man flush in the mouth, broke his jaw and he went down out of the fight. He fell on top of the other two, and they stumbled and fell. The Hispanic man was fast, so was the second man. Hispanic twisted eel-like, grabbed at his leg and a snub-nosed gun came up. 
Zeb shot him in the shoulder and he howled. Zeb shot him again in the elbow and the howl became louder. The second man crabbed sideways, threw a vase at Zeb, threw whatever his hands could find, a side table and a dirty plate. Zeb ducked and the hood used that opportunity to withdraw his gun. The barrel came up, his mouth twisted in a snarl, the sneer faded as his right shoulder blossomed red and he fell back. Silence fell broken only by the groans in the room. Zeb righted the wicker chair and seated himself. Now we'll talk. Chapter 10 The three hoods hadn't given much to Zeb, they were 38th Street foot soldiers and all they knew was that Zeb had to be taken out. They had been given his photograph, where he stayed, and the modus operandi had been left to them. The hoods had taken out a businessman in that same motel a year back, by hiding in his room, shooting him as he entered. They had escaped through the window. They figured what worked for the businessman would work on Zeb. How did they know Zeb would be at the motel? The men sneered despite their pain. They were 38th Street. Nothing happened in the city that they didn't know. Zeb kicked the white man in his shoulder right where he had shot him. That answer wasn't helpful. The man shouted and swore at Zeb. He backed off quickly when Zeb raised his foot again and the word spilled out. The gang figured Zeb would be holed up in a similar motel, and then it had been a matter of making calls, describing Zeb and his SUV. Who ordered the hit? The three men looked at one another, licked their lips. Fuck you bitch. We don't talk. You can do whatever you want, one of them said bravely. You're a dead man walking anyway. You picked a fight with 38th Street. Our homies will come along and run a train all over you. Zeb shot him in the thigh, and his words compressed into a scream. I can go on all day, Zeb said helpfully when he was reduced to soft moans. I won't kill you but you'll die of bleeding. He lifted his gun and answers spilled out. It was Lil Gun. He ran their neighborhood, gave them orders, and took collections off them. He's like our top dog. He's the toppest dog? Hispanic sneered. You think we're some dumbass gang? Lil Gun has other homies he reports to. Where does this Lil Gun hang out? Does he have a real name? You don't worry about that. Pretty soon he'll be hanging off your ass, bitch. Hispanic laughed, coughed, and scrabbled back hastily when Zeb raised his Glock. Zamora Street, he yelled. He's got a pad there. Zeb looked at the first man who was nursing a broken jaw at the baleful eyes blazing at him. He crouched over him, reached down his leg and plunged his benchmate in the fleshy part of the man's thigh. He shrieked, swore and doubled up, cursing. Why did you go do that? Where does this little gun hang out? Zeb repeated, ignoring his swearing. Zamora Street, just like Pepe told you. Fuck man, you done gone and ruined my leg asshole. He moaned. What's his real name? The three men didn't answer for several minutes, they were clutching their legs and twisting on the floor. Hispanic finally spoke, it's Cisco, don't know his first name. You think this is over, bitch. Lil Gun will fry your balls and feed them to you. Zeb pulled his phone out, and their eyes widened when he started dialing. Who you calling, thug? The cops. Don't you want to report this? Fuck that. Hispanic's face was desperate. We got nothing to say to them, Popo. You just bust out of here. I haven't decided about killing you. The eyes became saucers and the men moved as one, putting distance. You've done enough damage, bro. None of us will be able to use our pegs for a long time. Why don't you leave us? Hispanic whined. We won't say nothing to no one, not even to our homies. That's right, the last guy Zeb shot said through gritted teeth. We'll tell them we got capped by another gang. Zeb let the silence weigh on them and when their desperation had reached breaking point, nodded once and left them. He waited in the dark near his SUV and watched their hideout, but the men raised no alarm, no vehicles came rushing, no cruisers turned up. They're probably wanted by the cops, he thought, as his SUV growled to life and put distance between him and the hoods. 
he made a mental note to check out Petrova's apartment once he had questioned Sisko. Riyadh first though, and Prince Abdul. That will also give Broker time to dig through Petrova's phone and email records. Knowing him, he'll probably probe her bank accounts too. Riyadh's heat hit him even though the sun was setting when his Lear landed the next day. He donned his shades, and the moment his feet hit tarmac, a limousine bearing the royal family's coat of arms swung toward him. A man dressed in a ceremonial thobe rushed out, bowed at him and shouted orders at a flunky who rushed to take Zeb's valise. It's no trouble. I'll carry it, Zeb spoke in Arabic, and followed the royal emissary to the limo. The man made small talk as they drove through traffic that parted for the vehicle, and let slip that Prince Abdul was keen to meet Zeb. Zeb was escorted swiftly through the security cordon outside Prince Abdul's retreat, a sand-colored palace that was concealed from prying eyes by high walls. He was led to an inner chamber in which a sumptuous buffet was laid out. The escort bade him silently to an ornate chair, but before Zeb could seat himself, Prince Abdul made his appearance. He was as tall as Zeb and had the royal family's signature beak nose and hawk eyes. He was garbed in a simple robe that flowed loosely around him, but Zeb sensed the steel and power in his body. Zeb rose silently, aware of the eyes studying him, and gripped the hand that was thrust out. The eyes continued to probe silently, and what they saw satisfied the prince who seated himself, Zeb following suit. I owe you my life, Prince Abdul said simply, and smiled at Zeb's embarrassment. I had to use all my powers to get your boss to send you. She told me I am the only man outside your world who now knows who you are and what you do. I am sorry for your loss, sir. Claire conveys her condolences too. Zeb replied formally. The prince grasped his hands in silence and then led him to the spread, and when they were seated again, Zeb asked him. How's your daughter, sir? The smile became a beam, the prince became a dad, as he pulled out his phone and showed several photographs of a lovely young woman. She's studying economics at Harvard. She will be back next year and will take up an important role in running this country. Permission to speak freely, sir? Zeb asked him when he had put away his phone. Of course. I would have it no other way. Even if I did, Claire warned me you are known for your blunt approach. The prince was educated in Oxford and it told. His English was fluent, a slight British accent underlined his words. Why am I here, sir? Claire or our ambassador was better suited to pay our respects for your loss. Your ambassador was here the next day. Prince Abdul leaned back and steepled his fingers. My brother was fifty years old when he died. Heart attack. The stress of a high-profile job not enough exercise, you know how it goes. Zeb nodded, not knowing where the prince was going. But here's the thing. No male in the royal family has died of natural causes that young. I dug up the entire family history, and all males have lived to seventy years at the least. Genetics breeding, call it what you want, but young deaths are unheard of in the palace. Zeb frowned. Surely sir you aren't suspecting. I am not at this stage, the prince interrupted. We have the best doctors at our command, and all of them said the death was natural. But you're not fully convinced. The prince nodded. I have become paranoid ever since my daughter was kidnapped. He laughed. I see conspiracies where none exist, I investigate anything remotely out of the ordinary. I am driving people mad around me. The king has even asked me to seek counseling. He sobered. My brother's death though, I can't help feeling it wasn't natural. Unfortunately, I have nothing to base my suspicions on. Why me sir? You have some of the best investigative agencies in the world. You can seek the FBI's help if you wish. I am not sure how I can help you. That's where you are wrong. The prince sprang to his feet and beckoned imperiously. Follow me. Prince Abdul led him through a labyrinth of hallways and corridors, and down several flights of stairs to a passage that had guards patrolling it. One of them hurried across and bowed and took the two of them to a closed door. The door opened at a coded knock, and the two men inside fell back at the prince's entry. 
The room was refrigerated, and on a stainless steel table in the center, a body was laid out. They're embalming the body, readying it for the funeral tomorrow. The prince nodded, and the two men left them alone in the room. I have heard of assassins who kill without leaving any marks. I am told they are some of the most dangerous men in the world, and their skills are highly sought after. The Hawkeyes sought Zeb again. I am also told you are one of those men. Zeb met his eyes and shrugged. I'm just a special ops agent, sir. I have been also called an assassin, a hitman, a gangster, a thug. Labels don't matter to me. I will do whatever needed to protect my country. The prince smiled knowingly and pointed at his brother's body. I want your eyes to examine my brother. You live in that shadowy world. You know how certain matters are executed, shall we say. I want your opinion. That's why I requested your presence. He had enemies? The prince laughed humorlessly. Of course he did. The royal family rules over 28 million people. There are several malcontents in that population. He continued when Zeb didn't reply. My brother was a controversial person, as you are well aware. He was our voice on OPEC, but it was his association with terrorist groups that drew a lot of attention worldwide. I am sure a lot of people are happy that he's no more. Not many know that for the last couple of years he had seen behind the facade these terrorists put on. He saw how they misused our religion. He had begun to distance himself from them. Did he fund terrorist organizations when he was a supporter? Zeb made no move, his face didn't change, but the air was suddenly heavy. Prince Abdul looked him squarely in the eyes. We don't know. I know that the king asked him to desist mingling with those people and threatened to cut off his allowance, but he was a popular man and the king could only go so far. He sighed and rubbed the bridge of his nose. Funding and supporting terrorists is like catching a tiger by its tail. I know that the king knows it, most of the royal family members know it. I think my brother only realized it too late. We are trying to modernize our country, trying to change people's attitudes, become more outward-looking. My brother was different from us. Are you saying he was killed for supporting extremists? Prince Abdul moved restlessly. No. Firstly, I don't know he was killed, hence your presence here. Secondly, he had many controversial views on the role of religion, the shape of society. He could have been killed for any number of reasons. He smiled grimly. His views drove us to rage, and I am sure many of us contemplated strangling him in the heat of the moment. He sighed and his word dropped away. After long moments, he gestured at the body. Will you examine the body? His voice was tentative and uncertain. He's not his brother. He's moderate, progressive, and our ally. Zeb nodded and stepped to the table. At first glance, the body revealed no secrets. The skin was pale and cold to the touch. He looked at the prince, and when he nodded in consent, he turned the body over on its belly. Nothing on the back either. The skin was smooth and unblemished. He rolled the body back and studied it with greater care, starting from its feet. The soles were unbroken, there were no marks between the toes. The calves and thighs were hairy but hid no cuts or abrasions. There were no marks on the inner thighs or on the testicles. The prince shifted once but made no comment. His face was expressionless and hid any squeamishness he felt. The dead royal's fingernails were cut neatly and showed no pricks. They were pale in color and unstained. Did he smoke? No. He didn't drink either. Fast cars and women were his only vices. He smiled at Zeb's stare. It's just you and I in this room, my friend. I can say that to you. Outside we lead a model life. Zeb bent back to the body and ran his hands up his arms, the inside of the elbows and his underarms. He felt the skin under the earlobes. It was smooth. The inside of the ears revealed no secrets. I need my backpack, sir. Prince Abdul went to the door and rapped out an order. 
a flunky went racing up the corridor and was back in 15 minutes with Zeb's rucksack. Zeb flipped it open and withdrew a small flashlight. He turned it on and shone it behind the body's ears. The skin showed dull brown, no cuts and no pricks. He examined the eyes and eyelids, and when he was satisfied, he turned the body on its belly again. A full hour later, he had moved up from the feet to the neck. The prince had not moved impatiently once during his entire examination. You don't get to wield that power without learning to be patient. Anything found in his blood? No. He didn't take any drugs. Nothing suspicious was found. Zeb turned off the lights in the room, paused when the doors suddenly opened, and the guards came in brandishing guns. They scurried out at a gesture from the prince, and he turned back to the body. He examined the body with just his flashlight, and then made a second and third pass, after fitting various filters on the light. It was on the last pass, with a special filter, that he spotted it. The faintest discoloration on the back of the neck. Chapter 11 The prince sensed something in him and peered over his shoulder. What? What is it? Zeb shook his head. The idea was floating in his mind, but he needed more than a discoloration for it to weigh down firmly. He ran the filter over the knees and elbows and found what he was seeking. He turned on the lights in the room and found the hawk eyes trained on him. I know you've found something. There was a deep satisfaction in the prince's voice. I knew you were the right man for this. Zeb responded with a question. Can I see the prayer room, sir? Yes. Anything you want. He led them out, snapped his fingers, and the guards straightened. Zeb stopped him before he issued instructions. Could they wait for some time? They can ready the body as soon as I check something out. It shouldn't take more than an hour. The guards bowed at a hand signal from the prince and secured the room. The prince took them up the same flight of stairs, steered him past a gaggle of children who looked wide-eyed at the white man beside the royal, to a door in a hallway. A guard straightened when they approached, bowed and stepped out of the way. Only the royal family is allowed to open and shut these doors, the prince murmured and pushed them open. Zeb was impressed with the simple decor of the room. It had none of the fancy gold lining and elaborate lighting in the rest of the palace. Its walls were white, its floor was plain and bare, and the windows were plain glass set in wooden frames. He removed his shoes and stepped deeper and examined the room. It was fifteen feet long, ten feet across, and had just the one entrance. A prayer mat was a few feet in front of him. Where was he found? The prince pointed to a spot on the mat on which Zeb lay down, curled his body in a couple of positions, and at the last contortion, got a nod from the royal. He inspected the lock on the door, a simple one that could be picked from the outside or the inside. He went out in the hallway, looked at the ceiling. No cameras? No. We never felt the need, not with these many guards around always. How many guards were stationed here on that day? Two. He led the prince back to the body, turned it over, and pointed to the discoloration on the back of the neck. The prince squinted and looked at the skin from several angles, but didn't spot it. He breathed sharply when Zeb lit the filter and the darker skin jumped out. What is it? The prince whispered. It can happen when a particular lock is applied. He demonstrated with his hands but when the prince's eyes remained uncomprehending, he stood behind the royal and with a may I gesture, placed his hands on Prince Abdul. Any kind of killing leaves marks, Zeb explained after demonstrating the hold. Even the most accomplished killers leave something behind on the body, but since the death looks natural, those signs aren't picked up. Zeb followed the prince outside, letting the royal think furiously, making the connections for himself. But, the prince swallowed, that'll mean the killer had to have contact with my brother. Yes, Zeb said grimly. And that's the problem. The prayer room has no place for concealment. There's no way the killer could have hidden there. The guards would have spotted anyone approaching. Unless, he stopped and shook his head. Are you looking for conspiracies where none exist? 
Unless what? Sir, that mark could have a perfectly innocent cause. The prince waved his words away. I'm aware of that, Zeb. But let's explore all possibilities. What were you leading to? The killer could be someone familiar. Someone they see regularly, someone who doesn't stay in the memory. The prince dismissed his idea and continued toward the prayer room. Every family member was accounted for. We know where exactly everyone who works in the palace was. We interrogated the guards, they are blameless. They paused outside the prayer room where Zeb broke off to examine the corridor and to check out the passages that lead away from the main hallway. He shook his head in frustration when he knocked on the walls. Concrete. No place to hide here. Even if the killer hid somewhere, how did he escape? He rejoined the prince, but his eyes were on the guard who was staring straight ahead. Your guards maintain logs? They record everything that happened on their watch? Yes, the prince led him back to his chambers where he snapped orders and presently a lean, clean-shaven, uniformed man appeared. The prince introduced him as Aban Khalili, the head of security. Zeb saw the competent look in the man's eyes, recognized the epaulets on Khalili's shoulder. Colonel. Their palace guards are some of the toughest soldiers. He shook hands with the man once the prince had finished introductions and asked him in fluent Arabic. Can I see your logs? Khalili quickly concealed his surprise at Zeb's command of the language and natural accent, turned his head away, and whispered in a radio. The security detail maintained a handwritten ledger and backed that up with computer records. Redundancy, Khalili explained, but also accuracy. If the two logs don't match, we investigate. Zeb nodded and skimmed through the pages till he found the date he was looking for. The logs started at 00.00 hours each day and ended at the same hour the next. They covered every minutia of royal life and recorded in great detail the movements and all happenings in the palace. He stilled when he saw an entry, read back several pages, went forward a few more and finally looked up, his eyes distant, lost in thought. He came back to the present when Khalili cleared his throat, and reaching for a pen, he circled several names on the logs. Can you get me their records? Khalili glanced at the names, nodded, bowed and disappeared. Prince Abdul stirred when the head of security had gone. You've found something, my friend. You've got the look of a wolf. I wish I hadn't found it, sir. Unfortunately, your suspicions are true. Your brother was killed. Prince Abdul's eyes narrowed to fierce points of light. You're sure? I will be once I see those logs and check a couple of things more. But I am certain I am not wrong. The prince's fist clenched once and loosened. Let's be sure. Then we'll find the killer. The personnel records didn't have anything incriminating, but Zeb wasn't expecting the killer to be revealed so easily. He singled out two records, handed the rest back, and asked the colonel to lead him to the false alarm incidents. Zeb made to deter the prince when the royal accompanied them, but a glance at the set jaw told him it would be futile. Khalili led them to several hallways, pointed to the alarms that had gone off irregularly, and finally came to the prayer room. He silently pointed at the alarm in the ceiling, just a few yards away from the doors to the room. At Zeb's request, a stepladder appeared. He climbed up, took the alarm apart, but found nothing in them. Those are the new alarms, Khalili told him, but even those went off irregularly. They didn't, Zeb replied grimly. They stopped going off the day after the prince's death. Since then, not a single false alarm went off. A dawning light appeared in Khalili's eyes. You think? I think this hallway needs to be searched thoroughly. Can you have some men go through every square inch of the ceiling, walls and floor within 20 feet of this detector? Khalili turned to issue orders, halted when Zeb stopped him. Maps? Are there maps of all the passages and rooms in the palace? Khalili hesitated and looked at the prince. Zeb read his indecision. There are probably secret passages within the palace for the royal's use. Prince Abdul's voice was steel. Anything Mr. Carter wants, he will get. 
Zeb stopped Kalili again. One last thing. I want security camera logs for the day of the death, as well as for the day before and day after. You know who this killer could be? I am told there aren't many such men in the world. The prince asked Zeb once Kalili had left. I don't, sir. Such men hide their identities for obvious reasons. But once Kalili comes back, I can show you the killer. The assassin had finished a job in Berlin, the emissary, and was now in the US. The emissary had to die, of course. The only people who saw the assassin's face and lived were those who had nothing to do with his business. He was bemused how the emissary had thought he could meet the assassin and live. Not my problem. He's no more a risk. He had grabbed the emissary when the man was returning from work, had bundled him into an SUV, and had taken him to a remote, industrial park outside the city. There, he had interrogated the emissary, and hadn't been disappointed when the emissary didn't have anything more. The emissary had never met the sponsor. His only contact was with a voice with whom he had gone through an extensive credentials check. The emissary shared the sponsor's views with a burning intensity. He had articulated those views in a few select private dinners, and one day the voice had reached out to him. I don't need to know who's paying me. I have to make sure I am safe. He applied advanced interrogation methods, and the emissary babbled that he had left no incriminating documents, emails, recordings of photographs. The assassin believed him. Nothing but the truth came out of people once the assassin worked on them. The assassin killed the emissary and arranged the death to look like an extreme sexual activity. Given the remoteness of the site, it was likely that the body wouldn't be discovered for days, by then, the assassin would be out of the country. He then searched the messenger's apartment, his workplace, and confirmed for himself that the emissary had been telling the truth. The next day, he boarded a flight to America. A week later, his cutout reached him there and handed him his next assignment. Another high-profile political target, but this time the timescales were compressed. This time the sponsors wanted results in weeks. The cutout didn't mention the dead emissary, and the assassin didn't bring it up. They discussed timelines, payments and when the assassin hung up, an email arrived from the cutout, bearing a dossier on the target. The target was the Venezuelan oil minister who was due to attend an oil industry conference in Texas, in three weeks' time. The assassin studied the dossier, noted the minister's diet, sexual habits, a mistress in Caracas, the state of his marriage, and when he had absorbed everything, booked a flight to Texas. That's the assassin, Zeb pointed at a security camera image of Mohamed Rauf, the personal trainer, three days later. In the still image, Rauf was standing in the security enclosure, laughing at a joke as he was frisked by a guard. Zeb was with Prince Abdul and Khalili as he walked the royal through his findings. The electrical devices, still in place in the various hallway walls that fooled the fire alarms into going off. The forgotten room in the passage next to the prayer room. The logs that showed the personal trainer in the vicinity of the alarms when they went off. Most importantly, he has disappeared. Zeb concluded. Rauf paid his respects to the family the next day, but from then on hasn't been seen or heard from. The prince's face was pale in shock when he rose, shut the door to his chamber and faced Zeb and Khalili. You're sure, Carter? This man was trusted by us. He was a trainer to several members in the family, in fact my wife and I used his services several times. Zeb nodded silently without replying. The assassin's hands were on him. He could have been killed. Khalili protested, his face dark with anger and embarrassment. You must be mistaken, Mr. Carter. Rauf went through extensive checks, and only then was he admitted inside the palace. We don't allow any random trainer to work with the royal family. You have got DNA records for him, don't you? Yes, the security chief replied. We maintain records for everyone who enters, works or lives in the palace. We've got yours too. Zeb removed an envelope from inside his jacket and handed it over to Khalili, who stared at it for a second and then opened it. 
He extracted a sheet of paper, frowned in bewilderment for a moment, turned to a file beside him, flipped pages rapidly, and sucked in a breath sharply. His fingers had the faintest tremble in them when he folded the sheet and started putting it back in the envelope. Look inside. He opened the envelope wider and withdrew a plastic bag. He held it against the light, squinted, and turned to Zeb. They're his? Yes. Prince Abdul's voice cut through impatiently. What's that? What did you find, Zeb? Muhammad Rauf's hair, sir, they were found on a laundry sheet. Luckily, the sheet hadn't been washed yet. Their DNA matches Khalili's records. The prince thought for a moment and shook his head when it didn't make sense to him. Explain. The killer hid in the utility room either before or after the killing, and then hid himself in the dirty laundry to escape. He probably expected the laundry to be washed immediately. Zeb's voice became grim. We got lucky. Rauf didn't know the contractor had a broken washer, and the washing was delayed. The royal sat motionless for several minutes, it was only when faint voices from outside intruded, that he stirred. His stern gaze moved to Khalili. Where is he? A faint sheen of sweat broke out on the colonel's forehead, but his voice was even. My men are looking into that, your highness. I have also asked the Mabahith to investigate. The Mabahith, the General Investigative Directorate, was the kingdom's secretive counterintelligence agency. Zeb had met a few of its agents in a training exercise, and he had a high regard for their capabilities. No one has to know why we are seeking him, Prince Abdul warned Khalili and dismissed him. The prince was silent for a long time, and Zeb knew what was going through his mind. He had wanted to eliminate assassination when he had called on Zeb, but deep down he wanted Zeb to prove the death was natural. Assassination opened an ugly can of worms. The thought that a killer could reach the inner sanctum was terrifying. That the killer was so accomplished was scary. Fear battled with anger at the security lapses. He did everything right. Zeb addressed Prince Abdul's thoughts. They both knew he was talking about Khalili. The trainer's legend was watertight. I would have accepted it. The fire alarms, going by what he knew, there wasn't any reason to rip apart the walls. Khalili's a great security head, I have the utmost faith in his competence. You do. Yes sir. Zeb did. He had gotten Broker to run Khalili through Werner and his entire intelligence network. All reports came back positive, everyone who knew the colonel had high regard for him. The prince didn't change expression or posture, but he seemed to breathe easier. His fingers toyed with a gold ceremonial dagger in his waist, his thumb idly rubbing over a gleaming red emerald. This assassin, he would have gotten away if you weren't here. How would you have done it? Come now Zeb, the prince chided him gently when Zeb didn't respond. I hope you aren't going to say you don't know what you are talking about. Zeb smiled briefly. There are other ways. He had spent years when that had happened, traveling for months in China, Japan, Kerala, Peru, Indonesia, in forgotten parts of the world. He had lived with remote communities no one had heard of, with people, some of whom were so old their skin was translucent. They had taught him about the insignificance of life and of death. They had taught him what mattered and what didn't. Some had taught him about killing in ways the rest of the world never knew of. Zeb finally spoke when the prince's probing eyes didn't leave him. I wouldn't have killed when he was alone. The royal frowned. In the presence of others? But how? Zeb had killed another royal in another country in just that manner, but Prince Abdul didn't need to know anything more. The prince accepted his reluctance to answer and changed the topic. You'll be leaving now? Tomorrow, sir. The House of Saud could track the killer now. They had his photographs, and with their unlimited wealth, there weren't many doors that would stay closed. Elena Petrova, on the other hand, wasn't a royal, but to Zeb she was more important. He wouldn't rest till she rested in peace. Prince Abdul summoned his assistant, who left after a murmured conversation. 
the assistant returned minutes later bearing a golden tray. On it was an ornate golden necklace from which hung a large, gleaming medallion. Prince Abdul rose, took the necklace reverently, and beckoned Zeb imperiously with his eyes. Zeb rose to his feet, recognized the King Abdul Aziz Order of Merit, the highest honor in the kingdom. Sir, he started but stopped when the Hawkeyes brooked no refusal. The prince placed the award around his neck ceremoniously and embraced him. His hand moved to his waist and he placed his personal dagger in Zeb's palms. This is nothing, he said fiercely when Zeb made to speak. My kingdom is yours. Chapter 12 Zeb was in Cheyenne three days later, but not before his crew had ribbed him mercilessly when he had texted them about the honor. He had sent the award to them along with the dagger, using a trusted courier, and it now hung in a glass case along with other honors they had received. The case wasn't for public viewing, neither were the awards something they bragged about. The twins had sent him extensive reports on Petrova, Perez, and Maro, and during calls with Hall, he had learned that the LAPD had conclusively ruled out Perez's involvement in Petrova's death. They had also reached the same conclusion as Zeb, that Maro was a red herring. Those hoods you killed? Hall continued. We hauled in the 38th Street's leaders in for questioning, but they all feigned ignorance. They would, wouldn't they? A grim laugh sounded in Zeb's ears. We are pursuing a gangbanger called Cisco, who those hoods reported to, but so far we haven't picked him up. The three gangsters I shot were in Cisco's crew. This is the second time his name has cropped up. Any progress on Petrova? Not my investigation, unfortunately, bro. That's still with the Rangers, and my understanding is they aren't making any progress. Say, he asked casually, you wouldn't know anything about three hoods being shot, would you? My detective said they heard three 38th Street hard cases were involved in a gunfight with unknown persons, and came out worse for wear. All three were connected to the guys you killed, and those same three are wanted in a couple of murders. I can't say the LAPD is displeased with the outcome. Not a clue, Jeff. I'm a law-abiding citizen. You know that. Sure do, there was a smile in Hall's voice. Happy hunting, he said with an emphasis on the last word and hung up. Zeb made another couple of calls to Noel and Rogers, and they both confirmed what Hall had told him. No progress on the Petrova case. They were following up with her employers, her friends and associates, but so far nothing had turned up. What about any stories she was working on? Zeb felt Roger shake his head as he replied. No one knows what she was working on. She sent abstracts of her story to various outlets when she was ready, and then went with one publisher. No different to what Parrish said. Cisco or Petrova. Who do I check out? He thought for a moment and decided on the reporter. Jeff's men will pick Cisco up sooner or later in any case, and if they don't, I will. Till then let the hood stew, wondering where I am. He called Broker, voiced his thoughts and Broker agreed with his line of thinking. He would call his media contacts to see if anyone knew what the story was about. She was meticulous. She researched extensively. If the story was explosive, she took multiple backups. Zeb recollected Parrish saying. She took more precautions if the story posed any danger to her. Could she have left copies of the story at her apartment? Petrova's apartment was a two-bedroom one on the fifth floor of a ten-floor complex, not far from the governor's residence. The block of apartments was a quiet, residential area, and saw traffic only during rush hour. It was hot, dusty and windy when Zeb passed the block from the outside and circled it a few times to get a feel for the neighborhood. Behind the block was a large parking lot that had an entrance into the building. No concierge inside, no gated entrance to the lot, but I guess this isn't a high security block. With the governor staying close by, not much security is required. He fueled at a food truck at the next street, chatted idly with the vendor, and learned that he was a regular on the street. Been serving my burgers and dogs in this neighborhood for the last five years. The vendor's van bore a sign, Garcia's Grub, and the likeness on the panel matched the vendor. 
Did Garcia know Petrova? Sure did. Garcia sprinkled various sauces liberally on the burger, placed it in a carry bag, added a paper bowl of fries, and thrust the bag at Zeb. Nice woman. Shame what happened to her. Hope they find the bastards soon. This is a nice little town, such crime is very rare. Did she talk about her stories? Nah. We just talked about the weather, politics, sports, that kind of stuff. We both followed the Cheyenne Grizzlies. He laughed at Zeb's look. You aren't local, are you? That's our baseball team. He frowned. This neighborhood's seeing a lot of new faces. What did he mean by that? Garcia mopped his face with a red towel. Couple of guys. Been coming here every day for the last few days for a burger. One's black haired and one's brown? My pals and I are looking to buy an apartment here. They came ahead to scout a few places, but my phone's dead. Haven't been able to talk to them. Nope. Both are brown haired. Garcia ran his eyes down Zeb. Maybe your height and build. Zeb shook his head gloomily. Those dudes aren't my buddies. I guess I'll just hang around till I spot them. He raised the bag in thanks and went back to his ride. Those two could be the mystery man's guys. Waiting for me at Petrova's apartment. Barrow paced Elena Petrova's lounge. He was lean as a whippet, had short hair and the tattoo of a scorpion on his eyebrow. The scorpion twitched when he was irritated, and now it was jumping. Being cooped up in the apartment for a week had left him restless, and he was longing for a break outside. Their instructions were clear though. Luca and he were to keep watch in the apartment, and if Carter entered, they were to grab him. Polks and Gabby Porterman covered the parking lot, and would either take Carter down there, or warn the apartment's occupants. Wasserman wanted Carter alive, however he wouldn't lose sleep if the man died in the takedown. The four of them were part of Wasserman's private army, all of them were former army personnel, and all of them had served as mercenaries before joining Wasserman's elite crew. They normally reported to Studdlander, who was their ramrod, but Studdlander was busy in Los Angeles. Wasserman had briefed them on Carter. He was ex-Special Forces and had served in Somalia, Iraq and various hotspots. The majority of his CV was bland, and Wasserman was not sure if that was because the CV was redacted or because the man hadn't seen much action. However, he had survived a couple of gang attacks in Los Angeles, so the men had to be on their guard. Barrow and Luca were sure they could take the man down easily enough. Gabby, so named because he spoke rarely, concurred. Polks had no opinion of his own. They were well armed. Glock and Uzi for Barrow, a Colt Combat and an AR-15 for Luca. Polks and Gabby had Smith & Wessons and Mossbergs. The shotguns, the Uzi, and the AR-15 stayed concealed as they couldn't brandish them in the parking lot. In addition, all of them had blades for close combat. Barrow even had a taser with him. The four of them were well-prepared hard men, and one ex-army guy wasn't going to trouble them. Barrow walked a well-trodden path on the carpet and glanced irritatedly at Luca as he lounged on the couch and scrolled idly through the TV channels. Anything from Gabby, he growled. Nope. Relax. They'll let us know if the dude turns up. You need to calm down, let the inner peace flow over you. I'll have peace coming out of my ears when Carter is in our hands. Well, burning a hole in the carpet isn't going to make him come quicker. He'll come when he comes, or not at all, Luca replied stoically and devoted his attention to stock car racing on the screen. They both jumped and whirled, their guns at the ready, at the scraping sound on the large darkened floor-to-ceiling windows. No one at the window. Cover the bedrooms, I'll call Gabby. Barrow ordered as he thumbed his phone. Luca disappeared inside, check the rooms. All clear, he yelled. He came out and watched Barrow put away his phone. It's all quiet downstairs. The sound came again and they froze. The two separated and crabbed sideways cautiously and approached the glass. Barrow signaled silently at Luca and covered him as his partner risked a quick glance outside, a longer glance down and then up. 
A frown appeared on his face. What the fuck? He went closer to the window and then relaxed. It's one of those window cleaners. You know the guys who sit on a crane and wash and wipe the glass? You sure it isn't him? Barrow asked him urgently. Yeah. Luca relaxed and his gun arm dropped. This guy's got more fat on him than a ton of butter. He's alone too. He craned his neck and called out after a moment. The crane operator's alone too. He squinted his eyes and read out the name of the cleaning company. Ask Gabby to check with the building supervisor. Barry pulled out his phone and wrapped out an order. He waited impatiently, gun in one hand, phone in another, his eyes constantly moving between the window and the front door. The phone squawked and he brought it to his ear. Are you sure? he asked when Gabby spoke into it and then held the phone back as a string of curses issued from it. Watch the crane operator in any case. Carter took out a bunch of hoods in LA, he ain't a pussy. Luca raised his eyebrows when he had hung up. Cleaner is a regular. He's working to a schedule which has been in place for years. They watched silently as the cleaner gave them a bright smile through the glass, and his face blurred as he sprayed liquid and scrubbed it away. He worked methodically, top to bottom, left to right, his movements practiced and efficient. Their gun arms drooped when the cleaner moved diagonally down the face of the apartment and then disappeared out of sight. Luca went to the edge of the window and followed him with his eyes till the man had finished for the day, and the crane rumbled away. Inner peace, he smiled crookedly when Barrow resumed his pacing. Two men, Manny said as he wiped his face and nodded in thanks at the bottle of water Zeb handed him. The idea had hit Zeb when he had driven through the town and had watched window cleaners at work on other sites. He had called Petrova's building supervisor and got Manny Turner's details. The twins had dug into Manny and had come back with a couple of nuggets. One was that Manny made regular donations to IAVA, Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. More digging had revealed that Manny had lost his son in Afghanistan several years back. Zeb approached him as the cleaner was readying his truck with his partner, a bald portly man who looked once at Zeb, grunted a greeting and went about his job. Zeb stood silently till Manny had finished and when the short smiling man turned toward him, he introduced himself. Zeb looked in the man's eyes and took a leap of faith. He laid everything out and watched as the cogs turned in Manny Turner's head. The cleaner ignored him for a while as he walked around his truck, kicked the tires, and checked the hydraulics and the safety equipment. Just report what I see. He asked finally, after he had wiped his hands on a rag. Yeah. Just that. No getting involved in all that shit. It's hard enough for a man making a living these days. We don't want any badasses on our tail for the rest of our lives. All I want to know is how many men are in the apartment. Elena was good to us wasn't she Bert, he said reflectively, glancing at his partner. Bert nodded silently. Manny grinned. Bert's like that. He thinks one word is too many. He thrust his hand out at Zeb. We'll do it. She was a real sweet lady. Those guys. I wouldn't want a piece of them. They stood watching me, I smiled at them and got stony looks in return. Guns? Zeb asked him. Yeah. Looked like they were holding something. Windows are dark and I was outside looking in so can't be sure. But it felt like they were carrying. Zeb peeled out several bills and handed it Manny, who stuffed them in his pocket without counting them. These will be handy. We missed our payment to the IAVA this month. He frowned. You know what? Yeah I do. Manny looked searchingly and bobbed his head. Guess you do. Parking lots got a rear entrance to the building. Bert spoke for the first time. Two guys were hanging about, one near the entrance, one watching cars come and go. Building has security guards. Nah. This is Cheyenne. Nothing happens here. Manny climbed in his truck, waved his hand, and their truck disappeared round a corner. Four men. 
the two men in the lot are the first cut off. Zeb stuffed a couple of spare magazines in his pocket, adjusted his Glock, and drove the SUV to a block away. Take the parking lot guys out first. He walked behind a family and slipped inside as they walked on past the lot's entrance. He took cover behind the first vehicle, a pickup truck, crouched and ran the layout in his mind. Square, contained by a six-foot brick wall. Spaces lined up against walls. Two more rows of spaces in the middle. Probably 70 cars. One watcher will probably be between the middle two rows. He'll be able to cover all the entrances from there. The watcher wasn't in the middle. He was between a couple of spaces backing against the rear wall, standing between a Ford pickup and a Mitsubishi. He heard Zeb slithering behind him and swung round. He was startled for a moment and then recognition flooded through him and a yell broke out. Zeb ducked around the pickup and ran. No guns. Civilians in the yard. He had taken in the man in a second. Big. Swarthy. Belly. Loose jacket. He ducked around a woman wheeling a baby carriage, his strides lengthened. Get away from her. He broke out in the open. Ahead was the first middle row, the sides of vehicles shining in the sunlight. Footsteps rang behind him, a louder yell broke out. An answering yell came from near the building's entrance. Zeb risked a quick glance back. Swarthy was ten feet away, his face and hair dripped in sweat. A Ford Explorer was fifteen feet away, standing tall and proud, roof bars gleaming in the sunlight. Zeb slowed. Let him catch up. Too much distance and he might use his gun. He strained to see the other watcher, but he couldn't. The parking lot wasn't the biggest in the city, but it was chock full. He heard Swarthy huffing behind him, his feet pounding. He'll want to grab me before I reach the explorer. He slowed even further. Five feet now between them. Three feet away from the vehicle. Swarthy's hand reached out. Just as Swarthy's outstretched fingers touched his back, Zeb powered down with his right foot, left foot planted firmly against the side of the vehicle, and he flew over the explorer. His left hand shot out, fingers curled and gripped the roof bar in a grip of steel. Time slowed, weight became weightless, muscles flowed like liquid. Legs stretched and abdomen flexed, and his body swiveled around the left wrist. The wrist and fingers worked without conscious thought, changed grips, created a pivot point, and the swivel became a turn. Rushing through the air. Knees jacked up. Now facing the explorer again. Swarthy against vehicle. Swarthy's face turned. His eyes widened as they took in the figure rocketing through the air. Zeb's knees slammed in the man's back, crushed him against the vehicle. A window cracked, the explorer rocked against the momentum of over 300 pounds of human flesh. Zeb landed on his feet, the gray fog dissipating, grabbed Swarthy's hair and smashed his head against the vehicle. He stood panting for a second, watched as the man collapsed and whirled at a sound behind him. The second man stood there about ten feet away, panting, and staring disbelievingly for a moment before his hand started heading to his jacket. He's seven or eight feet away. Don't let that gun come out. Zeb stooped, grabbed Swarthy by the back of his jacket, added a second hand to the man's waist and heaved him at the gunman. Swarthy shot forward, tottered on two legs and momentarily covered the gunman. Precious moments that Zeb used to leave the ground in a dive, again catch Swarthy by his waist and use him as a human cannonball to ram the second shooter. Swarthy's shoulder caught the shooter in the belly, trapped his gun arm, and the three men went down. For the second time Zeb smashed ahead, this time on concrete. He pushed himself upright, turned to see the mom with the baby staring at him. Some men never learn ma'am, he said, and watched her hurry away. He caught his breath and looked around. The parking lot was empty, there was no movement from within the building. Not more than a minute since the first guy spotted me. Story of my life. A few seconds of adrenaline and explosion, long hours of nothing. Out of his pocket came flex cuffs, he secured the men, taped their mouths and pocketed their guns, knives and phones. 
he dragged both men to the rear of the lot and dumped them under the shade of a van. He walked out briskly, not hurrying, returned with his vehicle, loaded the men and headed away from the block. He stopped in a Safeways parking lot, changed the plates on his SUV, turned his jacket inside out and donned a ball cap. His jacket had different colors on the inside and outside and could be worn both ways. Small changes in appearance made a big difference. People generally looked at the hole, not at specifics. He dug out the men's phones and extracted a toolkit from underneath the rear bench seats and cloned their phones. He inserted the duplicate SIM cards and spare handsets and deactivated the hood's phones. Now they couldn't be tracked via their GPS signals, but any incoming calls would be diverted to the duplicates Zeb had made. He headed out of the city, driving steadily, heading east. He heard the phones ring several times, ignored them, and when he was on County Road 215 he floored it. He headed to an abandoned farm he had used in a previous mission, drove off black top and bounced on a country road for 15 minutes before he halted. He stepped out and hauled the men out unceremoniously and dumped them on the ground. The second gunman swore unintelligibly behind his tape, swore he was unconscious and lay unmoving. Zeb stood silently letting the gunman who was awake take him in, take in his surroundings. They were in the middle of nowhere, the country road that Zeb had taken widened into a patch of land and stopped. No other roads or trails led from the patch, which was a rough oval, dirty brown with not even a blade of grass on it. Maybe at one point there had been a building on top of the patch, a farmhouse or a barn. Now there was nothing. Hard ground that merged into grassy land that ran for as far as the eye could see, and then became sky at the horizon. Zeb drew his Glock out and saw the gunman's eyes sharpen and look around. Yeah, this place is ideal for burying a couple of bodies, isn't it? The gunman's eyes grew mean and the noises behind the tape grew louder. Zeb removed his jacket and placed his gun on top of it. He reached down to an ankle sheath, withdrew his benchmade which glinted once in the light. It didn't shine for long, as in the next second it was buried deep in the gunman's right thigh. It was late night when he made his call and gave names. Luke Wasserman, Jason Studdlander, Fred Polks, Gabby Porterman, Mike Barrow and Diego Luca. Porterman and Polks are with me. He spelt the names to broker who typed rapidly and saved the names. They the ones who killed her? Broker's voice turned into electronic signals and bounced between towers as packets of data, which unpacked themselves when they reached Zeb's phone and turned back into a rumble in Zeb's ear. Not by these guys. Some other perps that these dudes don't know of. Studdlander is the guy who used Morrow's name, and he's their immediate boss. He reports to Wasserman, but I'm betting that dude isn't the paymaster. But they're sure Elena was killed by someone in their crew. Broker asked again. Yeah, but like I said, they don't know who. Studdlander and Wasserman have organized this crew neatly. There are about 20 men, all mercs, all who work in teams of twos or threes. No one team knows the other. They all hang out in Wyoming or Los Angeles, and whenever a job comes up, Studdlander picks a team, meets them in person, and issues instructions. Like terrorist cells. Exactly. By the way, these guys knew who I was and where I had served. They had access to the redacted version of my records. Broker grunted. That's not hard to get. Some of your details are on our firm's website. He thought aloud. Those names aren't common. Betcha they're fake. If they are based in Wyoming or LA, maybe Studdlander or Wasserman are in one of those two locations. Zeb agreed. It's worth running those names through Werner, even if they're covers. Also put the word out and see if anyone knows of mercenaries teaming up to form a private army. He, Broker and the rest of them, had extensive contacts in the military contractor and special forces world. Their network actively fed them intel on who was operating where and for which client. Broker replied. Will do. A grin laced his voice. I hope Wasserman sends a crew after us. Bear and Bawana were griping just yesterday that they were getting rusty. Zeb smiled in the darkness. His crew could hold off an army and had done just that on a few occasions. 
Wasserman could throw everything at them, and he would still fall short. You got any numbers off their phones? I'll send you the logs, but if they're this organized, chances are all those numbers belong to throwaway phones. I've been wondering about Petrova. If she was working on so important a story, wouldn't she make more than one copy? Yeah, Zeb admitted. That was going through my mind too. She would have at least a backup. It's the way we would work. But where? Zeb heard the tap of a putter against a ball, broker practicing on the putting strip, as he thought furiously. She could have a hard copy backup, as well as an electronic one. The electronic one could be saved in the cloud, the paper copy could be anywhere. Why don't you look into those cloud storage services? Zeb's voice sharpened when an idea floated in his mind. The files I got from Parrish or the downloads from the twins didn't mention any address for her folks. Maybe she sent stuff there and removed their details from all records. You heard that? Broker called out, and Zeb heard a chorus of yells from the twins. Broker had put him on speaker, the twins had been listening all along. Zeb interrupted their excited discussion. Broker, can you get a GPS map for wherever her phone has traveled? And also her car? We can look into those locations and see who or what she visited. Megan's voice was electric. I'll get onto that. The only problem might be how far back we can get records. Anything will help. Broker came back to the captives with another question. Why did Studlander use his own crew? He's used the 38th Street so far? Looks like that gang got cold feet. Besides, they don't have much of a presence outside of L.A. You plan to go after Cisco? Nope. Now we have two names to go after. I'll dig out everything on Wasserman and his sidekick and get back to you, Broker promised. Where are you heading next? Nowhere. I am expecting a call. Chapter 13 The call came an hour later. An hour in which Zeb prepared a cold meal and ate silently with the stars and a distant coyote's howl for company. The two hoods were unconscious, and whenever they came to, Zeb helped them back to oblivion. One of the cloned phones rang when he had stowed away his gear and was leaning against the side of his vehicle. He took the call and listened silently. He heard faint breathing at the other end. A warm laugh broke the silence finally, the same voice that had spoken to Zeb in Pinedale. Mr. Carter, I presume. Zeb didn't reply, and the voice continued after a pause. You are proving to be much more of a nuisance than I anticipated, Mr. Carter. I thought you would be out of my hair after we spoke that night, but you keep turning up like a bad penny. Why are you doing this, Mr. Carter? You have a business in New York. Shouldn't you be running that, instead of digging into this woman's death? Who is she to you? Zeb turned the phone on speaker and checked on the two men. Polks was unmoving, though he was breathing deeply. Porterman had roused when the phone rang and was glaring at him with bright eyes. He twisted frantically on the ground and grunted loudly to signal his presence. His thigh was dark with blood and his combat trousers were soaked. Zeb kicked him in his belly and he gasped and lay still. The voice on the phone rose. Are those my men? Are they alive, Mr. Carter? Zeb ignored him and checked the bindings on the men. They were secure. All levity left the voice when he spoke again. You think you are getting somewhere, Mr. Carter? Let me tell you this, you've no idea who you're dealing with. You do not know what I am capable of. You cannot imagine the resources we have. You will lose. If you don't stop, we will hunt you and kill you like a dog. But maybe it's not you we need to go after. You've got colleagues in New York. The twin sisters and some other people. For such a resourceful man, you were very easy to track down. Yeah. Good luck with going after Broker, Bawana, and the others. Zeb dragged Polks over to Porterman and laid the two men side by side. He drew his glock and watched the whites of Porterman's eyes flash, his thrashing increase. 
two shots rang out, loud in the stillness of the night. Zeb glanced at his phone and finally answered the voice. You talk too much. An hour later, he was driving back to Cheyenne, back to Petrova's apartment block. He circled the block a couple of times, spotted nothing alarming, and nudged into the parking lot. Mom with the baby chair could have called the cops, but I am guessing she didn't. Folks tend to mind their own business these days. It was full, every space occupied. He stopped behind a Chevy Blazer, put on his Kevlar vest, grabbed his backpack and keyed in a code at the rear entrance. Porterman had been most helpful with the various access codes in the building. He took the stairs and when he reached the last flight of stairs before the fifth floor, he stopped. He extracted a slender cable and pushed one end of it, snake-like, onto the landing. The telescopic lens at the end of the cable threw a magnified image of the landing on his sat phone. He adjusted the controls on the screen and the size reduced, its resolution increased. The landing was empty. He curled the cable and went past Petrova's door, bending as he crossed it to remain out of sight of the peephole. He hugged a wall and fell prone and ran the cable through the thin crack under the door. He got a view of a hallway and then the living room, the television, and a couch. The living room seemed to be empty, the TV was turned off. He twisted the cable through various angles, but didn't see anything else. He extracted a compact thermal imager. It showed no heat. The apartment was empty. What I expected. Barrow and Luca must have checked out the moment they realized their two men were missing. He entered the apartment, block at the ready, and once he had checked out all the rooms, he began searching. He booted her computer and was unsurprised to find all its files had been erased. He removed its hard drive and slipped a dummy one in its place. The hard drive would go to broker to work his magic on. Petrova's work desk had a shelf with several files in them. Bills, bank statements, mortgage statements, letters from publishers, nothing pointed to any piece she was writing. The bedroom had photographs of her at various events, a couple of them were with presidents at the White House. A drawer by the bedside had an album containing more photographs from her work life. She was single, never married. There's nothing here about her folks. Two hours later, he gave up after searching for secret hideaways and finding none. The apartment was sterile. I'll bet that hard drive will have nothing on it too. He exited as quietly as he had come, dragged the two men out of his SUV and dumped them on concrete. Both men were awake and both wriggled and lashed out with their bound feet. They calmed down when the benchmate appeared in his hand again. He inserted the sims in their handsets and dropped the phones on their chests. If Wasserman is smart, he'll track the GPS signals and recover his men. He went back to the patch in the middle of nowhere and caught up on his sleep. The beeping on his computer woke Wasserman at around 2 a.m. He blinked for a second and moved from sleep to alert in a matter of seconds. He rose to his feet and when he saw the GPS signals at Petrova's block, he called Barrow. Barrow's voice was hoarse when he picked up the phone. Yeah? You said you checked the parking lot Polks and Gabby weren't there. Yeah, that's right. A scratch sound came over the phone as if Barrow was rubbing his stubble. That's when you asked us to haul our asses away from there. Their phones are back online. They are in the lot. Barrow fell silent as he put it together. Carter must have brought the bodies back. You want us to check them out? Do that. I don't want their bodies to end up with the cops. All our gigs are zero footprint ones. He went to the kitchen filled a glass of water and drank it. A thought struck him as the cool liquid made its way through him. It's possible he didn't kill them. He shot them while on the phone with me, but shots don't mean anything. Be careful. It could be a trap. Roger. Barrow hung up. Wasserman rubbed his eyes and swore softly as a thought entered his mind. He's yanking your chain. The assassin was working to a schedule. He would kill the oil minister next week, and then Wasserman would issue him his next target. His principal had all of them identified, 
and wanted all of them killed before a certain date. Carter couldn't be allowed to interfere. He won't. Wasserman wiped the thought in sudden fury. He will never know what the journalist was working on. He got lucky so far. On the other hand, I am prepared and have been working on this for a long time. Preparation always wins over luck. The assassin was in the same hotel that the oil minister would be staying in. He had checked in as an oil industry delegate from Brunei, in town to attend the same conference that the minister would address. As always, his cover was immaculate and would stand up to the deepest scrutiny. His cutout had arranged for his cover to be backed up if anyone called the oil ministry in Brunei. The assassin had checked that out by placing several calls himself, disguising his voice each time. In a couple of instances, he had demanded further proof and a minister's letter. All of those had appeared in his email, backed up by hard copies. He was impressed. The people behind the killings had juice. He asked his cutout to provide him with a layout of the hotel and the minister's schedule. They were emailed to him the next day. The minister was whimsical, and his schedule often changed at the spur of the moment. He was a known womanizer and patronized a discreet escort service. That makes it easier. That and the hotel. The assassin liked hotels. They provided anonymity, had several exits, and also threw up several opportunities for his targets to be alone. He studied the conference schedule. It was a three-day conference in the ballroom of the hotel. The minister had booked a suite on the 30th floor, the assassin was on the 18th. The minister traveled with two bodyguards, whose bios were in the package provided to him. Ex-army, competent, but I'll bet all the high living has dulled them. He made his plans. Zeb woke at 4 a.m. in the vastness of Wyoming and with a curious raven for company, performed his routine of yoga, tai chi and martial arts. Slow fast, slow fast till the blood sang in his body and the beast roared in exultation. The raven cocked its head and watched on curiously and pecked at the crumbs Zeb threw when he opened tin cans and ate what passed for his breakfast. He packed through his gear and when he turned on his laptop, his lips twitched. The GPS sensors he had concealed on Polk's and Porterman were on the move. The sensors were as small as a coat button, were effective in a hundred-mile radius, and showed the men traveling on the I-25 North. They were traveling at a steady speed at 45 miles an hour and had just hit the highway. A recovery team to pick the men up. Could be the two men in the apartment. North was Casper, about 180 miles from Cheyenne. Just before sleep claimed him the previous night, he had firmed up his strategy. Till the time Petrova's trail threw up anything substantial, he would hit Wasserman. Hard. Wherever he found his crew. Zeb drove through the countryside, through small towns that had yet to wake up, through Meriden and Hawk Springs and Lingle, and then Fort Laramie. He stopped when the GPS signal stopped, filled his tank, and joined the I-25 at the US-26 junction, south of Glendo. He floored it once he hit smooth concrete, overtaking the light traffic, and when the signal showed he was a mile behind the men, he slowed down and followed at a light pace. Casper was the second largest city in Wyoming, and started its life as a frontier outpost for settlers on their way to Oregon and California. It sat at the foot of Casper Mountain and was experiencing a boom in growth driven by oil and minerals mining. Zeb followed the vehicle through the town, over the North Platte River, past several government offices, and reduced the distance when it left the highway. Through small streets, past office blocks, and then a residential area. He could now see the vehicle far ahead, an SUV too far away to determine its make. They drove past a school and entered a tree-lined street which was dotted by several single-family homes. Trailers, trucks, RVs, broken fences lined the street. Urban detritus that hundreds of years later would look like the droppings of humankind. The flasher on the recovery vehicle went up and it bounced over pavement, past a sad-looking truck under a tree, and came to a halt on a dusty driveway. Doors burst open at the front, and the driver and a passenger exited. They opened the rear doors, reached inside to help Polks and Porterman. Showtime. 
Zeb accelerated and sped down the street, saw one man look up at his approaching SUV as it swerved suddenly, climbed pavement and rammed into the rear of the vehicle, and backed out rapidly and halted. Zeb was out, running, even before the vehicles had settled, steam rising from the front of his. The doors of the other vehicle were swinging wildly, its rear crumpled like a tin can. His gun was in his hand, eyes seeking out the men. The first two had fallen at the impact, one door had hit the front passenger, and he looked dazed. The injured were half in, half out. One man shouted a thin scream, it's him. Driver, where is he? There, beneath the door. Moving fast. Hand reaching out. A gun flashed, Zeb squeezed. Trigger break. Red blossomed on the driver's shoulder, he fell back. Another squeeze, the gunman's right hand burst. He shouted and fell back. Polk sprawled out, raised his hands, shouted hoarsely. He was out of the fight. The beast unleashed itself and pounced. Leg on rail. Spring up and over, and then Zeb was flying over the vehicle. His eyes scanned, his gun followed. His eyes saw, his gun aimed. He turned in the air, landed lightly, feet firm, center of gravity low, in front of the vehicle, now facing the passenger and Porterman. The passenger, Luca from Porterman's description, rolled fast and smooth, a colt appeared, but he was too close to Zeb to get it in position in time, and the gun flew away harmlessly when Zeb kicked his wrist. Zeb slashed down with the glock, caught him on the bridge of his nose. Cartilage broke, blood spurted, his smooth move slowed, dulled and stopped. Porterman fell out, Zeb's glock trained on him. I'm out. I'm out. Don't shoot. He shouted. Zeb stepped back rapidly, kept them in view, cast a quick glance around the other side. Shotman Barrow lay still and unmoving. Polks lay on the ground, his cheek hugging earth, his eyes staring blankly at Zeb. Luca lay bleeding, groaning softly, his head shaking dazedly. Zeb kicked their guns away, secured them with plastic ties, went inside the house and checked it out swiftly. Empty. It's probably one of the shooter's cribs. He came back stood in the doorway and scanned the street swiftly. No heads poked out from any house, no vehicles rushed on the road. It's office time. School time. Probably not many people at home. Daytime TV must be keeping those at home occupied. He dragged the men inside, ignoring their curses and swearing, and dumped them in the cluttered living room. The other end of the living room narrowed into a hallway, while directly opposite to where Zeb stood, was a kitchen that stank of stale food and spoilt milk. There was a dirty jug of water on a center table, he grabbed it and poured it over Luca. The wounded man jerked, opened his eyes wide, saw the knife in Zeb's hand and raised a hand in defense. I don't know anything, he shouted. But I do, a voice called from behind. Move. Zeb dived into the kitchen, just as gunshots roared and echoed in the small house. Shots peppered the hardwood floor where he had been, some smacked into the wall behind, and at least a couple struck the men. He glimpsed the shooter through the corner of his eyes. Tall man with a ponytail. He scanned the kitchen swiftly. Nothing to hide behind. Ceiling had two hooks, maybe for fans that the occupant never got around to fixing. He leapt, caught hold of the hooks and pulled himself up. He curled his body and brought it as close to the ceiling as possible. If the hooks give, I am gone. They didn't, they held firm. He thanked whoever had built the house in the first place, long before cheap materials and plasterboard had made an entry. You can't run, you can't hide and you will die. Ponytail sang and started shooting, a continuous roll of thunder, a diagonal stitch appearing in the plasterboard, and then another to complete an X, gun smoke and wood chips and cardboard dust filled the air. Glock 26. He counted the rounds, waited till the shooting stopped, heard the faint slither of movement. He dropped, and in two strides was in the adjoining dining room. It opened in the same hallway where the shooter stood. Are you dead, Carter? Ponytail called out, and the first hole appeared chest high, in the wall that separated the dining room and the kitchen. Zeb ducked very low, read its angle. 
he sideways to take in the kitchen as well as the dining room entrance. Another hole appeared, another bullet flew in the air a foot above his body. No time to think. No time to figure out escape. If I shoot back he'll know where I am. Only in Hollywood can shooters fire through walls and both survive. One glance around the room. Circular table. Four chairs. One stool. A third hole appeared, signaling the start of another X pattern, and before the fourth appeared, Zeb was moving, one hand reaching out, body readying for explosive movement, feet moving for momentum. His hand completed its swing, and the chair sailed around the door in the hallway, at ponytail. He heard it crash once against the wall, ram into something, in the sounds of something heavy falling. The gun fell silent. No time to wait. Another chair followed, this time his swing was better, and the chair flew down the hallway and crashed into something or someone. A third followed and from the sounds of it, broke apart when it landed. Zeb crouched, ducked his head swiftly around the door and took in the scene. Ponytail on the ground. Eyes wide. Chairs on top of him. Struggling to get up. Zeb stepped in the corridor and black eyes spotted him, narrowed, slid to the Glock shining just out of reach of the gunman. Behind the shooter lay the entrance door, to his right lay the kitchen, to the left was the living room. The shooter dived for the gun and pulled back abruptly when Zeb let fly the stool from behind him. Ponytail jerked back savagely and rolled into the living room, got to his feet smoothly and ran. Zeb lunged over the furniture, one hand reaching inside his holster for his gun. He landed on a chair's leg, slipped, crashed into the door and lost his gun. He straightened and poised to dive at Ponytail who suddenly halted in mid-stride, whirled as if his waist was on ball bearings, and his right hand flashed to produce a snub-nosed revolver. Whoa! It barked harmlessly when Zeb ducked under it and slapped it away with the edge of his hand, as hard as concrete. Before it could clatter, steel flashed and shaped into a foot-long blade that Ponytail produced. He sliced the air made Zeb reverse, duck and weave. Ponytail followed through with wicked cuts and slashes, driving Zeb back to the hallway. No room to move back. I'll be on top of the furniture and then he'll have me. He saw the attacker's eyes gleam and signal another attack, waited for the knife arm to unfold, for the knife to hiss through the air in its deadly quest and at the very last minute, he leaned back, his upper body almost parallel to the floor. The Gerber blade swished silently above him, and just for the smallest fraction of a second, Ponytail was off balance. Zeb turned the backward swing into a sideways move, and slipped under the retreating knife arm and moved deeper into the living room. More room. That space rapidly disappeared when Ponytail produced a flurry of stabs and thrusts, pushing Zeb into a desperate rearguard move. The knife sought him. I raped her. Duck. Duck again, evade the slash. There were three of us. Lean out of thrust. We took turns. Move back away from the cut. Zeb's heels came against a body. He stumbled started falling, his hands flailed out. Ponytail grinned and leaned forward for the killing blow. I would have loved a second go at her. The beast, which was watching, waiting, uncoiled itself in suddenness as if woken by an electric current that passed from the ground and into Zeb's body and sped through his blood. The beast filled his upper body, flew down his flailing arms and its jaws snapped. Zeb's wrist snapped around the knife arm in a blur and hauled the killer toward him. The knife blade came straight at his eyes and at the very last moment Zeb deadened his upper body, letting it fall like a heavy weight on the man below. His wrists continue their hold, tendons flexed, feet and shoulders turned and Ponytail got dragged after him, crashing onto on the hardwood floor behind him. Turn twist left hand down left leg up and power off. He pounced on the killer, his right fist curled, knuckles showing and landed on a nerve point in Ponytail's exposed shoulder. The killer's knife arm came up, the blade flashed and then it clattered to the ground when Zeb punched him in the throat. You shouldn't have said that. Zeb reached out and the blade flowed in his hand, he turned it over in a smooth move, gripped its hilt, and in the next second, buried it deep in the killer's left shoulder. 
The blade sank through flesh and muscle, scraping past bone and almost penetrated through. His brown eyes were on fire as they stared down at Ponytail's face which was beaded with sweat, his eyes wide in agony, his mouth open in a soundless scream. You shouldn't have raped her in the first place. Chapter 14 Zeb checked the house, found no more hostels. The other men were still. They all seemed to be breathing, but a couple of them had caught stray bullets from the killer's first burst. One stopped around with his thigh, another had a hole in his right shoulder. Zeb peered out through the windows at the front, the neighborhood was still quiet. That calm may not last long. That amount of gunfire will attract attention. He walked swiftly without haste, tried the SUV, its engine turned in a comforting growl. Its front was dented, but it would run. He reversed the vehicle, and backed it up against the door. He left its rear door open and hauled his attacker inside, and drove away. His police scanner gave him nothing, just lazy chatter from a police department that didn't see much crime. He went through smaller streets, residential ones that would have less traffic, circled and hit the I-25 again, and followed it out of the city. He positioned his ride between a panel truck and a pickup, and punched locations in the sat-nav. He was looking for something remote, an abandoned industrial park, even wide open land, anything that would give him privacy. He left the highway 10 miles away from the city, followed Blacktop for another 10 miles, and when he spotted a faint trail, two dirt tracks, he swung off and followed them. His navigator told him there was nothing there. It showed an expanse of water a couple of miles away. It showed green spaces. That would do. The green space turned out to be an expanse of knee-high growth that led to a lake. He stopped under the shade of a tree, let the engine die down, and heard it click and clack as it started cooling. Ponytail groaned from the inside, and with that his eyes grew bleak. He washed up in the lake 90 minutes later and made his call. Beth took it, put it on speaker. Zeb spoke briefly, quickly. I need recovery and wheels. Inexperienced operatives would have questioned him, would have asked him innumerable questions. Not Zeb's crew. Pride and warmth swelled through him at Beth's crisp reply. Hold. Over the years they had stashed guns, cash, covers, passports and papers all over the country. They now had 30 such caches in large cities and in each city. They had bought ownership in the right kind of garages where they kept a customized SUV on standby at all times. The garage managers had drivers who would drop the vehicles off at pickup points, collect the old ones that would then be serviced and kept ready. The garage managers and drivers were all ex-military and were all thoroughly vetted by the twins. They had similar caches in international cities, London, Paris, Istanbul, Madrid, Mumbai, cities which terrorists had targeted. Zeb was working on the assumption that his SUV was hot. The gangbangers in Los Angeles knew how it looked, and so did Wasserman's crew. Once the cops discovered the wounded in the crib, they too would join the hunt. Changing plates was no longer sufficient. He had to change his ride. Jackson is where we have the nearest outfitter. Meg's already on the phone, she'll get wheels rolling in half an hour. Am I hot? Nope. Broker drawled over the phone. No cops are on the lookout for you. Not yet. Wasserman probably doesn't want attention on himself and his crew. He certainly wouldn't report the shooting. Why hasn't anyone else? Break it down for us, Zeb. Zeb told them about Ponytail and two others threatening and raping the journalist several years back. She was chasing a story on someone powerful. Felix Domingo, Ponytail, doesn't know what the story was or who it was on. All that Wasserman told them was to scare the living daylights out of the woman, and when news of her persisting reached them, ordered the kill. They cleared her laptop, phone and all her files and made her apartment sterile once she had been killed. Surely they must have made her talk before killing her. She must have spilled who the story was on. Zeb controlled the leap of rage as he recollected Domingo's words and remembered the cuts on the journalist's body. They did, she babbled nonsense, dug up old stories and when they cut her more she died. They didn't get anything useful out of her. They must have read her files. Surely these bozos know who the subject was. 
Broker was incredulous, in the background Zeb could hear the twins agreeing with him. Nope. They never got to read the story on her laptop. There were no other backups, no notes in her apartment, nothing that lead to the story. She never got around to telling them anything worthwhile. I think she knew she would be interrogated, and trained herself to repeat a fanciful story. His crew fell silent for a moment, and then Broker came back. You were persuasive. You believe him? Yeah and yeah. Zeb had no qualms about aggressively interrogating a killer like Domingo. He deserved what he got, and Zeb would lose more sleep over squashing an insect. He can describe Wasserman. Never met him. Usual procedure. Stuttlander met them, gave them instructions. Wasserman was just a voice on the phone. These four hung out in Casper. He gave them Domingo's service history, the details of the two others who had raped and killed Petrova. They go by Boxer and Pockmark. All three were discharged from the Marines for criminal offenses. Stuttlander hunted them and made them part of his crew. Did this guy kill Elena? Megan asked in a flat voice. He said it was Boxer. But he was there. He said of the three, Pockmark is the most dangerous. We'll dig everything we can on him, Broker promised. We know more now but not by much. We still don't know what Elena was working on and who and where Wasserman and the Shadow Man are. We know something else, Zeb corrected him. Domingo said something would go down next week, he said something would happen in Texas that would change the face of the world. Stuttlander let this slip when he met these guys, but clammed up immediately. Domingo, Boxer and Pockmark aren't involved in whatever is going to happen. We'll check out all events in Texas and get back to you. Broker was brief, terse and efficient. They now had a timeline to work toward. By the way, I checked out that neighborhood. There's a garage just behind that house, and there are several reports of vehicles misfiring from it. I guess whoever heard the shots must have thought it's yet another faulty exhaust. There were quite a few shots, Zeb replied doubtfully. You think Wasserman erased any police report? That'll take some doing, Roker countered. Yeah, but so far he's shown that he's very capable. Besides, all it needs is a couple of corrupt police chiefs. That's not exactly uncommon. We'll dig into the Cheyenne and Casper PDs. Megan promised. Zeb halted them as they were hanging up. He gave me Stuttlander's description. You can run those past all our databases as well as veteran files. Zeb recited the man's details to Broker, recollected something else. Broker, can you run a voice print against databases? Yeah, Werner can do it in its sleep. Whose voice have you recorded? Wasserman's when he called me. Zeb bundled Domingo back in his SUV, grinned when he remembered Broker's snort of indignation when he said the killer was still alive. His crew were firm believers in permanent solutions. Zeb met Domingo's glaring eyes, the man would live, but would never wield a gun or a knife or any other weapon again. He cuffed the man for good measure and drove back to the city. Cautiously, keeping an eye out for cruisers and listening intently on the scanner. He parked a block away from the crib, covered Domingo with a tarp, punched holes in it for the man to breathe, and proceeded on foot to the Hood's home. He entered the street, saw a few more vehicles in driveways, but no curious neighbor's eyes were on him. The house was still, the men were lying where he had left them. They were breathing, two of them were unconscious, while two others had slipped into a natural sleep. Zeb checked the men who were shot, none of their wounds were fatal. They had probably called out for help, but if the neighbors hadn't heard the shots they wouldn't hear shouts. Zeb went through the house again, this time searching more thoroughly. He scanned an untidy bedroom, rifled through drawers in a wardrobe, discovered a shotgun and three handguns under the bed. He grabbed them, their serial numbers might lead somewhere. In the bathroom, he found a packet of white powder behind the toilet. He left it untouched. Let them explain that to the cops. He changed plates yet again on his SUV, backed it up and unloaded Domingo. The killer lashed out with his legs and fell back groaning behind duct tape when Zeb squeezed a pressure point. 
It was evening by the time Zeb drove to the local Walmart, searched for a parking spot, and settled down for a nap. His replacement ride was an hour away. His ride turned up 45 minutes later, parked next to him. The driver stepped out, a squat bald man who walked easily, looked him straight in the eyes. He tossed the keys at Zeb, stood silently while Zeb inspected the vehicle, looked through the various compartments and hideaways inside, and nodded in return when Zeb nodded at him. Zeb liked that. He had a lot of respect for a man who didn't waste time, who didn't waste breath making idle talk. They spoke just once, when Zeb told him his SUV could be hot. I'm outta here, friend. It's a three-hour drive back for me. Zeb settled in the new ride with satisfaction. It was identical in specs to the one he had, except that this one was a Ford Explorer and was white. Anonymous and with enough spare plates. He planned to find a motel to stay the night in and probably stay the next day as well, till his team came up with intel. He went through Domingo's confession, ran it over and over in his mind as he drove through the city, checking out motels on autopilot. Change the face of the world. Stuttlander had paled when he said that. He had left abruptly. Change the face. He wheeled abruptly, stopped illegally near the curb, ignored the blare of annoyed horns. He punched in numbers, controlled his impatience while the call got routed through security protocols in the vehicle, and at the receiving end. The call got picked up after two rings. Is the president in Texas next week? Claire didn't question him. She heard the tautness in his voice and just replied, hold. He heard her dial another phone and ask someone. Jim, don't ask me questions. Is the president anywhere near Texas next week? Her voice lightened at the reply, they exchanged small talk and she hung up. She came back on Zeb's line. He isn't, neither is the Veep or any other member of the cabinet. Tell me everything. She listened without interruption and when he had finished she asked, Your crew is working on possibilities? Yes. She mulled it over. Nothing's crossed my radar or that of any other agency. What about Broker's Network? The usual stuff has come up. Islamic terrorists, Russian posturing, Chinese submarine movements, North Korean military gestures. All those have been around for some time. Yes ma'am. Get on to this. She ordered. She didn't have to ask him to report back. He would. Broker's reports would go to her too. I might become hot. There's a trail of injured and maybe a couple of dead by now. Shots fired in a residential area. I'm surprised Cheyenne and Casper PD haven't yet got me. They won't. She replied unequivocally. She didn't ask him if innocents were involved, she knew how Zeb worked. Juice. The agency has delivered on every mission. That's one huge goodwill bank and IOUs that Claire has amassed. He checked into a motel, chose a room that overlooked the rear, had a window through which he could exit, and then called his team. We're a go, his voice came muffled as he washed and wiped himself with a surprisingly clean towel. Werner's already pumping out stuff. A list of all events and big ticket attendees in Texas is in your email, Beth replied briskly. Anything tickled Werner? The software had highly sophisticated algorithms that tracked disparate events and came up with what-if scenarios. When Broker's human intel from his agents across the globe was layered on top, Werner's analyses became a potent tool. Nope, she confessed. Have a look at the list and see where it gets you. There's more. She was struggling to contain her excitement. We nailed down where Alina's folks lived. They were in Lander, where they owned a general store and home. They passed away three years back. Her mom had a previous marriage and when she remarried, Elena took on her mother's maiden name. She had a falling out with her dad. Megan made an impatient sound. That's not always the reason, Zeb. We made a few calls and got the story. When she got her first big story all those years back, she got several threats. She changed her name to protect her folks. 
Tell him, Broker's voice came impatiently over the speaker. She visited Lander. Beth broke over Megan. Several times last year, her sister butted in and explained briefly. The general store had wound down once Petrova's dad had passed away. Once her mother was no more, Elena inherited both the properties. She lived briefly in the family home once she left New York, but she was seldom there. She traveled a lot and didn't have any close friends in the town. She sold the house last year and bought a two-bedroom apartment in Cheyenne and moved there. She kept the general store, but since it wasn't operating, she never visited Lander. The Wana Raj, why don't you check the place out? We'll take the jet and leave tonight. Be careful. Wasserman's crew might be there. Gowana's voice was expectant. I hope so. All this inactivity is bad for my health. Don't take them lightly, Bawana. This guy Domingo was good, Zeb warned him. He didn't have to assign tasks to Bear, Chloe or Broker. The three had the twins' backs. Megan quickly ran through other findings. There weren't many more. They still hadn't discovered any online storage service Petrova had used. They had called all newspapers and online media that Petrova had worked with. None of them knew what the journalist had been working on. Werner had not yet placed Wasserman's voice print. He'll know what's going down. If we find him. The Lear touched down on a private airstrip 15 miles away from Lander, and when Bawana and Roger stepped out in the warm night, a man was awaiting them. It was the same driver who had delivered the wheels to Zeb. They inspected the vehicle he had brought. He disappeared into the plane. He would await their return and drive the SUV back to Jackson. Remember we can't kill anyone, Roger warned his partner when Bawana turned over the engine and set off. Just one hood. It'll be like a message you know, to this Wasserman dude. Bawana pleaded. Roger sighed, pulled his hat over his face, pushed his seat far back and ignored his friend. Under the cover of the hat, he grinned. His friend played the bloodthirsty role well, but underneath the facade was a coldly efficient operative. The two had worked together for so long that they read one another's thoughts, acted on each other's eye and hand signals automatically. Fifteen miles took half an hour to traverse, Bawana falling in the slipstream of one large truck that sped in the night as it moved stuff from one part of the country to another. The US-287 didn't have much traffic that time of the night, and Bawana was content to roll as slowly as the truck. The city of Lander welcomed them with flashing billboards above an auto parts store, and further down, a motel advertising vacancies. The town was quiet, it would be, it had a population of less than 10,000. As with many small towns in that part of the country, it had an Old West feel to it. Feed stores, Indian artifacts, jewelry stores, wine shops lined Main Street, along with bars and ATMs. The Family General Store stood dark on the intersection of Main and a narrower street. Bawana swung away from Main, drove past residential homes and eased on the narrow street. He let the SUV drift behind a parked RV. They got out silently and split up. Roger crossed the road and walked down the street, parallel to Bawana. They drifted from shadow to shadow till they reached the rear of the general store and watched. The store was a two-story building that had a gated entrance on the narrow street for deliveries. The gated entrance opened into a small yard, at one end of which was a smaller building. Storage, Bawana surmised. The upper story was the residence and shared a common entrance with the store. The two waited, becoming one with the dark, letting the hours and the night flow over them. A pickup truck lurched to a stop at 2 a.m., a man fell out of its cab and walked unsteadily to a lamppost. He hawked and spat once, and a thin stream of liquid caught the light. He stumbled back when he had finished his business, and when his truck roared back to life, Roger spoke in his bone phone. Two men in a tan Ford opposite the store. They're slumped down but are awake. Both in the front. The nearly invisible headsets used bone conduction technology and sat just in front of the ear, bypassing the eardrums. They delivered sound to the cheekbones and left the ears free to pick up ambient noise. Gotcha. I've got at least two more bodies inside, in the residence. One of the dudes is smoking. 
He came out briefly, inspected the yard and went back in. Carrying. Too dark. We have to assume so. They looped back and crossed Main Street and came up to the general store from its front and surveyed it. Fronts quiet. I flashed the thermal imager, and two bodies are in the back of the upper story. Looks like the two bozos in the car have got the front, the two inside have got the rear. Bawana murmured. The two men in the Ford had been casing the store for more than a week, and were feeling bored. Stutelander had warned them about Carter, and by now they also knew of Domingo, Barrow, and the rest. However, Carter hadn't shown up in Lander. The town remained in a permanent state of semi-somnolence, even in the daytime. The townspeople had looked on curiously when the four hoods had turned up, but they had a good cover. They were sent by the executors of Petrova's estate to value the property and survey it. The men wandered during the day, apparently taking measurements and photographs. Bosworth, Bo Colley, the driver, strutted about carrying a pad and appeared to look important as he spoke several times in a phone during the day. Frank Kelso, his partner, went to realtors and got valuations from them for the property. They even arranged a viewing for all realtors one day. The men were top operatives and had fought in the Congo, Nigeria, and South America. A potent town in the middle of nowhere didn't challenge their skills, and despite all their training, they had gotten slack. Bo stifled a yawn and turned to rummage through a brown bag of chips when a tap on the window drew their attention. A man stood weaving and swaying, talking unintelligibly. Bo checked the mirrors and saw nothing alarming. He wound the window down and opened his mouth to swear at the man. The next moment a gun barrel rammed into his teeth, broke the front two ones. Simultaneously Frank's door opened and a black man the size of a barn door bent down and pleaded, Please, please go for your guns. They didn't take him up. They recognized the calmness in the men and decided whoever said discretion was the better part of valor, had it right. The two men bound Bo and Frank, trussed them like chickens, taped their mouths and left them helpless. The lean man who had knocked Bo's teeth came back a second later. His teeth flashed when he drawled, You'll thank me one day. You look better now without those ugly protrusions. He laughed when Bo swore impotently behind the tape. Bawana and Roger ran on the balls of their feet, keeping to the shadows, and went to the rear of store, the heavy backpack resting easily on the Bawana's back. Bawana fired up the thermal imager, and they watched the movements of the two men inside for a while. The men had a loose patrol of walking the breadth of the house every twenty minutes. One man was stationary, horizontal, it looked like he was resting. The patrolling man came to a small balcony that overlooked the yard every third round. He stood there for ten minutes, puffed away, and then disappeared inside. Bawana looked at his friend who read his thoughts and smiled. Lazy surveillance. There were six windows that overlooked the yard, three at the bottom, three more on the top. The surveillance was at the top, the men figuring that the two men on the street would keep a watch on the ground. Bawana and Roger scaled the gate, pulled black masks over their face, and ran to the rear of the store. Bawana knelt against a window and examined it. It was a common garden variety, secured from the inside with a dead bolt. They would have to break the glass to make an entry. Roger checked out the door, it too was of a sturdy make with dead bolts inside. He turned to Bawana to find him rummaging inside his backpack. He drifted to the shadows in the yard to keep a watch on the upper story while his friend secured an entry. Bawana pulled out a rubber suction cup and attached it to the glass. He used a diamond-tipped cutter to make a neat hole, removed the glass, wrapped it in pop-free bubble packaging and placed it in his pack. They split, Bawana taking the left, Roger going right, when Bawana opened the door and shut it behind them. The ground floor of the store had a large curved counter for serving customers and had rows of shelves nailed to the wall. A door to the right led to a storage room which had shelves, racks and bins. All were empty. A hallway to the left had a discreet door behind which lay a bathroom, and further along were a flight of stairs to the residence above. Bawana warned Roger with a look stairs might creak, and got an acknowledging bob. He placed his weight carefully using the sides of the steps to climb, while Roger covered him from behind. 
Gowana waited at the landing, counting down in his head, and ten minutes later heard the first tread. The patrolling man yawned lustily and cast an angry glance at the snoring man on the couch. They alternated the night watch, but that didn't mean he had to like it. Why are we still here, in this shithole of a town? He thought furiously. Stuttelander said this would be over in days. We're still here after a week, watching old people walk their dogs. He kicked the couch on his round, and his partner stopped snoring for a few seconds. He had resumed by the time the man reached the end of the hallway, and he turned back in mounting irritation. The man would drown a freight train. He couldn't complete the thought when something dark and massive loomed beside him suddenly, white teeth flashed in the dark, and the next moment he was falling. Bawana tied the man and covered Roger, who checked the rest of the house, and returned to stand over the sleeping man. A loud snore was cut short when Roger shook his shoulder. His eyes shot wide when the round bore of a kimber looked back at him. When the two were trussed up, Bawana shook his head sadly at Roger. Badasses aren't what they used to be. I reckon we should plug them just for being so incompetent. Zeb had found a motel in Casper, one that took cash, whose manager didn't look up from the ball game playing on a small TV. The manager grunted in rhythm to Zeb's questions, turned a register over to Zeb, and handed a key across without once looking up. No whores, no shooting, no dogs, were his only words. Zeb showered, had a cold takeout dinner, washed it down with black strong tea, and went through the list of events. Half an hour later he gave up in frustration and paced the small room. Rodeos, county fairs, corporate board meetings, ball games, industry association meetings, a senator's speech, there was nothing in that list that would radically alter geopolitics. Was Domingo bluffing? Was he saying what I wanted to hear? Zeb idly fingered a Bible in the chest of drawers and rejected the thought. He had interrogated several captives over the years and could separate truth from lies. He considered the senator. Left wing. Pain in the butt to his own party, let alone the opposition. Has got a fringe support that elects him every term. Broker would say we should step back and let whoever wants to take him out, do his job. The assassin would do the nation a favor. He shook his head unconsciously. The senator wasn't the target, though he was sure Broker and the twins would thoroughly examine him. No world leaders meeting in Texas, nothing noteworthy happening in fact. He gave up after another hour, tossed away his phone, and went to sleep. His phone buzzed late at night rousing him instantly. It was from Roger. They had secured Petrova's home, but the men there knew nothing. Their orders were to grab Zeb if he showed up. The house was clean. More or less what I expected. They're guarding the gates, but the gatekeepers don't know why. Sleep wouldn't come and after a quick shower, he went for a run. The pale glow of dawn hadn't yet set in, and the town lay deep in darkness and dreams. Zeb was alone with just the neon street lamps giving him company. A shape darted across the street ahead, paused and turned toward him. The coyote's eyes flashed curiously at him, and then it merged in the darkness. He found a park and went through his routine, and this time he had a solitary jogger for company, who slowed to watch Zeb's intricate moves. It was when Zeb was showering back at the motel that the thought struck him. Oil industry meeting. The second thought had him staring at white tiles till the water turned cold. Prince Abdul's brother was oil minister. Chapter 15 He rechecked Broker's email, went to the event's website, and checked out the program. It was not just an oil industry conference, it was also a meeting of senior leaders and policymakers in the world's most widely used fossil fuel. The speakers and delegates included ministers from various oil-producing nations, and the keynote speaker was the U.S. energy czar. Zeb wasn't conversant with the workings of the oil industry, but he knew that targeting such an audience would create chaos in the oil markets. He didn't need to look at his watch to know Claire would be awake. Even if she wasn't, she would take his call. Claire dashed his train of thought. Not really, she said. You kill one oil minister or kill an entire lot, nothing earth-shattering is going to happen. 
the respective governments will just appoint another one. I doubt the markets will even register the event. He heard her coffee maker gurgle, and her voice came from a distance. But you have picked out the right event. No other event in Texas has a national flavor, let alone an international one. Do you know who Saudi Arabia has appointed as their oil minister? She answered after a deep swallow. They haven't yet. As you can imagine, such an appointment is a high profile one, and I suspect the usual political games are being played out in the royal family. The defense secretary spoke to the king a few days back, and he just said that an announcement would be made in days. Her voice sharpened. Who's the Saudi attendee? Zeb scrolled down the list and read out the name and title. A junior minister. I'll have him checked out. You're proceeding to Dallas? Yes, ma'am. Zeb made another call while driving through a never-ending expanse of flatland, through which asphalt twisted and turned like a ribbon. Prince Abdul picked his call on the first ring. My brother, I was thinking of you just yesterday, he greeted Zeb in Arabic. Bawana and Roger would have had a hard time stifling their snorts. I am flattered, sir. What made you think of me? Levity fled his mind at the prince's reply. We tracked the assassin to the person who had recommended him. He mentioned a name that Zeb recognized, a billionaire philanthropist who had made his money in mining and in oil. He did a lot of work for the kingdom and was like an unofficial ambassador for us. Did. Was. His body was found ten days after my brother's death in an industrial park. He paused for Zeb to comment and carried on when he got silence. There are no coincidences in your world, are there my brother? No sir. Can you? It's already on its way my friend, Khalili has sent you a copy of the report. I have instructed him to cooperate with you fully, should you need anything. The smile in the prince's voice quickly disappeared at Zeb's next question. Can you send me a dossier on your junior oil minister? Wasserman and Studdlander were happy, but their impassive expressions and dark glasses didn't give that away. They were in Fremont County in Colorado, having just bought out a fracking well. In fact they had bought an entire family-owned petroleum company that owned the rights to several wells in Colorado, but the company was known for and named after its largest well, the big one. Fracking, or the hydraulic fracturing of rock by highly pressurized liquid, had allowed the United States to achieve energy independence. The process involved pumping of water, sand, and a bunch of chemicals into wells dug in shale deposits of gas and oil. The high-pressure stream caused the surrounding rock to rupture and the gas and oil to seep into the well, which was then pumped out. Colorado was known for the Rockies, but also had one of the largest natural gas reserves in the world. The Piance Basin, in northwest Colorado, alone was estimated to have more than a trillion barrels of shale oil and substantial reserves of natural gas. Fracking wells dotted the state, but for Wasserman and Studdlander, the big one was of particular interest. The company held the rights to 50 wells, was very low profile, and from the outside, was a very profitable entity. What very few people knew was that just one well, the big one, was producing enough to compensate for the rest of the wells. The company was in financial trouble, lines of credit were running out, and investors were hard to come by. There were other more profitable companies and wells to invest in. The principal knew of the company's troubles, he had made it his business to know everything about the fracking world and its players. He approached the company using several layers of law firms to disguise his identity. The company turned his offer down. They were not selling. They had a long and proud tradition in the oil industry and had no slick law firm was going to end up owning them. The principal made a call to Wasserman. Wasserman studied the problem for three months and decided there had to be an accident at one of the wells. He made his round of calls. For an accident of this nature, he needed specialists. His team of mercs didn't have the skills. His search took time but he finally found the right men, three of them, on another well in Alaska. He approached the men via his cutouts and put forward the proposition to them. 
The men jumped at the opportunity. A million dollars per person just for looking the wrong way and doing the job the slightest bit incorrectly. Hell yeah. They moved to Colorado and found jobs with the big one. Their skills were in demand, and the right words in the right ears made the recruitment easy. The blast at the big one happened at 4 p.m., one month after the three men joined. The explosion, caused by a gas pump rupturing, killed two men and the oil well was shut down immediately. The accident heaped more pressure on the company, and when its few credit guarantors disappeared, Wasserman and Stutelander made their approach. They used a law firm to front for them and spun a story to the law firm. They were oil financiers with an enviable pedigree. The firm tabled the first offer that was rejected. Another offer was made, it too was rejected. Wasserman made the law firm drop the velvet glove, and their lead partner spoke plainly about the company's situation. It sent ripples of shock through the boardroom. Your company will fold in two months. The partner told the owners of the company, baldly. You don't have enough reserves, and now with this shutdown you aren't making any money. The big one is your only producer, but with oil prices what they are, you're barely covering your costs. They accepted his offer that evening, and the next day the lawyers from both sides got to work. Wasserman and Stutelander stood outside the hotel and accepted the lead partner's congratulations. They shook hands with each other once the lawyer had disappeared. It wasn't a self-congratulatory moment. The job was still unfinished. The big one wasn't the first well they had acquired, that process had started a while back. The principal had sent Wasserman a list of other companies he wanted acquired. Wasserman made a call to the partner and instructed him to commence burying the ownership of the big one under layers of offshore companies. There was one more task pending. The three oilmen had to die. News of the big one's acquisition didn't make the national news. Werner didn't spot it since the event didn't tickle his algorithms. The takeover didn't appear in the ticker on the TV behind the reception desk, as Zeb checked in at a hotel in Dallas, two days later. Zeb had driven the thousand-odd miles from Casper to the large city of Dallas, through some of the best country in the United States, past towns and counties in Colorado, many of them benefiting from fracking. He stopped several times, spoke to bartenders and gas station attendants, store clerks and garage mechanics, and many of them mentioned shale oil and gas, but not one mentioned the big one. It just wasn't big enough. The twins had reserved a suite for him in the same hotel as the oil industry convention. He was attending the conference as a delegate from a well-known oil company. He had rescued their operation director from a gang in Nigeria who specialized in high-value kidnapping. Broker had hacked into the hotel's reservation system, why ask when it could be hacked into, and had sent him a list of delegates and room numbers. Prince Abdul had told him where the junior minister was staying. Zeb had everything he needed to make a plan. The problem was, he didn't know what would go down. He also didn't know that the Venezuelan oil minister and the assassin had already checked in a week back. The oil minister had come early to sample the wares of the city, and was in a room that was booked in one of his flunkies' name. The minister planned to indulge himself, an orgy of food and sex, and that was best conducted undercover. The assassin was registered as Abbas Karim, an official from Brunei. He observed the minister from near and far, and on one occasion had shared the same table with him at breakfast. They had indulged in small talk, and the assassin has spouted enough facts about the industry to impress the minister. Two days from checking in, the assassin knew of the minister's habits and knew of the woman who came every night to his room. He followed the woman after one such rendezvous, watched her for a whole day, followed her home, and learned which car she drove. He made an anonymous call to the escort service, went through a surprisingly robust credentials check, and asked for the woman. He was politely told she was booked for a week, but they had other companions in their stable. He checked out the minister's room when it was empty, securing an entry using a duplicate card. There were cameras in the hallway, but the uniform of a hotel employee was very easy to procure, and he kept his face concealed throughout. The minister's suite had a king-sized bed facing a wall-to-wall -wall mirrored wardrobe, behind which lay the bathroom. 
the suite branched out to a smaller reception room. The suite overlooked the hotel's swimming pool and garden. The assassin looked at the furnishings on the bed, recalled the services offered by the escort services, and smiled. He knew how the minister would die. Zeb slept for a straight eight hours, and the next day he hit the data that his crew had sent. He identified the minister's room on the hotel's layout, and then looked at guests surrounding the minister. There were forty rooms on each floor that spread out in an oval. The four rooms immediately around the minister's rooms were occupied by bodyguards and flunkies. Their dossiers were in the pack broker had sent. The rest of the floor was occupied by conference delegates. All of them seemed to be genuine, none looked like a threat. Given the high profile of the attendees, security at the hotel was high, and Zeb had seen the security apparatus in action when checking in. It was good. Whatever goes down will be close contact. Or a sniper. He went to the conference room and ruled it out immediately. There was no hiding place for a sniper, and besides it had cameras in the ceiling. The outside of the hotel gave no cover to a sniper. Broker slammed shut another door in the evening, Wasserman's voice prints had no match. His news didn't end there. Cisco had been found dead in Los Angeles, suspected victim of a rival gang killing. Felix Domingo and Barrow were found dead in a house in Casper. The police had found bags of cocaine in the house and suspected the deaths to be drugs trafficking related. Wasserman is tying up loose ends, Broker voiced Zeb's thoughts. Either that or he's conveying a message that failure will not be tolerated. Any luck with Helmut Kranz? Kranz was the German billionaire, now dead, who had recommended the assassin to the Saudi royal family. Broker sighed in frustration. Nope. Khalili did a good job, unfortunately the assassin's trail ended with Kranz. You think it's worth warning the organizers? Zeb walked to his window and watched traffic flow past the hotel, tiny specks of light that moved to known destinations, followed well-defined routes. Unlike me. We've already warned them. Claire arranged that, but you can imagine the organizer's response. We have nothing specific, and all they can do is tighten security. Maybe that will be enough, Broker said hopefully, but his voice lacked conviction. It wasn't enough. The first siren at six in the morning was faint through the thick window, but loud enough to draw his attention. He glanced out and saw the ambulances and cruisers in the drive far below. The hurrying hotel staff in the hallway outside ignored his questions. He turned on the news on TV and got no clue. All the hotel lines were busy. He grabbed his holster, covered it up with his jacket, and made his way swiftly to the elevator bank, and when he entered the lobby he was met with chaos. Cops and medics rushed purposefully, hotel staff tried to quieten the ever-growing crowd of residents, a security cordon held back people approaching the reception. The Saudi Minister Zeb whipped out his phone and called him, and closed his eyes for a second in relief when the man answered promptly. Yes he was fine. Yes he too had heard something was up, but didn't know any details. His protection detail? They were with him in the room. Zeb ordered him not to leave his room, thrust through the crowd, and when a cop fended him off announced himself as an off-duty cop. Something in his eye and body language must have convinced the rookie since he let Zeb pass. The reception desk ignored him for several moments till Zeb pinned a nervous woman down with laser eyes. Who is it? The Venezuelan oil minister, sir. She didn't bother to evade. He was found dead in his room earlier today, by his security detail. How? Her pale cheeks flushed. It seems to be a sexual act that went wrong. Along with him was a woman. Zeb swung away, her words fading out. Sexual act. Call girl. Kranz. He dug out his phone punched broker's number stared blankly at the outside of the hotel as the call made its way over the air into Broker. Broker's voice came over the phone, but Zeb didn't reply. He was moving, threading his way through the crowd, ignoring shouts. That hair. That posture. 
something about him. The man he was following was thirty feet away, walking swiftly, without hurrying, to the exit. He was dressed in a dark brown jacket over blue jeans, a valise in his left hand. His right hand kept close to his body. He was the only man heading purposefully towards the exit in the lobby, everyone else was aimlessly milling around. He could be anyone. Got to be sure though. Zeb hurried after him, kept in the man's blind spot, and reduced the gap to ten feet. Something must have given him away. Maybe it was the reflection in the glass doors. Maybe the man had a sixth sense like Zeb had. He whirled smoothly, and his right hand crept up to the inside of his jacket. Zeb recognized the posture and paused and caught the man's eye. Dark eyes, black or brown, tanned face, almost Middle Eastern in appearance. Black hair. Lean build. Wiry arms. It was the eyes, though, that caught him. They were deep pools that concealed what lay beneath. He recognized the man from the eyes. It was the assassin from Saudi Arabia, the personal trainer, Mohammed Rauf. Gun, the assassin shouted as he held Zeb's eyes and pointed at him. He's got a gun. Watch out. Some women took up the chorus and screamed. Oh my god, he's got a gun. The assassin's voice rose over the women's and over the chaos in the enormous lobby. He pointed at Zeb, hurried backward, his voice rising into a shout. Gunman in the lobby. Chapter 16 People began screaming and hurling themselves away from Zeb. Cops appeared hard eyed, guns at the ready, and barrels trained on him. Zeb stood motionless and expressionless and watched as the assassin reached the glass doors, look back once and disappear. There was no mocking look in the man's face, no smirk, no satisfaction. Arms up, spread your feet. A HK MP5's barrel poked out and spread his jacket. No explosives, a cop called out. The barrel probed further, and the holster was revealed, and a gasp escaped the watching crowd. A hand reached out, removed his glock and patted him swiftly, and when he was declared clean hands reached out and cuffed him. A police sergeant went through his belongings, found his key card, and ordered a team to check his room out. Just as he was being led away, a voice yelled, wait, and the junior minister came running and panting his thobe flowing around him. He walked right up to the sergeant and shouted at him. He's one of yours, you idiots. You have got the wrong guy. The sergeant's eyes narrowed. Stand back, sir. Let us do our job. The minister jabbed the air in rage and impatience. You're doing it wrong. I can vouch for him. He's Zeb Carter, a security consultant. The sergeant glanced down at the credentials in his hand and back again. His eyes sharpened. That's not what he goes by. Just who are you, sir? The minister drew himself to his full 5 feet 8 inch height and tried to stare down the sergeant who glowered at him from a foot above. I'm Sheikh Abdul Yunus Salah, the junior oil minister of Saudi Arabia. The sergeant was nonplussed for a moment, recovered and said smoothly, Step back, sir. We'll take your statement later, let us do our jobs now. The minister drew a breath to let rip when Zeb stopped him. Let it be, sir. It will get cleared up later. He realized his error the moment the words left his mouth. I shouldn't have spoken in Arabic. Terrorist, a woman screamed and the lobby erupted in a burst of sound. The assassin moved deeper in the crowd outside, ignored questions from the curious, and behind the cover of a hummer, removed his jacket and wore it inside out. He donned dark shades, ran his fingers through his hair and parted it the other way. Small changes, big effect. He was thinking furiously all the while. Who's that man? How did he spot me? He went through his memory, examined all his kills, crossed out all those whom he had worked with or interacted with, and finally shook his head unconsciously. I don't know him. He isn't from my past. He knew his cover wasn't detected or else those cops would be on top of him. He wondered if the sponsor had fingered him and discarded the thought immediately. Those guns would have been on me a long time back. No, this man was working alone. 
He went to the back of the throng and examined all the heads craning inside. Not one person was interested in him. They were all watching the takedown inside, some of them were filming the event on their cell phones. He looked at the vehicles in the driveway, all of them had their windows down in the heat. Not a single one was occupied. The assassin made swift calculations. His job was done, the target was dead. The job had gone surprisingly smoothly. He had entered the minister's room when it was empty, using the staff uniform, and had concealed himself in an unused wardrobe, and had waited for the man and the escort to return. He had acted when they had started indulging, and had stifled the woman's scream with a nerve pinch. He hadn't needed to gag the minister. He was already gagged in some kind of BDSM roleplay. The killing had been smooth, and he had exited the room ninety minutes later. If only all my kills were this easy. He was confident an autopsy wouldn't reveal much. It had been a natural death for the oil minister and the escort, he just had hastened it. The assassin's escape was planned, his car had a full tank, a private jet was waiting at an airstrip outside the city. I need to know who he is. He knew who I was. No one has ever made me like this. The crowd stirred and surged forward, and he saw the glass doors open and the cops surround the man and bundle him into a waiting vehicle. The man was calm, expressionless, almost bored, but his eyes were alert. They scanned the crowd and the assassin drew back. He knows I am here. This isn't just some ordinary Joe who happened to see me. He waited for the cruisers to drive away, went back inside the hotel and down to the car park where he stowed away his valise. The lobby was considerably quieter when he returned to it, the crowd had thinned out, and some of the screaming women had disappeared. A few cops were taking witness statements, one elevator was cordoned off, and there were still some ambulances and emergency vehicles outside. Probably recovering the bodies. They'll take those away from a rear entrance. He assumed his work persona and shouldered to the desk. A harried looking woman glanced at him and smiled automatically. How can I help you, sir? He put on a concerned expression. I'm here for the conference. Is that still going ahead? I heard about the tragic death of the minister. Yes, sir. The organizers haven't called it off. He sighed in relief. Thank goodness. It would have been a pain in the backside to change my travel plans. Besides, I intended to catch up with several of my peers here. Say, what went down over here just now? Who was that guy? A shuddered look came over her. We don't know, sir. I am sure the cops will investigate and will know more later. His voice grew suspicious. He was a guest, wasn't he? Some crazy is staying in your hotel with guns and who knows what else, putting all of us at risk. We have a right to know who he is. She hesitated, flicked her eyes at the growing line behind him, and told him the man's name reluctantly. He registered as William Bonner from New York. He thanked her with a nod and hurried away. His step didn't falter, but he changed direction when he picked up snatches of conversation from a couple of women. He headed toward them, flashed a warm smile, and twenty minutes later had more details on William Bonner. The Saudi minister said his name was Zeb Carter. Some kind of security consultant. He joined a bunch of businessmen who were huddled over their laptops, plugged in his machine, and fired off messages to his cutout and to his Russian hacker. He thought long and hard about approaching the Saudi minister, he could easily gain access as a fellow conference delegate, but there were risks. But those can be mitigated. He emerged from his room looking a different man, he wore a different outfit, grey contacts were in his eyes and his hair was dyed with streaks of blonde. A slight stoop in his shoulders completed the look. He went down to the lobby and after a minute of searching found the Saudi minister furiously arguing with a couple of cops, who had clearly reached the end of their patience. He hung about and when the cops finally left he approached the minister with a bow, introduced himself and made small talk. The minister was still furious and replied absent-mindedly, and when another couple of cops walked past, he couldn't contain himself. He turned on the assassin. You saw that, didn't you? 
The police didn't take me seriously just because I wear a thobe. They said they would take my statement, but did anyone come? No. Interviewing women is more important to them. He broke off when his aide whispered in his ear. Presumably he was asking the minister to calm down since they were drawing attention. Need to finish this quickly. The assassin smiled obsequiously and agreed with the minister. He was Venezuelan and he faced the same problem. Americans believed only their kind. The minister nodded rapidly, snapped his fingers and a white cloth was produced. He wiped his face and seemed to calm down. How did the minister know the arrested man? The minister swelled with pride. Zeb Carter is a friend of Saudi Arabia. He designed the security systems of our royal palace. Our king holds him in high regard. The assassin made appropriate noises of wonder and then a slight frown marred his smooth forehead. What was Carter doing at an oil conference venue? The minister came close to bursting through his thobe. The king had requested Carter to check the security of the hotel, confirm it was safe for the minister. Carter was doing just that, and look where it got him. Why was Carter registered under a different name? The minister scoffed. Didn't the Venezuelan know that it was common practice in the security consulting business? To use an alias? The assassin apologized. He was just a paper pusher. All he knew was oil. Clearly, the minister sniffed and walked away with his retinue in tow. The assassin sent another message to his cutout. Zeb Carter consulted on the Saudi Royal Palace security systems. He went to the basement, and in the privacy of his vehicle, he considered his next moves. That wasn't a security consultant. That was an operative. It took four hours for Zeb to be released, hours in which he went over his cover story, that of a security consultant on contract to the Saudi government, several times was met with looks of incredulity. The serial number on his Glock was checked and traced to his company in New York. That company had no William Bonner in its directory. Zeb was patient, knew what he was fighting, but finally clammed up when he realized he wasn't getting anywhere. Broker or the twins will know soon enough and calls will be made. Three hours later a phone was pushed through his cell and a voice laughed in his ear. I fell off my chair when I saw you on TV. The great Zeb Carter arrested like a common garden variety criminal? The voice chortled. Those videos are going to warm many a winter night for me. Cut it out Bill, Zeb growled. Get me out of here. I'm on it. Bill Leon, assistant chief of police, Austin PD, replied with a smile in his voice. Bill had served with the 3rd Infantry in Iraq, a lifetime back, where Zeb had saved his ass. More recently, Bill had helped Zeb nail a serial killer who was terrorizing New York's women. His intervention in that case had placed his career on a fast track, and he had risen from detective first grade to his current position in little time. By the way, your friends in New York are refusing to help, Bill smirked. They said it'll do your health a whole lot of good to sweat it out in the cooler for some time. You deserve it for going it alone, Bawana said. The assassin sent another text. Is Zeb Carter still in police custody and where? He turned on his police scanner, drove out of the hotel, and made his way to the police headquarters on Lamar Street. He heard the chief of police make a brief statement that the oil minister was suspected of dying in a sex game that went wrong. Investigations were continuing. He had no comments to make on the gunman arrested. The assassin smiled briefly. No one would ever know how the minister died. That was why his skills were in demand. He eased into a parking lot a block away from his destination, moved to the rear, and under the cover of the darkened windows, changed. The man who emerged from the vehicle looked very different from the assassin. This man was dressed in black motorcycle leathers, his eyes were green, the blonde streaks were stronger, and a helmet dangled from his left hand. A small backpack rested below his shoulders. The assassin scanned the parking lot, didn't find what he was looking for, and walked a few streets before he found a ride. 
The Yamaha, chained to a bike stand, looked to be in good condition, and after a casual glance around, the assassin kneeled to the ground, fiddled with the chain for a few minutes, and unsecured the bike. Another set of tools came out of his backpack, and the throaty growl of the bike sounded a minute later. He paused just for a second to check the text reply from his contact. Carter was still in custody at the headquarters. Carter couldn't live. The assassin had reached that decision without conscious thought, after talking to the Saudi minister. He was not just another bystander, he also knew how the assassin looked. He suspects what my profession is. Zeb sat for another hour in the cell, motionless, thinking of nothing, a state he could maintain for hours and days. The presence of a cop at the door signaled a change in his state of affairs. The cop stood back and jerked his head for Zeb to follow. He was led past bunches of cops who fell silent at his approach and eyed him with undisguised curiosity. It wasn't often that a gunman was released with no charge and no questions asked. Their chief hadn't poked his head out of his office for hours, ever since Carter's arrest. The sergeant at the desk silently handed Zeb's jacket, watched impassively as Zeb checked his Glock, holstered it, and his expressionless eyes followed Zeb as he made his way out. Zeb scanned his phone for messages, skimmed through the download Megan had sent on the deaths in the hotel. They were digging into the escort service, at this stage details were flimsy. A cab swung up, ordered by the desk sergeant, and Zeb bundled himself into the back. He failed to spot the dark figure that fell in behind his cab. The assassin knew he had made a mistake, in his hurry to get close to Carter he had forgotten the man's vehicle. It would be harder to follow Carter if he drove away in his own ride. He relaxed imperceptibly when the cab went back to the hotel, and Carter disappeared through the glass doors. The assassin wheeled to the basement lot, secured the bike well away from any cameras, and dug his phone out again. His hacker had been at work, and Carter's bio was now on his screen. A couple of words stood out. Special forces. Like I thought, no ordinary guy. The hacker had also got William Bonner's room number and the plates for his vehicle. He walked through bays in the parking lot, looking like he was trying to find the exit, and bent down near Carter's vehicle to adjust his shoelace. He drove out of the basement and hung outside the hotel to wait for Carter's next move. One thought ran through his mind. Nothing from the cutout. Why the silence? He normally comes back very quickly with intel. He fired another text to his hacker. Was Carter in Saudi Arabia recently? Zeb was on calls himself. The first was to his crew who promised to go through all the hotel's guests and see if any of them might be the assassin. I'm sure the killer stayed in the hotel. It would make his job that much easier. Zeb thought aloud and got assenting noises from the other end. The escort agency. We're on it. Beth interrupted him. Looks like it's an international agency, and caters to the very wealthy and the important. The second call was to Prince Abdul on a more delicate matter. He briefed the royal rapidly, appreciated the silent listening, and when he had finished, the prince asked just one question. How can I help? Zeb posed his question. Did the prince know which escort agencies his brother frequented? The royal didn't allow any awkwardness to creep in. He replied smoothly that he didn't, but he knew people who would know. By evening, he knew who the assassin was posing as. The energy ministry in Brunei confirmed that Abbas Karim was their delegate. Their photograph matched the passport the assassin had used to check in. There was only one problem. The photographs for Abbas Karim did not match the ice-cold man who had turned the tables on Zeb. Kareem was jolly, fleshier, and had gray eyes. Broker had downloaded the hotel's security camera database and had run facial recognition through it. No Abbas Kareem. He ran Mohammed Rauf's image and got two hits. One was in the hallway outside the dead minister's room. One was when he was entering the parking lot. There were several other hits for a man of that height and posture, some of those hits turned out to be false, in some others, the face was concealed. He disguised himself for the passport and when registering at the hotel. 
once in the hotel, there was no need to maintain the disguise. So what would Abbas Karim or Muhammad Rauf, or whoever the assassin is, do now? He would leave the city. The assassin finally got a message from the cutout. Someone had queried his identity at the energy ministry. Carter. Who else can it be? He texted back. Who is Zeb Carter? Who is he working for? There was no reply. The sponsor's hiding something, but before he could analyze the thought, his phone pinged. Carter's on the move. Zeb drove out of the lot, merged into the evening traffic and settled back driving was an automatic process, it had a way of freeing his mind up, letting him think. Petrova. Prince's brother. Oil minister. Wasserman. Assassin. He shook his head in frustration, got an acknowledging nod from a woman in a red convertible in the next lane, ignored her, and went back to his train of thought. Claire said killing oil ministers won't have any impact. So there must be something else behind this. Can the escort agency be involved in some way? Blackmail? A furious honking drew his attention back to driving. The light had changed to green. He floored it, looked around and realized that he had come further than he had intended. He was at the outer edges of the city. He punched the hotel's coordinates in his sat-nav and followed its instructions to loop around. He didn't pay attention to the bike when it overtook him. No vehicles had pinged his radar, there was just his thinking to occupy him. Another bike came up from behind him ten minutes later, eased into the lane next to him. He glanced casually, nodded at the helmeted head, looked straight ahead and checked his mirrors. The bike fell behind when he accelerated his vehicle and went back to his problem. Another ten minutes something flashed in his consciousness, the flash grew larger, became dark in his mirror, resolved into a bike. The bike. Break. Chapter 17 How did you allow him to blindside you? The first shot burst a star on Zeb's window and wiped all thought away from his mind. A second shot followed barely an inch apart, the tight grouping would have blown away his temple if his window hadn't been armored. Zeb swerved, feathering the brakes lightly and the bike followed. The gun barked again and two more bursts appeared, this time lower. Zeb spun the wheel suddenly and flew right at the bike. It spun away lightly and the figure turned, the gun lowered and spoke again. A tire gave, the SUV's front dipped, but the heavy vehicle continued rolling as it was designed to. Zeb followed the swirling and dipping bike, floored the gas, but it was nimble and eased away from the heavier vehicle. The figure turned sideways, the helmet swung to take in Zeb and the gun rose. Zeb punched a button and the rooftop camera slid out and started recording the bike. The helmet shifted and then the figure jerked in surprise as the earth-shattering blast of a foghorn sounded from the bottom of the SUV and caused lights to glow in houses in the distance. Zeb couldn't contain a grin despite the circumstances. It had been Bawana's idea to fit a foghorn to all their vehicles. If you can't shoot, make a heck of a sound, was his rationale. He rolled his window down a couple of inches, thrust the barrel of his Glock, but before he could squeeze, the figure turned and grew smaller as the Yamaha throttled away. The shooter's arm raised and waved casually, mockingly. Till next time. Zeb coasted and came to a stop on the hard shoulder and inspected his vehicle. It would run, a few holes wouldn't stop it. He leaned against the door and waited, a lean tall figure, brown hair ruffling slightly in the wind, eyes keen and sharp, breathing easily, pulse slow and steady. That's how the first cruiser found him 15 minutes later. More patrol cars joined and he was hauled away and it began all over again. Should have left when the first shot failed. The assassin cursed as engine throbbed smoothly underneath him. His valise was fastened securely to the pillion, and the leathers covered the body armor he wore. He had made a cardinal mistake, he had let his ego take over, and now Carter had the bike's plates. He glanced at his GPS tracker and saw Carter was stationary several miles back. He looped back into the city, his eyes darting with urgency now, seeking another getaway vehicle. 
his ride into the parking lot was clean. There wasn't anything in it that would lead back to him. It could stay in the lot. But he needed another set of wheels. He got them in a strip mall's lot, a Corolla, its keys dangling inside parked between family wagons and trucks. He was driving away minutes later, still in his leathers. Another parking lot, a truck stop this time, gave him the cover and time to change. It also gave him yet another set of wheels, and this time he drove straight to the airstrip, and two hours later he was in the air. The cops weren't pleased to see Zeb, and their enthusiasm hit the floor when they inspected the holes in his vehicle. It buried through the ground when he produced the video of the assassin. I'm sure that'll help us nail him, the sergeant mumbled when he saw the black-clad figure twisting and turning on the bike. He'll be dead easy to identify. Nevertheless, he called out the bike's plates, and by the time they reached the city, they knew it was stolen. He glanced sideways at Zeb when the call came, and when he got no reaction, swore under his breath. Just who are you? He burst out finally. Those gadgets on your vehicle look like something out of Hollywood. I'm just a security consultant, visiting your city. Yeah, and I'm the Pope. This time they released Zeb quicker, they knew the drill. If they kept him for long, calls would be made, their chief would come out of his office steaming and unhappy, and no cop wanted that. Besides Carter was the one who was shot at, he didn't fire a single round. This shooter and the minister's death are connected, Zeb told them helpfully. One of the cops grunted in disinterest. They would investigate their way. No out-of-town security hotshot was going to tell them how to do their job. Zeb returned to his hotel room, made a call on the way to have the SUV replaced, and when he had showered, he started thinking again. Why me? He could have disappeared in the dark with none of us any wiser. The answer was obvious. I saw him. He knew that I knew. It was in his eyes. Maybe he doesn't like witnesses. Another thought struck him, and he fired another message to his crew. Assassin might try to escape. Have him on the watch list at all ports. Broker's reply came back instantly. Done. Way ahead of you. A knock sounded on the door, and he frowned as no one approached his door. A muffled voice called from outside. The Glock leapt into his hand, and the telescopic cable slipped under the door, but all he saw was a sea of white. White? His brow cleared, and he opened the door to see the beaming face of the Saudi minister. I'm glad to see you unharmed, my friend. I spoke to every policeman I could see, and I even asked our ambassador to lodge a formal complaint. He talked non-stop, gesticulating furiously as he entered the room without waiting for an invite from Zeb. I was going to call the police chief here, but I think the pressure I applied finally cracked them. Zeb put on a straight face and thanked the minister who waved it away. His restless eyes scanned the room and lighted on the bowl of fruit. You haven't had dinner? Of course you haven't. They don't feed you in prison, do they? He clapped his hands and an aide rushed in bearing an enormous tray covered by a pristine white cloth. He laid it on a center table and when he had left, the minister gestured and commanded. Eat. Zeb demurred and steered him gently to the table. Saudi hospitality. No wonder most of the royals and ministers are well-rounded. The minister inspected his room, commented about its small size, pulled the curtains wide open and fluffed the pillows. He tugged at a wardrobe, frowned and prepared to tug again. Don't. Move grab him dive. A blast roared through the room, shards of glass and wicked slivers of wood flew from the wardrobe and buried themselves in the bed. Zeb landed in the hallway on his shoulder, rolled over to shield the minister, and rose swiftly to his feet when the explosion died. He hustled the bewildered minister away, gestured at his security detail to lead him to the lobby. There could be a secondary explosion. He entered his room cautiously, grabbed his backpack, his jacket and the armor and cast a last glance. The room was ruined, and if he hadn't acted instantaneously, the minister would have died. I never use the wardrobe, never have anything to stuff in them. But the assassin didn't know that. 
this was the assassin's backup. He joined yet another chaotic, noisy throng of guests rushing to the bank of elevators, quelled the beast as it rose inside. Time to go hunting. The assassin was coldly furious as he paced an apartment in Florida the next day. The news on TV of the hotel explosion, no one injured or killed, had soured him, and when Wasserman came online the bitterness had turned to a raging fury. The hacker had reached him when he had landed bearing news that had settled into a cold pit in the assassin's belly. Carter had been in Riyadh almost immediately after the royal's killing. He was seen entering the royal palace, there was confirmation that he had met the royal's brother. It's no coincidence. He's on my trail. Setting up a call with the sponsor's representative had been easier than he had anticipated. He had demanded the cutout set up a call with the sponsor's people, or he was quitting the assignment. The cutout had come back with a conference number that he was to dial into. The sponsor's man, who didn't introduce himself, spoke in a distorted voice, and the assassin knew he was speaking through a voice-altering device. The assassin himself had a similar device at his end, and had bounced his call through servers across the world. Are you aware of this man? The answer made the assassin take a deep breath and listen carefully. Yes. He's come up against us a few times. The sponsor's man outlined the events in Wyoming and Los Angeles without going into any specifics other than mentioning Carter's presence. You didn't think about warning me. We didn't lead him to you. His presence was coincidental. It wasn't, but the killer kept quiet. Are my killings connected to whatever went down in those two states? he asked. Indirectly. The spokesman didn't elaborate, and the assassin didn't press. He took on kill missions and didn't really care about the ripple effects. What's my situation? You're cold. The spokesman replied, meaning no law agency was looking for the killer. Carter asked the DPD to look into you but they are suspecting terrorist activity because of the international nature of the conference. Besides, they have nothing on your identity. The Venezuelan minister passed off as an unfortunate accident. The assassin rubbed his hand over the stubble on his chin, saw himself in the mirror, saw a lean man staring back with burning eyes and smiled slightly. Another successful, natural death. The next assignment. We'll have to wait, the killer interrupted him coldly. If it's outside the US I won't travel till this dies down. The spokesman's voice was contemptuous. Getting cold feet. I thought you killers were used to traveling the world with several law forces after you. It's part of the job, isn't it? Surely somewhere in the world there's someone who's hunting for you. Who, where, when, the assassin asked after a long pause. The spokesman told him. It was the Nigerian oil minister. The kill would happen in that country in two weeks' time. Wasserman ended the call, crossed his arms behind his head, leaned back and stared idly at the fireplace. It promised to be another hot day, with the mercury already touching 80, and yet the fire roared. He could hear faint noises as a cleaning crew went through the ranch and readied it for a batch of dude visitors. Carter. The man had disappeared after the bust-ups in L.A., but Wasserman never expected him to turn up at the conference. Was he on the assassin's trail? If so, how did he know about the killer? Despite Carter's annoying presence, events were moving according to the timeline. Another fracking company was in the process of being acquired, and Studlander was busy working on that. The assassin had his next kill. The minister's replacements would be in place soon. Wasserman was not given to rubbing his hands in glee, but if he was, he would have. The principal had worked for years, had spent millions of dollars in different countries bribing politicians and dictators for getting his people in the right positions. Now his efforts were paying off. The king of Saudi Arabia would be announcing his new oil minister, a candidate who was in the principal's pocket. Wasserman knew the principal was working his phone all night to ensure his nominees would step into the dead minister's shoes. 
The nominees were in prominent positions in their governments and had started influencing the leaders and heads of states to their point of view. Their point of view was the principles. The principal had chosen them carefully. In the first place, he had Wasserman prepare dossiers on each one of them, and when he had studied all their speeches and off-the-record comments, he had made a discreet approach, using attractive women as decoys. It was only when the principal was convinced that the men shared his beliefs, as passionately as he did, that he had met them. Then commenced the machinations of moving the selected men into the right positions so that they would be selected as oil and energy ministers. It had taken three years but now everything was moving like clockwork. That's why the principal hired me. Wasserman brushed aside a pesky housefly that had breached the ranch's air conditioning. Carter. He won't get anywhere. But was Dallas a coincidence? He picked up the phone. Zeb was in a chain motel in Dallas, one of hundreds that dotted the country, and guaranteed consistency to travelers in whichever part of the country they were in. The bed was neat and soft, the bathroom was clean, and the room had a window through which he could exit. That was all that mattered to Zeb. Bone china service, fine linen and French wines mattered more to the rest of his crew. He had left the conference hotel without checking out, had received a new Dodge Durango, and had spent the rest of the night in the hotel. The next day he started his series of calls. The first was to his crew. Mohammed Rauf or Abbas Karim or whoever he is, is on the sauce no-fly list. The FBI has been alerted to his presence, and all law agencies are looking for him. DPD now have his details, but haven't revealed it to the media. As far as the outside world is concerned, the explosions were a domestic terrorist activity. Beth brought him up to speed. Zeb asked a question that had been bothering him. Who benefits? He didn't have to explain to his crew, they knew he was referring to the Venezuelan and Saudi ministers' killings. If the oil industry wasn't affected by these killings, then who stood to gain by these killings? He heard them murmuring, then Chloe spoke up. Zeb, that escort agency is run by a Russian entrepreneur in LA, he is rumored to have mob money behind him. Prince Abdul reached out to us when he couldn't get through to you. His brother used the same agency. Zeb threw his duffel into the Durango, and when he hit the I-30 to commence another 16-hour journey, dialed Claire. Caused enough mayhem in Dallas? She replied in amusement when he told her he was heading to Los Angeles. He gave her broker's update and let the silence hang while she worked it out. He had seen her once play chess while driving through peak DC traffic. She issued voice commands and played against a grandmaster in real time. By the time she'd reached her office, she had checkmated the more experienced player without once taking her eyes off the river of steel ahead of her. That escort agency could be the connection. Nothing makes sense frankly. We know that the KSA will appoint a new minister today, and we think we know who that appointee will be. That candidate is a friend of ours. The foreign secretary has reached out to the Venezuelan government, but it's too early for them to consider a new appointee. Can you get me photographs? Of the minister and the prostitute? Sure. Broker had once bet $100 that if he Zeb asked Claire for the president's credit card details, she would come through. Zeb hadn't taken him up. You'll have to wipe me clean from the DPD's records. Her laugh filled the Durango. Broker's already done that. Your pal Leon did most of the heavy lifting. His word carries a lot of weight, apparently. She briefed him on the situation in Iraq and Syria as rubber ate concrete and spat it out behind. On ISIS and extremism. Zeb knew the area well, he also knew the organization. He had carried out surgical strikes against it in a past mission, blows that had stalled the terror group's advances and had bought the West vital breathing space. Now the battle was evenly poised, but just the slightest shade in the West's favor. Could they be behind all this? First thing that came to my mind, she replied. Especially since your last spot of bother in New York. Zeb had come up against homegrown extremists in New York in a previous mission, 
a highly trained and motivated bunch of young men who were led by a hand of fire killer. The Hof was another brutal extremist organization in the Middle East. But like I said the squares don't fit. The ISIS already control certain oil fields in parts of Iraq and Syria, but have virtually no presence in these other countries. Killing off a few ministers doesn't do much. Maybe Domingo was exaggerating. Possible, Zeb agreed, but there was no conviction in his voice. He knew Claire shared his doubts. I guess we'll just have to pull the threads and see where they lead us, she sighed. Be careful in LA, I heard the 38th Street is looking for someone that matches your description. She signed off with another laugh. They haven't learned their lesson, have they? Chapter 18 Wasserman had further news for the assassin. Someone checked out your cover in Brunei. They confirmed that you were a genuine delegate. I know this. He kept silent though, and listened to the sponsor's man. Through the windows he could see palm fronds swaying in the breeze and waves crashing on the beach. If he rolled back the darkened windows, he would hear Floridians enjoying their city. His apartment building, a 30-story one, was very close to the beach, and as was his norm, he had bought it using many layers of banks and offshore companies. The assassin didn't roll back the windows, didn't stand in the small balcony, didn't give any curious onlooker the opportunity to spot him and maybe photograph him. Carter was in Saudi Arabia soon after your kill. We have traced a connection between him and Prince Abdul, though we aren't sure what that is. We have to assume Carter suspects you of killing the Saudi minister. Where is he? We are trying to track him. He hasn't checked out of the hotel, but he isn't staying there any longer. You caught the news about the explosion. The assassin grunted. That was a neat trick, but no one was injured. I am sure he has left the city, and he'll now go after the escort agency. Wasserman prided himself planning for every contingency, for planting red herrings, and the escort agency was one such false trail. Once he had discovered that the Saudi minister frequented the agency, it had been easy to steer other energy ministers to the same establishment. A discreet wink and a nudge over a drink. It was so easy to influence these worldly men or point them in a certain direction. He needs to die, the assassin cut in on his thoughts. He will. Wasserman smiled grimly. There is a reception committee awaiting him in Los Angeles. Zeb had no intention of picking a fight with the 38th Street. But neither will I avoid one. He checked in a hotel in Malibu, one that served French wines and had a rooftop swimming pool. He spent a day catching up on his sleep and on the intel dumps his team had sent him. The agency was run by Julian Kozlov, who had his office in downtown LA. Kozlov was born to a prostitute on the streets of Moscow and grew up on the occasional bouts of generosity his mother's customers threw his way. He had a finely developed skill for survival by the time an uncle brought him to the United States. He was eight years old then. His intelligence got polished in the private schools of Los Angeles, and he was groomed to take over his uncle's business. His uncle, Vladimir Blokhin, had no heirs of his own, and young Kozlov would soon run a mob business that went head-to-head -head with the Hispanic gangs in LA. Like any other gang, Blokhin's mob was into drugs, women, extortion and hits. Kozlov changed the face of the mob when he took over the reins. He went upmarket. He started the escort agency that catered to the extremely wealthy and prominent. He provided the drugs for high society parties. He got involved in nasty divorces that needed a more direct settlement, and in business mergers which needed more than money to go through. Kozlov got a quiet reputation as the go-to Russian, and by the time Blokhin died, the mob business was making money hand over fist. Sure they still had enforcers and killers, but those goons were more likely to wear Armani and had better teeth. Zeb called Kozlov's office to set up an appointment and was told politely that the great man was abroad, traveling for an indefinite period. He's right there in Beverly Hills, Broker snorted when Zeb briefed him. Werner dug out satellite photos over his mansion just today, and there he was lying next to his pool. There was a busty blonde next to him. 
Broker's concept of privacy differed wildly from that of most people. Zeb made the 40-minute drive from the lush coolness of Malibu to the snarling downtown traffic and made his way to the gangster's office. Of course, it didn't look like a mob outfit. Modern art and wall hangings covered open spaces and blondes sauntered through the office as if time was elastic. Zeb searched for a couch, some kind of a seat, and found something in a warm red that looked like it was designed by someone stoned high. He gave his name to the receptionist and was given the same message. Mr. Kozlov was traveling. No one knew when he would be back. I'll wait. Zeb told her blandly and settled on the thing that was a couch but looked like it was the back end of a horse. Blue eyes stared at him in astonishment and the smooth brow furrowed. Visitors left when told the great man wasn't around. They didn't plant themselves in the office, cross their legs and lean back and close their eyes. She tried again and told him that Mr. Kozlov was out of the country. On another continent. Like did the visitor know that there was a world beyond Los Angeles? Zeb opened his eyes, acknowledged her and went back to meditation. The receptionist gave up and whispered in her headset, and presently two men approached Zeb. They didn't look like heavies, but all the fake tan, the fancy suits and the blinding smiles couldn't conceal who they were. They stood in front of Zeb poised to use their manicured hands, but Zeb rose easily and for the briefest moment allowed the beast to reveal itself. He saw the reaction in the men's eyes. Tell Kozlov I am waiting for his call. He gave them a number and left silently. Kozlov didn't call. Zeb waited a full day, but neither the mob boss nor any flunky rang him. He went back to the downloads from the twins and studied the nightclub that Kozlov owned. It was on La Cienaga Boulevard, its website spoke of discreet opulence and privacy for men and women to let their hair down. Very wealthy men and women. Ordinary Joes weren't welcome at the club. Megan sent him its plans, its security setup, and Beth sent him dossiers on its employees. Raj and I can be there on the next plane. Bawana told him helpfully. Nope. I just want to meet him. I don't want to level Los Angeles. It might come to that, Roger countered. Hope sprang eternal in the breasts of his team. The club was crowded when Zeb visited it that evening. The largest room was the central events room, which had a dance floor around which tables were laid out. The center of the floor had a stripper's pole, and a couple of women were plying their trade when Zeb took a table. All the women were attractive, displayed a significant amount of cleavage and from their accents and high cheekbones, and were either Russian or East European. A waitress smiled brightly, took his order, and disappeared to a bar, behind which a large black man was busy. The barman had a couple of assistants, all of whom worked competently. Scattered throughout the room were security personnel, discreetly observing the floor. There will be cameras all over, in a security room constantly manned. The central floor led off to several rooms, some of which were the bathrooms and the kitchen, others were private entertainment rooms and changing rooms for the dancers. Zeb stayed till 10 p.m., just as the crowd was becoming raucous, and when he stepped outside the line outside the club's doors was half a block long. 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. are their peak hours. He returned the next day, and after nursing a drink for a couple of hours, he followed one of the dancers to the changing room, which was guarded by a burly man. Zeb approached the man swiftly, concern etched over his face. Gus wants you at the front. Trouble's brewing. He wants experienced men to handle it. The man frowned, tried his radio but got silence. Comms are dead, Zeb replied impatiently. Why do you think I'm here? Just who are you? The man growled. I haven't seen you before. No reason why you should. I joined today. Zeb let anger burst through him. Look buddy, a brawl has probably broken out by now. Gus said I should take your place while you are away. You may not have a job tomorrow if you aren't out there, but suit yourself. The guard tried his radio a couple of times more, and then tossed it to Zeb with a glower and trotted to the main floor. Zeb released the jammer he had been holding in his pocket, and the radio burst to life. 
He waited for a few more moments, and when he was sure the guard wasn't returning anytime soon, he went inside the changing room. There were about 20 women in the room, in various stages of undress. They ignored him, and went about dressing or undressing or painting their faces. He removed his jacket and let his gun show, and still not an eyebrow lifted. I guess the security guys are like furniture over here. They probably see enough guns about the place. Ladies, you need to leave. Show's over. This place is no longer safe. They ignored him. He fired a shot in the air and got instant silence. You need to, he started, and then got drowned out in the screaming. That's all right. I want them to raise hell and then disappear. The room emptied in less than ten minutes, and when the last woman had left cursing and swearing, Zeb went back to the floor where the first ripple of chaos had reached. The sound of the gunshot had been covered by the loud music, but the replacement girls hadn't arrived, and the ones on the floor kept glancing at the changing room. A few patrons had noticed the half-naked women rushing out, and heads were starting to turn, fingers were pointing. Zeb found an empty table near an exit, and with his back to a wall, pulled out his gun and fired in the air. The night's over, folks. Leave now. He announced over the loud silence. The crowd still didn't move. They thought it was a prank, part of the show. This nightclub is lined with explosive and will go off any time. Still no one moved. He fired twice more, and then the stampede began, and the yells and the shouting started. Twenty minutes later a head popped from behind a door, spotted Zeb and disappeared. Your club is packed with explosives. Don't do anything stupid, like using your trigger fingers. Zeb called out. Murmuring sounded from behind the door, and then Gus, the chief of security Zeb had spotted, approached cautiously, a phalanx of men beside him. They trained guns on Zeb, and from the distance of twenty feet, Gus shouted at him angrily. Who are you, man? Do you realize what you've just done? I've closed your nightclub. Not the end of the world. A side door opened and goons rushed in, more guns trained on Zeb. He lifted the jammer and waved it in the air, and the men halted suddenly. This is a detonator. If I stop pressing it, your nightclub will provide LA with the best display of fireworks it has seen. Rest your trigger fingers. He waved his gun to emphasize his point. The men looked nervously at one another, and then at Gus, seeking direction. They knew their way around guns. They had broken up many a violent fight and faced down armed men. But detonators and explosives? The security head licked his lips and tried to stay calm. There's no need to do anything rash. We can work this out. Of course we can. I want your boss, Julian Kozlov. Sweat beaded Gus's dark forehead and rolled down his face. He made no attempt to blot it. Face was important. Image was all that mattered. He isn't here. He doesn't hang out in the club. Zeb raised the jammer and grinned at the collective suck of air. That's not an acceptable answer. You need to do two things. One is to call the cops and convince them not to show up. The other is to get your boss here in 15 minutes. Another wave of the jammer, another gasp. I need my beauty sleep so you'd better get moving. Kozlov came an hour later, with a retinue of armed men flanking him. The Russian was dressed in elegantly tailored khakis, a white silk shirt that gleamed in the dim light, and a jacket to complete the sartorial display. He was taller than Zeb by an inch and had blue eyes that pierced the air. The blue eyes sought Zeb out, and when they landed on him, his fury burst out. You. Zeb moved so swiftly that it caught the guards unawares and jammed his glock in Kozlov's mouth. If you'd met me at your office, it wouldn't have come to this. He maneuvered the man out, using him as a shield. Whether your boss lives or dies is down to you folks. If anyone pops his head out, I'll cap him right here. Be good, and he might come back. I can't guarantee that he'll be unharmed though. Kozlov whirled to snarl, but the grip on his throat tightened and all he could do was croak. Zeb pulled him swiftly down the drive, fired a warning shot when a head appeared outside the main doors, and when it disappeared, cuffed the man and shoved him in his vehicle. 
He secured Kozlov to a handle in the door, used the man's belt to fasten his legs and drove through the San Diego freeway, keeping a close watch on his mirrors. No cruisers showed, no choppers shadowed him. He parked in a turn-off area briefly and emptied the Russian's pockets, flung his phone, wallet, and keys out of the vehicle. He smashed the gun barrel in Kozlov's mouth when he made to protest, didn't even turn to look when the man gagged, spat, and groaned. He had considered various ways to get to Kozlov, but a hard, brutal takedown seemed to be the best way to get fast answers. Emptying the nightclub had been a deliberate tactic to cow Kozlov's men, to give them the perception he wasn't acting alone. He was counting on Kozlov's men not yet involving the cops, not until they knew what exactly was going down. He came off the freeway and drove up Mulholland Drive through its winding curves past pullouts which had the occasional vehicle. He carried on higher till the traffic fell off, following the ridgeline of the Santa Monica Mountains, the lights of his Durango boring tunnels through the darkness. Did I miss it? No, there it is. The break in the road was barely visible in daytime since it was covered by overhanging growth. In the night, it was invisible. He nosed through it and revved up a steep drive, drove round its curve and suddenly they were in a wide clearing with just the sky above and the city below. He dragged the gangster out and brought him to the edge of the clearing. In the night, all they could see was a dark abyss below and the lights of the city, the spires of downtown LA. I ask you answer. If you lie, you end up at the bottom of Bobcat's dinner. Kozlov's eyes glinted in the dark, but he didn't answer. He nodded his head furiously when Zeb raised his gun. Forty-five minutes later Kozlov stood breathing harshly, shivering in the cold. Zeb ignored him and looked over the city, going through the man's replies in his mind. The Saudi minister was just another high-profile customer. The Venezuelan minister had threatened to expose his drug-running business unless he got free favors. So did Kozlov have the Venezuelan killed? Kozlov had vehemently denied killing either of the ministers. Some of his drug supplies came from Venezuela, but that country wasn't his only source. If he wanted the man killed, why would he do so in the US? The Saudi minister was no more than a patron of his agency. He didn't recognize the assassin from Zeb's description. He had enough of his own, many of them ex spetsnaz who would run rings around whoever Zeb was referring to. Zeb looked at the Russian a broken man, his pride stripped and believed him. Kozlov would have exposed his entire business if Zeb had asked him. Kozlov had inherited his uncle's gang and had grown up surrounded by power. He was a smart businessman, knew when to use violence and didn't hesitate to wield that tool, but he hadn't had to claw his way up the way his uncle had. Sure he had been reared in the streets of Moscow, but that was a lifetime and a continent away. Now as with many men, the trappings of wealth and importance were what made him. Don't underestimate him. Just because he's broken doesn't mean he's any less dangerous. The steel showed when Zeb shoved Kozlov outside his mansion in Malibu. The Russian looked back at Zeb with hooded eyes. You're a dead man. Heard that. Many times. Zeb waved at him and drove away in the darkness. He headed back into the city, to their outfitter in Culver City, where he exchanged the Durango for a black Ford expedition and checked into another hotel in Los Angeles. Kozlov will be hunting me. So will the 38th Street. Maybe the assassin too. Kozlov kept quiet as a physician injected him and taped his injuries, and when he had left, his fury broke. Fifteen of you in the club and not one of you could stop that man? He shouted at Gus, and in a sudden fit went and slapped the man. Hard slaps that brought Gus to his knees. Two men rushed to restrain Kozlov and drag him back. And you? You are Spetsnaz, you said. The best in the world. You did nothing when he dragged me away. Kozlov spat at them. He flung their hands away, ignored their protestations, hurled a jug of water at a wall, overturned a glass table, and stood heaving when the last shard crashed down. Find him. Bring him to me. He ordered and dismissed them. He headed to his bathroom and felt his face gingerly. His jaws would remain swollen for several days, his teeth would need refitting, the bruises over his eyes would turn black. 
He didn't hurt me that much. I've inflicted more pain on others. It's the way he did it. His eyes. He didn't even say who he was. Kozlov shivered and glanced quickly behind him, even though he knew he was alone. He shamed me. He yelped in surprise when a voice spoke suddenly. Kozlov? I know you're there. He froze for a second. The room was empty. He was all alone. But that voice? He dived at his bed, hurled pillows across and uncovered the phone. He stared at it while the man spoke. I know what's going through your mind. Scrub that thought. You won't find me. You'd better not find me. Kozlov waited, but the man hung up. Kozlov fingered the phone gingerly. It was one of those early generation phones, long before big screens and fancy menus had made their appearance. How did he place it in my bedroom? How did he know what I was thinking? Kozlov pulled his robe closer and shivered, though the AC was at full blast. He yelled at his men, flung the phone at them, and ordered a search of the house. The house was empty but for them. The sun was streaming through the thick curtains when he woke up the next day. He stumbled out of bed and shoved the curtains open and took in the city. The view normally filled him with pride, today it just made him nauseous. He made his way to the bathroom and a hot shower calmed him and brought his rage back. He made his way downstairs where a maid laid out his breakfast silently. He had just picked up the day's newspaper when the voice spoke again and ruined his day. Kozlov, I know you're feeling invincible again. You aren't. The phone was buried under a couch. Another round of screaming at his men didn't calm Kozlov. He rushed through his breakfast and heaved a sigh of relief when he parked his backside on the plush leather of his limo. The vehicle wended its way from Malibu to downtown, a drive that the Russian normally enjoyed as he watched the peasants on the other side of the glass toil away. The voice spoke again. Kozlov, forget yesterday. You'll live longer. This time the phone was between the join of the rear bench seats. Kozlov looked at the phone for a long time. Another anonymous, old model. He took the advice. Chapter 19 The assassin didn't know that his apartment in Florida was bugged. He swept the apartment twice a day, used secure encrypted phones, and bounced his calls across hundreds of servers. He used voice over internet protocols for his calls, but his security setup couldn't detect the bug. It wasn't that his security had a flaw. The bug used by the FBI was a military-utilized device that just a handful of agencies knew about. It was still in the design stages. The FBI had managed to get prototypes from the Defense Intelligence Agency and had successfully used the bugs to bring down a couple of drug cartels. The FBI wasn't hunting the assassin. They were after Russian gangsters who were known to live in the same block. They didn't know which apartments exactly, and hence they had blanketed the entire block with bugs. They sucked calls, messages and where possible even emails from the building like a giant magnet, and a daily dump got sent to Langley for analysis. This had been going for more than a month before the assassin returned from Dallas. His call to Wasserman got packed into the daily download that winged its way to a board analyst in Langley, who ran a keyword search, got nothing, and logged the file in a growing database. The log got shared with multiple agencies in the country, and also with a particular supercomputer, on Columbus Avenue in New York. Werner was bored. If it could yawn, it would have. Its master broker and mistresses, the twins, hadn't given it anything challenging in a long while. The search stuff they gave, it could do in its deepest sleep. It didn't even need a fraction of the RAM it had for that kind of work. Correlating searches with macro-environmental data, such as political events, accidents, was a bit more interesting, but again, not very challenging. It blinked a light lazily when the file came in from Langley. It threw the file in a special folder, organized it automatically, and started scanning it with half a mind. The other half of its mind played chess with another supercomputer on another continent. It came across Nigeria and turned a bit more of its RAM toward the file. Then came oil and minister in two weeks. 
It fired off a code to the other supercomputer that would have read, I'll whoop your ass later if humans could read it, and turned its attention to the file. It fired off several related programs, and when it had enough data from which to draw conclusions, it sent messages to several phones. Zeb briefed Claire early in the morning. This isn't the escort agency's doing. Kozlov has the resources to organize these kills, but it's not him. He's not related to Wasserman. This is related to oil in some way, he insisted. Agreed, but how? The faintest trace of frustration crept into Claire's voice. None of the intelligence agencies have come up with any credible threats. Who have the Saudis appointed? Someone who wasn't even on our radar. The king picked someone else at the last minute, not the candidate we were hoping. A royal obviously, but this guy isn't the man we wanted. He isn't a friend of ours. She read his silence and headed him off. That was the first thing we looked at. We don't think his appointment connected to the killing. It's more likely down to the usual royal palace politics. We are less dependent on them now in any case, aren't we? Yes, our domestic oil and gas production has increased substantially, and in fact we are a bigger producer than the Saudis. This has changed our relationship with our Middle Eastern allies, not substantially, but visibly. They thrashed it back and forth for a few more minutes but reached no conclusion. You'll be heading to Nigeria? Claire asked him. She was referring to the message Werner had fired at them, after analyzing the file from Langley. Yeah. Broker hasn't had any luck with tracing Wasserman or any of those other men. They were using good covers and now they've just disappeared. Wasserman's voice print is in no database. You said they were former service personnel. Could they have come out of some other deep black unit in some other country? That's what we believe, but no agency has come forward so far. The assassin is all we have for now. Zeb didn't know it at the time, but that wasn't all they had. The envelope had been lying in Connor Balthazar's filing cabinet in New York for months. Connor was an award-winning journalist with the New York Times and had been based in London for more than a year. He had just returned to his home city to run the Global Features desk when he came across the file. He recognized the handwriting on the envelope, a thick brown colored one, large enough to contain several A5 sheets, and frowned. Lori, why didn't this come to me in London? He waved the envelope at his assistant. She pushed her glasses higher up on her nose, came to his office, and inspected it. Oh yeah. I remember this. I opened it, and what was inside didn't make sense. I figured it was sent mistakenly. She held a finger up warningly. Besides, you know your own rule on paper. Yeah, yeah, Connor sighed and opened the envelope and extracted the sheets. He hated paper. He didn't get why people still handwrote, still sent out cards. Computers and word processing software and emails were invented for a reason. He had made a rule when he joined the newspaper. Anything that wasn't on computer wasn't something he was interested in. He looked at the sheaf of sheets, about twenty of them, and the frown plowed a furrow on his forehead. They were printed sheets but what was on them made no sense. There were sentences, words, in a language unknown to him. He sighed and tossed the envelope back and went about tidying the rest of his desk. It was late evening by the time he had finished. The office was empty, Laurie had left a long time back, and the city was glowing with lights that painted his window. The envelope drew his attention before he left, and he drew it out again and studied the papers. Nope, they didn't make any more sense this time either. Why had Elena sent these to him? Were they sent by mistake? Had she meant to send something else? He checked his emails again. There was nothing from her. He had known Elena Petrova very well. She was not only a journalist he respected, they were good friends. They had a friendly rivalry and had silly bets on who outscooped the other. He had heard about her savage death when in London and had grieved silently. The newspaper world lost one hell of a lady when she died. I wonder if they found who killed her. 
he turned on his monitor, typed in a search, and read. The third article caught his attention, a name. Zeb Carter. He ran his fingers through his unruly hair, opened the article, and was grinning by the time he'd finished reading it. He knew Zeb Carter, and owed him a debt he wouldn't ever be able to repay. Several years back, a bunch of mercenaries had grabbed Connor's wife and kid, and held them hostage to get him to drop a story he was pursuing on their sponsor. It was Zeb who had rescued his family. Since then the two had become closer, and while Connor knew his friend worked for some super-secret government agency, he never pressed for inside information. He read the rest of the article and scanned through several others. Alina's killers hadn't been found. There was no further mention of his friend. I wonder if he'll be interested in these. He went to the scanner and converted the sheets to electronic format, zipped them up and sent them to Zeb and Broker. The news from Colorado didn't make headlines, there was no reason to. The big one shut down operations and ceased fracking. Its new owners released a bland statement that they had run out of funds and were seeking fresh injections of capital before they would resume business. In the grand scheme of things, the big one was a non-entity, and its quiet shutting down was hardly noticed. No one commented on the millions of barrels of gas and oil still within its deposits. The two other acquisitions went unnoticed as well. Two law firms representing foreign investors quietly acquired two fracking companies, one in Arizona and one in Texas. Both companies were substantially bigger than the big one, with larger reserves than the Colorado companies. Those in the industry shrugged. Acquisitions happened in the business. They went back to drilling. The new Saudi oil minister made a comment, and this made news. At a conference, he declared that the oil beneath their ground should be used primarily for their brothers in various countries. His comment caused ripples initially, and then waves. Oil prices spiked momentarily. Reporters asked him if the kingdom would now sell oil only to Muslim countries. He declined to comment. The royal palace issued a statement that this was a casual comment taken out of context, and their position had not changed. Everyone forgot the comment soon enough, and the news channels reverted to the usual coverage of Islamic terrorists, natural disasters and politics. The assassin was in Abuja, the capital of Nigeria, a week later. He had flown out of Florida using yet another cover, a journalist this time, and his bulbous nose attracted attention. That was fine. The prosthetic nose would disappear the moment he checked into a hotel. The assassin used prosthetics wherever he was required to produce an identity, but went bereft of disguises when on a kill. Years back, a prosthetic chin had come off when he was in the midst of a kill, and the brief loss of concentration had nearly cost his life. Abuja was a city of nearly a million people and was named the country's capital a couple of decades back, taking over from Lagos. It was centrally located in the country and was chosen to be the capital to convey unity and neutrality to the many ethnic and religious groups in the country. The assassin hired a car at the airport and joined the traffic heading away from Namdi Azakiwa International Airport. The tarmac shimmered under the relentless sun, and the cars ahead of him seemed to float on heat waves. The assassin punched in the coordinates to the Transcorp Hilton Hotel in the Maitama district, and the next day, he started tailing the minister. Wasserman, who now had started contacting him directly, bypassing the cutout, had sent him a detailed file on the minister and the assassin knew how the man would die. It would be due to the excessive consumption of alcohol. The minister liked his drinks, and every Saturday he hit a few select bars in a few hotels. He drove back to his residence when he had his fill. Saturdays were the only days the oil minister drove on his own, followed by his bodyguard in a separate vehicle. On all other days, his personal bodyguard was his chauffeur. The dossier mentioned which hotels and bars the minister visited, the Hilton was one of them. The dossier briefed him on the bodyguard, a retired police officer whose best days were behind him, a man with average shooting skills. He would be no threat to the assassin. The minister had been involved in a couple of accidents when drunk, and in one of those, a pedestrian had been killed. 
Those accidents had been hushed, the victim's family had been paid off, but the minister hadn't learned his lesson. The assassin's challenge was in getting close to the minister. The bodyguard accompanied the minister to every bar and nursed a drink patiently while the official went through several. He was usually surrounded by cronies and hangers-on or by other patrons who wanted to be seen with the politician. Sometimes the minister went for a swim in the Hilton before hitting the bar. That can be an option. The assassin replaced his vehicle with an old but serviceable Ford van that he bought off a dealer. He went to an industrial park and got a few panels painted, one with the signage of an electrical contractor, another with the logo of the Federal Roads Maintenance Agency, and a third that advertised an office supplies company. The panels could be attached easily to the sides of the van. He bought several fake number plates and stowed all of them away in the rear of the van. The first few days of the surveillance were boredom-inducing, but the assassin was well-trained and well-experienced. He knew how to manage his time and concentration. There was one time when the bodyguard had shuffled slowly and looked hard at his van that was parked a couple of hundred meters away from the minister's home in the Asakoro district. The assassin hunched lower, looked down at the notepad in his hand, and moved his lips to speak in the phone in his other hand. Just another hard-working contractor. The bodyguard moved away, and presently the minister's white Mercedes emerged and drew away. All the names and numbers on the side panels were legitimate businesses. The numbers would lead to a calling service manned by a Nigerian woman who would take any inquiry and politely reply that her boss would get back. Preparation made all the difference. The first Saturday that the assassin was in the country, the minister hit the Hilton. He swam a few lengths first in the hotel's swimming pool under the watchful gaze of the bodyguard. The bodyguard sat outside the changing room and when the politician emerged, the two went to the bar. They were at the bar till 11 in the night and then the minister drove the Mercedes while the bodyguard followed in a jeep. Shower cubicle, changing room, bar, crowded lobby, Mercedes. Back in his room, the assassin circled the words, thought long and hard and when he had made his decision, turned his attention to the syringe beside him. It was a specially designed one that fit between the fingers of his hand. It was less than two inches long, slightly larger in diameter than a drinking straw, and the plunger was operated by the palm, not by the thumb. It had just three parts, each of which could be disguised as a straw, a safety pin and a child's toy individually. The assassin could jab it in and out in less than two seconds and walk away with his hand seemingly empty, while the victim looked around for the bee that had stung him. The assassin practiced in the Hilton on unsuspecting guests. He walked close to a crowd of tourists, brushed past one, mumbled an apology and walked away. Brush. Sting. Disappear. He practiced with the bodyguard looking on, on the second Saturday. The bodyguard's black eyes were on him, his head tilted back to drink from his mug of beer, when the assassin with a different nose and chin stung a hotel guest. The guest was deep in conversation and slapped his thigh in irritation only when the assassin was 10 meters away. Next Saturday. The day dawned sunny and bright, the heat rising off the sidewalks in slow lazy waves. The assassin's getaway vehicle was ready. His escape route was ready. Once he stung the minister, he would drive away in a Toyota to Kano, a city five hours away, and there he would catch his first getaway flight. The minister stayed cooped in his residence all day that Saturday, while streams of visitors met him. Police cars hung around the residence, but no cops gave the assassin's van the hard eye. Saturday was when the party's faithful met the minister, when bribes were negotiated and favors granted. Similar such discussions took place in several other ministerial residences. The assassin broke open a paper bag and lunched on rations that were high on energy and carbs. He drank swigs of water from a plastic bottle, wiped his mouth and drew the notepad, and looked busy. The heat peaked around 3 p.m., and then the waves started reducing, the shadows started growing longer. The comings and goings didn't diminish. If anything, more people came to see the minister as they took advantage of the departing sun. The bodyguard appeared, slow and plodding, with no apparent purpose in mind. 
He looked left, looked right, a bored expression on his face and crossed the road. His feet seemed to sink into the blacktop due to his weight. He headed to a jeep, a police vehicle, and much waving and gesticulating ensued. A burly cop got out, and the jeep eased visibly. The cop was surly, but he followed the bodyguard, and when he reached the gates, he drew out a whistle and blew on it. Nothing happened for a few moments, then the first visitor straggled out, another joined him, and the thin trickle soon turned into a stream. It was time for the minister to socialize in the bars of Abuja. A full 45 minutes later, the last of the visitors had left, the police vehicles had cleared out. A flunky ran out and pushed open the gates wider and the Mercedes nosed out, turned slowly and drove away. A red light flashed on top of the minister's car, a sign to the traffic that it had to melt and give way to the hallowed persona inside. The bodyguard's jeep followed. The assassin fell in behind, keeping several vehicles in between. He wasn't worried about being noticed. The van sported a new color, gray, new panels, this time advertising an internet business that sold groceries and had new plates. He looked different. The jowls had gone and were replaced by a beard. The dark hair had a silver streak. The nose was wider, the ears were pointed. The minister first hit the Sheridan Hotel in the Woost district and downed a couple of beers after backslapping fellow politicians and wealthy donors. He cracked jokes, slapped the behinds of waitresses and spread bonhomie and cheer. The country was in good hands as long as he was minister. He left 90 minutes later and headed to the Hilton. The minister lumbered out of his car, waved away the oncoming hotel attendants, straightened and moved regally inside. A few flashbulbs lit and when a frown broke out, a guard remonstrated the photographers. The bodyguard followed, waved at the Mercedes and a valet leapt inside and drove it away. The minister huffed to the gym and rotated his arms and swung his upper body this way and that way. When he figured he had burned enough calories, he wrapped himself in a fluffy towel and changed into swimming trunks and eased his girth into the pool. The water sloshed and rippled out when the minister started swimming determinedly. Half an hour of swimming and he was out and into the shower rooms. A change of clothes later, the minister headed to the bar, straight as a heat-seeking missile. The first whiskey went down neat. He threw his head back and roared in appreciation as a fawning public looked on. Another whiskey followed, and then the serious business of gossip and commenting on women followed. The assassin took his position unobtrusively, just one guest among the many milling about. His eyes moved ceaselessly, pinned the bodyguard down in the lobby, located and placed the other hotel staff. A policeman patrolled the lobby lazily. He was no threat. Three hours later, the minister lurched and his left hand shot out. His eyebrows rose when he saw the time and he made an exclamation. People laughed and patted his back when he turned and made his way out of the bar. Check. That was for mortals. Ministers never paid. He headed straight to the glass exit. The assassin was moving the moment the minister had straightened. He fell in behind a large family and expertly crowded them closer to the minister. He spotted the bodyguard in the corner of his eye, he was to the assassin's left and behind, talking to someone else. The assassin skirted the family, murmured an apology, and went to the head of the bunch. Now five feet behind the minister's portly build. The syringe fell out of his cuff and slid smoothly between the fingers of his left hand, his palm curved over the plunger. Three feet now. His left leg shot out, his right leg followed, his left hand swung out just that little bit more, his right hand followed. Two feet. He could hear the minister's wheezing, could see the small hairs on the back of his neck, the sweat coating the dark skin, making it shine under the lobby's lights. Another left hand swing. Press plunger. Thrust needle in bottom. Swing away in long steps. Out of hotel. Left leg shot out. Left hand swung in a lazy arc. Only an eagle eye would have spotted the tip of something else between his fingers. Up and forward. Closer to the fabric on the behind. A few centimeters away. Palm depressing slowly. 
He felt the brush of air first, and then a hand shot out and grasped his left wrist. He didn't think. He didn't analyze. Training and reaction took over. The assassin spun smoothly even before the grip around his wrist had tightened, grabbed a woman from the family behind him, and flung her toward the man who had accosted him. The grip loosened, the woman exclaimed sharply, the grip fell away, and then the assassin was striding, breaking into a run. Dimly he thought he recognized the man who had stopped him, but now escape was all that mattered. The glass doors ahead were his universe. He ran faster, closer to freedom. The hand on his shoulder had barely settled when he ducked and twisted, and aimed a punch at whoever was behind him. The punch landed in thin air. His hand was lazily clasped and a lock tightened. He recognized the martial arts grip, applied a counterlock, got his hand free, turned to run, felt the seeking hands clasp his elbow, lose their grip, slide down his wrist and fall away. Then he was away, sprinting this time, the doors opening magically. Shouts rang out behind him, but no one was even close. He leapt over a photographer, shoved past women with shopping bags, ran down the slanting driveway. Footsteps pounded behind him but not close. On a glass front he saw a couple of people give chase from behind, but no guns appeared. Why should they? He had done nothing wrong. He reached the bottom of the drive, hurried through parked vehicles, ducked swiftly behind an SUV, removed the prosthetics on his face and threw them under the vehicle. He ripped the long sleeves off his shirt, they came away easily. They were designed to transform the full sleeve shirt into half sleeves in a second. The sleeves went beneath another car. The assassin straightened. One quick glance behind. The two men chasing were looking carefully between various parked vehicles. The assassin crossed the road, opened his van casually, and swung inside. He waited for a truck to pass and fell behind it. Now his lizard brain receded and thinking brain took over. The man who grasped me the first time was the bodyguard. Maybe the second time too. Why didn't he raise the alarm if he suspected something? He looked in the mirrors, no car was in pursuit. He reached out in his backpack and turned on an instrument. It didn't beep. His car was clean, no tracking devices. He breathed easier. The minister had gotten away, but the first order was to hole up somewhere, and then decide whether he should have another go. He reached a stoplight, waited patiently, and when it changed, eased away smoothly. He drove at a steady pace, eased into a lane that would take him to the Guarampa district, about 12 miles from where he was. There he would check into. The first heave hit him, almost doubled him over. Chapter 20 he retched dryly, straightened and controlled the vehicle's wobble. What was that? He had never been sick. The second was worse, and the vehicle careened over the pavement, came off it, and continued rolling drunkenly. A third followed, a fourth. The assassin lost count. His face was red, sweat ran down it like a flood, his hair was matted, and his breath came out in ragged gasps. The one hand on the wheel fell off and the vehicle lurched to the right, climbed on the pavement and stalled. The assassin reached out blindly, pushed open the door and let the cool air bathe him. It didn't help. Another intense dry heave hit him and he fell out of the vehicle and landed on hard concrete. He reached out to hold something, anything to raise himself to escape, to heed the messages the lizard brain was pumping out furiously. His body rejected the messages, the dry heaves had drowned out all stimuli. A particularly bad heave had the assassin gasping, and he lay curled in a fetal position. A shoe appeared in front of his eye. He stared at it blankly, and then another appeared. He turned his head slowly, and the night sky swam into his vision, the side of the van, and then a figure appeared. The assassin blinked slowly as if in a drunken stupor, and curled again as his body tightened in a spasm. The figure waved in the air, moved and seemed to shrink and become leaner and narrower. Its face seemed to change, the cheeks seemed to hollow out. His lizard brain screamed one last message before he lost consciousness. The bodyguard. 
Zeb had left for Nigeria the day of his call with Claire. He had worked the phones when in the air, and simultaneously, Claire and Broker had alerted the Nigerian authorities about a possible attack on the minister. A plan was made, a trap to get the assassin. It was surprisingly easy to execute once Zeb looked at the bodyguard and sized him up. Same height, same shoulder size, just broader. The broader part had been easy to handle. Two Kevlar vests underneath his clothing did the trick. The slow gait was easy to mimic. Prosthetics changed his face and the old bodyguard went on vacation and Zeb took over. He got the state security service to plaster all the hotels with tiny cameras and flood all their exits and their approaches with security cameras that fed into a central server. The server talked to Werner, in addition to the SS's own network. The cameras were a gift from the United States government to their close friends, the Nigerian government. The gift was gratefully accepted, and all help was extended. Zeb posing as the bodyguard, spotted the assassin on the first Saturday, caught his image via a camera hidden into an epaulette sewn on his outerwear. Werner looked at the image, measured the distance between the eyes, between the ears, two parameter that could not be changed whatever surgery or disguise was undertaken, and also looked at the gait, posture and hundreds of small parameters. It compared those with the videos from Saudi Arabia and came back with, yeah, that's him. Zeb didn't want to capture the assassin in a public space, he didn't know how the man would be armed, how he would react. He had gone for the debilitating effect of the DHC. The dry heave chemical, cunningly acronymed as the DHC, produced convulsions in the body within minutes of it being applied to the skin. It was harmless, but the convulsions lasted for 12 hours and brought down a man without the need to use force. The glide of his grasping hand from the assassin's elbow to his wrist had enabled him to apply the chemical to his hand. DHC had then taken over and had done its job. Zeb got caught in a battle of politics. The Nigerians wanted to interrogate the assassin and try him in their country. Zeb wanted to take him back to the States, where, eventually, he would be handed over to the FBI. The problem was, the Nigerian police had accompanied Zeb and had carted him off to a safe house. They tossed out no problem whenever Zeb spoke to them. The assassin was lethal. They had to be careful. No problem. He had to be searched. No problem. Zeb would escort him to the US. No chance. Zeb went in search of someone in authority and came across an officious inspector who stood with his arms akimbo and watched his men pick the killer up and load him in the back of a van. The officer ignored Zeb for a while and finally turned a frosty stare on him. You're a guest sir in our country, but this man is our prisoner. Zeb gave up, made calls that sparked off a series of heated discussions between the police officers and various authorities. A compromise was reached. The assassin would be in a safe house to lessen the possibility of leaks, and when he was conscious, the Nigerians would interrogate him in Zeb's presence. Zeb would then take him back to the States. Zeb made another request that made the Inspector General of Police, Jimmy Akinlade, raise his eyebrows. You want the media to broadcast that the minister was killed? Nope. Just that there was a major incident involving the minister, and details are still unknown. Akinlade, the head of the police force in the country, twirled his handlebar mustache while he thought about the request. Why? If the killer's sponsors know he has been captured, they might go to ground. Akinlade turned around and issued an order to his aide. Zeb caught something about boiling the media boss's asses in oil if any news leaked out. It'll be done, Akinlade turned back and said heavily. It's not easy what you ask but we'll do it. It's as easy as making a call. Media independence is a very elastic concept here. Zeb kept a straight face and thanked Akinlade. He made a couple more requests to which the chief had no objections. The assassin had several phones and a computer in a backpack in his getaway vehicle. Zeb cloned the phones, made a copy of the hard disk and handed back the rucksack to the police. He watched them drive away the assassin with misgiving. They haven't ever had someone like the killer. 
The safe house was heavily patrolled when Zeb arrived the next day. It was in the Woos district and from the outside, looked like any other residence on the dusty street. It was painted white to keep out the heat, had red tiles and a wrought iron gate separated street from drive. The gate had a couple of policemen standing guard who sprang to attention when Zeb's vehicle rolled inside. The outside of the house had more policemen in plain clothes, one of whom knocked the door in a code and ushered Zeb inside. The inside was not like any other residence. The hallway led to a living room, but there the similarity to any home stopped. A steel fence rose from floor to ceiling, in the middle of the living room, behind which a man sat at a desk and manned a series of monitors. The house had four cells, each with a solid steel door with a thick glass window, and all four cells lay behind a wall that separated the man with the monitors. We have no other prisoners, the man with the monitors, Jonathan Kajang explained. He pointed to an imposing door, painted in green. That door, electronically controlled, is the only way into the cells. There are two guards behind it who guard the four cells, but we don't really need them. The cameras cover every inch of the cells, and the central corridor. The house has two and a half feet concrete walls on the outside, and only a tank's shell can penetrate it. Zeb glanced at the monitors, saw the two guards behind the door, the assassin lying in his cell. He's awake, his retching stopped at night. He woke at six in the morning, but after freshening up, he lay on his cot and hasn't moved since. These computers are connected to your network? Kajang beamed. Yes, sir. We have the most secure network in the country. The images are stored in a central computer, and the entire safe house can be monitored and controlled remotely. The assassin lay motionless on his bed and could have been sleeping, but for the slow blink of his eyes and the thousand-yard stare in his eyes. I want to see him, Zeb said abruptly. Something's up. Don't know what. Kajang demurred. The inspector general would arrive shortly, and Zeb could accompany him. He broke when Zeb kept looking at him and punched a couple of keys, swung the green door open and shut it behind Zeb. Just look at the cameras when you're done. Zeb looked left and then right. One guard was standing propped against the wall at the far end, looking into an empty cell, the other was similarly posed at the other end. Zeb walked past the first empty cell, its door was wide open and its inside was dark. He walked past the second cell, had just crossed the separating wall when he felt it. The faintest movement in the air. He hurled himself back, his left hand dipped down and his benchmade flashed and cut through the rudimentary garrote that was slipping down and around his neck. He twisted and ducked just in time to avoid the blur of the assassin's fist. The assassin rained a flurry of strikes, his hands scything through the air, reaching for Zeb's vital organs. Zeb fell back, parrying, blocking, thrusting in return. The killer applied a lock, Zeb broke it smoothly, countered, met air where the assassin had been. A low sweeping blow searched for his kidneys, Zeb turned just in time and caught it high on his chest. It struck like a pile driver, but Zeb absorbed it, let it ripple through him, spread through his body, lessening its impact. A leg whirled, sought to kick his feet from under him, Zeb thrust it aside and went on the attack. Eagle strike, parried. Hammer blow, countered. Elbow strike, grabbed and twisted and turned against him. The two men fell back, breathing easily, and then the killer launched himself, coming in low, his hand going for the abdomen. Zeb blocked the strike, saw the feint too late, rocked back and fell to the floor when a wicked blow caught him on the temple. He slithered back rapidly, avoided the stamping feet, rose to his feet, fied away a groin kick. Reached out. There. The killer's right hand had swung out too wide, giving Zeb the tiniest opening. He caught the wrist in a lock, bent it back, throwing his weight. The left hand reached out in a punch, Zeb countered with a leg strike, but kept hold of the wrist. The assassin's eyes opened wide for the first time, and he hammered a blow against Zeb's ribs. Zeb rolled with the punch, bent back the wrist some more, twisted the arm around its shoulder, tightened the lock. Now! He turned the killer using the bent arm as lever, smashed his forehead against the wall, pulled him back for another crushing blow, when the green door opened. Kajang entered first, followed by a kinlaid, both gaping at the spectacle in front of them. Zeb's grip loosened momentarily at the disturbance. 
That was enough for the killer, who lashed out with his left elbow, caught Zeb in the chin. The killer slipped out like an eel, whirled around in a flying kick that Zeb evaded just in time. By the time he had recovered, the killer had flown across the few feet separating him from the policeman, had punched Kajang in a killing blow. He bent swiftly, drew Kajang's gun, its barrel rose, his finger tightened. Zeb threw himself to the ground, and the first bullet flew over him. His glock appeared in his hand as if spring-loaded, eye to sight, sight to killer, an invisible line on which death walked. He squeezed before the killer could, and the assassin's face disappeared in a red mist. The aftermath took two days to clear up. A kinlaid ordered a lockdown on the safe house, in a thorough investigation into how the killer had breached it. Zeb could have told him that the assassin had someone on the outside, a hacker probably, who had breached the network and had inserted images of the patrolling guards and the assassin in an endless loop. Kajang would survive, though it would be a long recovery. He was lucky that the killer's blow had lacked power, or else he would have been a very dead policeman. Akinlaid invited Zeb to his office the second day, and under a lazily turning fan in a high ceiling room, he looked curiously at Zeb. Mr. Carter, you're not a policeman, are you? Your government could have sent people from the FBI or other agencies, but instead they sent you. Just who are you? I am a liaison between the various agencies. I also do some policing, sir, Zeb smiled. His cover as a security consultant wouldn't work here. Akinlaid grunted in disbelief, but didn't pursue the matter. The calls he had received clearly indicated Zeb had clout, and he didn't wish to antagonize the man in front of him. All those cameras? We can keep them. Of course. That was the deal we had. The inspector general thawed for the first time. Resources were always in short supply, and any largesse would help his department. He revealed what his investigation had found. The garrote had come from a specially designed lining on the killer's shirt. His combat trousers had been searched when he had been apprehended, but the policeman had overlooked the plastic lockpicks sewn into the bottom. The picks were soft and pliable and bent under searching fingers and hence had escaped detection. Computer experts were looking into the network for traces of intrusion, but they reluctantly agreed that the cameras and the database had been compromised. How did you know, Mr. Carter? It was a hunch. The killer had similarly infiltrated a hotel system in Dallas, and when Kajang told me that the safe house was linked to your central network, his voice trailed. It was more than a hunch. The beast had stirred, and the uneasy feeling that was his radar had grown the moment he had entered the safe house. He had kept his game face on, however, since he didn't know whether any of Akinlaid's men had been bought off. You could have asked the guards to go through. Why you? Zeb met his eyes. Your men have never come across a killer like him. Even now, we don't know his identity. Sending your men in would have killed them. Thank you, Inspector General Jimmy Akinlaid told him simply, and the ice melted. Akinlaid personally accompanied Zeb to see him off at the airport, and after assisting him through the formalities, his presence had ensured there weren't many, he stood in his full dress uniform and drew out his card and wrote his number on it. Anything you need, anytime. The leer circled Abuja once and then grew smaller and merged into the brown and green of the land. Next step, the middleman. Broker had identified the cutout through the killer's hard disk. Chapter 21 Wasserman knew the assassin had failed. He wasn't fooled by the bland statement issued by the Nigerian news agencies, that a minister had been attacked in a hotel on Abuja, and that terrorism was suspected. He turned down the volume on his supersized TV, and paid little attention to the flickering images on the screen. The inspector general of police came on screen and gave interviews, meaningless sound bites that had no substance. If they've captured the assassin, why aren't they mentioning it? Unless. He got his encrypted phone and made a call to his contact in the energy ministry in Nigeria, a man ranking high enough to know everything. What he learned filled him with unease. The minister was alive and well, 
but a man had been captured and taken to an unknown location. Wasserman's planning had taken into account the assassin's capture. He and the principal had agreed that the killer would get captured eventually, and hence the first kill had been the Saudi minister. That was the one they wanted. Every other kill was a bonus. With the new Saudi and the soon-to-be-announced Venezuelan minister, the principal had enough firepower to achieve what he wanted. Wasserman would have shrugged off the killer's capture, but something nagged at him. He was one of the best in the world. He evaded detection in Saudi Arabia and got away in Dallas. How did a nothing police force like Nigeria's capture him? He made another call to a contact in the police force and this time what he heard chilled him. An American had worked with the police force to capture the killer. No, he didn't know who the man was, didn't have any names or photographs. His identity was deeply protected. The contact became nervous when Wasserman pressed him. I'll lose my job. Not just that, I'll be investigated. He whined. Wasserman hung up in disgust and turned back to his train of thought. Assume it was Carter. Assume the assassin is being interrogated. What can he reveal? Nothing. Another thought came to his mind. How did Carter track the killer down? He had only wild guesses for answers. Maybe Carter had planted some kind of tracker on the killer. But if that was so, why did he leave it so late to grab the killer? Wasserman gave up and headed to the shower, turned on the hot water and turned it off abruptly. The middleman. The cutout has some idea who I am. The killer knows the cutout. Wasserman played around with the thought for a long time, and finally a grim smile flickered on his lips. Now he knew where Carter would be. Zeb's Lear refueled at London, and while he was enjoying the island country's reign, the principal was entertaining the Saudi oil minister and the Venezuelan nominee. He arranged an elaborate buffet for them at his ranch in Virginia, and discussed the next steps with them. They listened silently, eagerly and promised to execute his orders. They were orders even though he couched them as requests. The principal had spent years and close to a billion in getting them in the right place. They shared the same ideology. He took them horseback riding and told them what would happen next, not in too much detail but enough for them to feel important. He congratulated the Saudi minister for the loose comment he had made, and asked him to continue making more such comments. The minister, who had discarded his traditional attire, beamed and sat straighter. The next day, he took them back to Washington, D.C., where he dined them at a very visible restaurant. The principal was well known, one of the most powerful political animals in the country, and it was expected of him to dine with select visiting dignitaries. He called Wasserman that night and for the first time heard of Carter's presence. He listened silently and then asked a single question. What risk does he pose? Nothing to you and the plan. It's me he'll be coming after. Wasserman told him. He didn't mention Carter's discovering Petrova's body. The principal didn't need to know the finer points. Deal with him. The principal ordered. The assassin used code to communicate with the cutout. The communication was infrequent, and when the two had to use email, they used global stock prices to hide their intent. Werner took less than half an hour to crack the code and present the few emails to the twins. It took a little longer to track the cutout's location. The cutout used an anonymous email service but Werner went to the host server, crept through all the security, sneered at the firewalls and encryption, and grabbed the cutout's identity. It unpacked the data and served the man's identity on an electronic platter to Megan. The cutout was a banker in Boston. Zeb checked his mail while in London, opened the file sent by Balthazar and frowned. The sheets with jumbled words didn't make any sense to him. They were in a language alien to him. For a moment he thought they were in Arabic, since they had the same cursive lettering, but he couldn't read the script, even though he was fluent in that language. He read the cover letter, and it looked like they hadn't made any sense to Connor either. He sent a text to Broker, and got a prompt reply. 
The twins had tasked Werner with breaking the code, if any. So far, the computer hadn't cracked it. Megan's text was commanding. You need to have backup. You promised no more Lone Ranger operations. You guys are backing me up, he replied. A string of curses came back in reply. He shut down his phone and leaned back to catch up on his sleep as the jet leapt into the sky to battle with the winds. Pierre Labelle worked in a private banking firm that catered to those whose net worth had multiples of seven zeros and who valued privacy. The firm served wealthy families, businessmen, Hollywood celebrities, and sports stars. Labelle also served a growing segment of the business, criminals who wanted to launder their money. Labelle was a partner in the bank, in fact it was his family that had founded it, and he alone dealt with the new segment. His junior partners dealt with all other clients. The only clients he didn't take on board were drug cartels, they posed a significant risk to his existence and weren't worth the heat they brought along. The assassin had approached him one day, through various references, and after a couple of years of managing the killer's money, Labelle worked out the man's business. It wasn't difficult for a man who had a keen interest in politics and world finance. The deposits of monies were always around someone prominent dying. Labelle didn't crave action, making money was action enough. But he liked delivering a better service to his clients, and of course, such service came at a cost. He knew how criminals worked, how they used middlemen, and he knew a major challenge for them was finding reliable, discreet middlemen. He had started offering such a service to some other such clients, and when he put forward his proposition to the assassin, he wasn't surprised at the acceptance. He was known for his discretion, and he offered the perfect guise. Who would suspect a balding, middle-aged banker of being a middleman to the most successful assassin in the world? LaBelle's offices were on Arch Street in Boston, in a bland high-rise that housed several other well-known investment banks and law firms. LaBelle Investments was in the middle of the tenants' list in the lobby. The office had ten staff members, most of whom had been with the firm for decades. Not one of them knew of Pierre Labelle's clients. Labelle met his criminal clients just once, when taking them on board. From then on, all communication was in coded and encrypted email. No phones were used, and the emails themselves were sent using free email service providers. Labelle lived on the seventh floor of an apartment building in the Back Bay neighborhood. His residence, a three bedroom apartment, had a wrought iron grill fronted balcony and had a rooftop swimming pool and a private gym. Labelle lived alone, he had never married, didn't have children, and while he dated, he wasn't in a serious relationship. Zeb read the docket on him as he mounted a watch on the banker two days later. Apartment blocks such as these were bad locations to mount a grab, they had cameras everywhere to give the illusion of security to their high net worth tenants. Zeb had discarded his prosthetic disguise and now wore a pair of shades and ball cap. The white cab he drove provided all the anonymity he needed. Cabs were invisible in any big city in the country. He mounted a camera on the driver's side sun visor and relayed the images back to New York. He was sure the images wouldn't lead him anywhere, but good tradecraft never hurt. He followed the banker for a few days, apartment to office and back again a routine that the cutouts stuck to without any break. He went out in the evenings for a quiet dinner and returned, the next day the routine continued. Zeb read as he kept watch, the banker had not once come under any suspicion, had never been investigated. The firm was well respected and had a small pool of wealthy clients whose identities were guarded zealously. Their clients were less discreet and a few celebrities had let the world know that LaBelle managed their money. Four days of surveillance yielded endless footage of the man entering and exiting his apartment. No lady friends, no call girls, nothing exciting. Zeb decided to ask him a few questions in his home. Thursday night, the city was preparing for the weekend, but for LaBelle, it was just another night. He turned in at 9 p.m., and an hour later, the lights went out in his apartment, right on schedule. Zeb lay back in his cab, a different color, in a different company this time, and kept watch, his mind in the gray fog that served him best during long surveillances. The metabolism was low, the clock ticked, and the beast remained alert for anything. 
He moved when the green numerals on the dash reached 3 a.m. His door opened and shut, a soft thump that wouldn't have heard beyond 10 feet. He crossed the street and made his way to the entrance. The revolving door swung and he entered the lobby. It was empty, during daytime a guard manned a desk, this time of the night, electronic protection was in place. He swiped a plastic card on the elevator bank. The software behind the elevators recognized the card broker had sent, and a door slid open. The seventh floor hallway was quiet, as it would be this time of the night. LaBelle's apartment was equally quiet, and after running his cable camera and thermal imager, Zeb swiped another electronic key and the door opened. It closed behind him and bathed him in darkness. Small foyer, three feet long that opened into a living room that had views of the city. Master bedroom to his left, two other bedrooms ahead of him. The living room led to the kitchen. A balcony wrapped the living room and the master bedroom from the outside. He checked out all the rooms before heading to the master bedroom, and it was then the beast growled. Too quiet. No refrigerator clicks. No snoring. The Glock slid silently in his hand, his body tensed in readiness, and he headed deeper into the master bedroom. Faint light from the balcony seeped into the room and revealed the shape on the bed. LaBelle was turned away from Zeb who swung round the bed and approached him. Too late. The banker's eyes were wide and unseeing, his throat slashed, his head lying on a growing pool of blood on the bed. His body was still warm. They're still here. Something skittered on the hardwood floor. Flashbang. Move. Time and space compressed, became a tunnel through which Zeb sped and crashed through the half-open balcony doors. He paused for a fraction and felt motion behind him. Two shadows in the room. Something flickered, he didn't turn to look. He leapt off the balcony, automatic reflexes kicked in and momentarily reduced weight and distributed it the way a 95-year-old man had taught him several years back. Something flew in the room behind him, seeking him even as white light and a wall of sound bathed it. Not a gun. He focused on his fall, air rushing past him silently, pavement far below becoming larger. He ignored the sixth-floor balcony, reached out a hand and grabbed the railing of the fifth-floor one, controlled the sudden whiplash to his body, but couldn't control the slam of his chest against the grill. He poised for a second, looked up, saw two shadows look down from LaBelle's apartment. One of them raised a hand and Zeb let go. This time he swung his body, for an instance he thought he had misjudged, and then he was falling, landing on the third-floor balcony, righting himself again and flying again. Second floor, then the first, a soft landing on the lawn. Rolling standing Glock back in hand. All quiet on the street. Lights had gone up in the apartment block as it awoke to investigate the flashbang. No cruisers yet. LaBelle's balcony was empty of shadows. Zeb holstered his gun considered going back and up via the stairs to come up on his pursuers from behind. He discarded the thought as swiftly as it had come. There might be more than two. They might outflank me. He headed to the sidewalk, skirted a drunk who had woken up and was staring at him, and then at the building. It's raining men, he mumbled thickly and took a swig from his bottle, his eyes fixed on the sky. Zeb went to the rows of vehicles, ducked behind the first one and using them as cover, crouched low, and ran to his cab. He slid into the passenger seat, slithered to the drivers, and reached back to his backpack and turned on a timer. They want me alive. He lowered himself below the window, the camera on the visor feeding to his phone, and waited. The two men who appeared on the street shortly were unrecognizable through the distance and in the dark of the street, but they were the only men who walked purposefully, scanned the street carefully before proceeding to their ride. They pulled out, Zeb fell behind them. There was enough traffic on the street now for him to merge in. He scanned behind, didn't see any threats. He followed them out of the city, on the I-93, city and urban habitats falling behind them. Neponset River Reservation came up, and they didn't slow down. A truck lined behind him, overtook him, its driver shaking his head slowly at Zeb's speed. The reservation fell behind, just asphalt, the night sky and the lights ahead and behind him. 
The highway branched to the left, the SUV veered and took the branch and disappeared behind the bend. Zeb took the curve and then it happened. A large pickup truck accelerated from behind, came around the curve, bore down on him swiftly and rammed into his cab without warning. The impact crumpled the rear, steel and carbon fiber buckling under the momentum and weight of the Ford truck. The wheel slid wildly in Zeb's hand as the truck kept coming, kept pushing him round the bend. Toward the SUV which was there, right at the edge of the turn. His windscreen filled with the SUV, he tried to control the cab, but it was too late. His hood went into the SUV, his windows shattered, metal screamed and howled and gave way, and then all was quiet. His engine died and steam rose and filled his vision, and through that a shape appeared, a man wearing a hood. His window shattered, and a gloved hand beckoned at him. Zeb struggled with his airbag in his door, but the hood made no move to help him. He kicked out savagely, and the door swung and he fell out. A pair of boots appeared in front of him, then another. He felt movement behind him. Three men. He levered off the concrete but fell back again when a gun swung and his world went black. Chapter 22 The masks were gone when cold water was thrown over Zeb and he came to. He blinked slowly, spat out water and lifted his head slowly. He took stock of himself, his feet were bound and his hands were cuffed behind his back. The three men were standing in front of him, looking at him impassively. One of them was bald, had broad shoulders and his knuckles were scarred. Another was short, his face pockmarked. The third man was Zeb's height, his eyes gray and cold, his silver busket catching the sole light in the room. Boxer and pockmark, Felix Domingo's buddies. The third is Stud Illander. Wasserman is behind the assassin too. He shook his head slowly, rolled over and tried to sit up. You think he's faking it? Boxer spoke from the side of his mouth. Only one way to find out, Pockmark's teeth shone as he swung his steel-toed boot back and let fly at Zeb's belly. Black spots swam in front of him as he doubled over and groaned. That sounded genuine enough, Boxer stopped Pockmark from another swing. Water him once more, Studlander ordered, and Boxer silently went to fill a bucket. Zeb coughed and spat when the pail emptied over him, rolled over his shoulder and tried to sit up. Boxer roughly hauled him upright and knelt in front of him. You remember the guy with the long hair? His eyes burned as he questioned his prisoner. Zeb struggled to stay upright, tried to separate his injuries and box them up, but the fog that saved him so many times failed to appear. In Casper. You cut him up? Boxer prompted when Zeb didn't reply. Pockmark crouched beside him. He died you asshole. He never recovered from what you did to him. He was our buddy, and now it's our turn to cut you up. Save it, Studdlander said impatiently. We need answers first. By the time I'm done with him, you'll get all the answers you want. He'll tell you who his crush was in high school. He'll tell you what his kids call him if he has any, Pockmark promised. The blade whispered in the air when he unsheathed it from a scabbard tied down low on his thigh. He waved it in front of Zeb, his teeth matching the glint on the steel. Kid. The beast stirred. I want three questions answered, and then you can do what you wish with him, Studdlander replied coldly. How much does he know? Who else knows? Who's behind him? You heard that asshole? The knife nudged Zeb's chin. Jace is very businesslike. He goes in, does the job, and comes out. Boxer, Felix and I are different. We enjoy our job. We like to milk it, the way we did to that bitch. She had some tits, didn't she, Boxer? Yeah, and she was tight too. Boxer bunched Zeb's shirt and tore it off his shoulders. Pockmark drew a line down Zeb's left shoulder and watched rapidly as it became red and a thin stream of blood appeared. You're lucky we're not into men, cause cutting always gives us woodies. The bitch entertained us for hours. The beast shook itself, stood swaying, taking in everything. The knife crossed his chest and another line of blood appeared. You think you're tough, Carter? Pockmark crooned. When I'm through with you, you'll be screaming and praying for death. I wonder if he and the bitch were tight? 
maybe that's why he's got such a hard on. Nah, she didn't have any boyfriends. Get on with it. Luke will be checking in soon. Stuttelander swung away impatiently and peered outside. They were in a cabin deep in the woods in the Blue Hills Reservoir. The cabin was just a single room, a sink and a tap at one end over which there was a rough shelf stocked with cans of food. It was a rest place for hikers and trekkers who kept the cabin stocked for their fellow travelers. Zeb gasped sharply and gritted his teeth when the knife sank deep in his shoulder. Pockmark loomed over him, humming softly as he went to work making light cuts on Zeb's upper body, the occasional deep jab. Careful you'll reach his vitals, Boxer warned him. No chance. I can keep going all night. Can he? Zeb fell back in agony as the blade sank into the same wound. Blood was flowing freely now, patterning the wooden floor in shades of red and brown. The cabin was silent but for his harsh breathing and pockmarked soft crooning. The beast surged through him, filled him with blackness preparing itself. The wounds were shallow for now. Even the piercing hadn't sunk as deep as he had made it out to be. But that wouldn't last for long. The cuts would be deeper, the interrogation would become more aggressive. He gasped loudly, writhed and whispered. Boxer cocked his head and listened. Zeb choked out his words again. Come again, Carter. You trying to tell us something? Backpack. Zeb gasped again and thrashed his head. The knife eased away from his body, and the two men bent their heads closer to him. Footsteps sounded behind them. Stuttelander crowded closer. What's he saying? Backpack, Zeb forced the words through his parched throat. Boxer swung his head, but Stuttelander was already moving. I'll get it. It's in the vehicle. There was nothing in it though, except for his guns. His voice grew fainter as he stepped outside. Pockmark nodded encouragingly at Zeb. That was a start, but let's get to the meat of it. He chuckled at his cleverness, and the knife started its downward curve, this time over Zeb's groin. The blast was a thunderclap that blew out the windows, shook the wooden cabin and caused cans and plates to fall from the shelves. A hot wave of air hit them, and caused Pockmark to fall sideways from his crouching position. He put out a hand to steady himself, his head swinging toward the explosion. The beast was ready. It was coiled. It was lethal. Zeb lunged up, his torso moving like a whip, and his forehead caught pockmark on his right temple. The hardest bone in his body smashed into the pressure point on the knife wielder's temple, plumb on the temporal artery, and crushed it and fragmented the sphenoidal bones. Pockmark fell sideways on Boxer, not even a sound escaping him. Boxer was slow to react, his attention still focused on the explosion. His head turned when the body fell against him, his eyes widened at the sight of Zeb rearing up. Boxer was crouching, a position that killed mobility, rising took too much time, moving back or forward was awkward. It was a sitting duck position when in combat. Zeb's forward lunge changed to a sideways move, and his forehead caught Boxer on his Adam's apple. The sideways move reduced the power of his blow, and while Boxer choked, it wasn't a lethal blow. The killer fell back, roaring in pain and anger, scrabbled sideways, trying to get purchase to get to his feet. Zeb followed him, his movement hampered by his bound wrists behind his back. Don't let him stand. He threw himself on Boxer and brought him down just as the man was rising, his right shoulder smashing into the man's abdomen. Boxer chopped at his throat with hands as hard as slabs of concrete. Zeb caught the blows on the sides of his neck, but the beast was in ascendancy. The beast was invincible. It shrugged the blows that would have felled a grown man. Zeb moved sinuously, twisting and coiling his body again, and brought his forehead down on Boxer's mouth. The killer's lips split, a tooth broke. He raised his hands to gouge Zeb's eyes. Zeb caught one seeking hand with his mouth and bit his fingers. Boxer roared in rage, forgot about gouging and rained blows on Zeb's head with his left hand. His eyes looked around wildly landed on his gun belt a few feet away that he had taken off before the interrogation. He levered off his left hand, but Zeb forced him back down with his body weight. He knuckled a blow at Zeb's throat, 
Zeb caught it on the side of his neck and retaliated with another forehead blow that broke the killer's nose. Boxer yelled out in anger and pain and aimed another blow at Zeb's throat. Zeb reared back and let the blow lose its power, used his abdominal muscles to power his upper body, twisted in the air, and landed heavily on Boxer with his elbow piercing the killer's sternum. He reared again, moved his wrists high up his back, his right elbow cocked like an arrow and caught Boxer flush on his throat, and crushed it. The killer thrashed in agony for moments, and then fell silent. Zeb rolled off him, pushed Pockmart's dead weight with his shoulder, and uncovered the blade that lay beneath. It took half an hour of slow, laborious effort before he finished sawing off the last of the plastic cuffs. He lay panting for minutes sucking the clean air deeply, letting it wash through him, cooling down the beast, and when energy flooded back took stock of himself. His head throbbed from the effects of the crash, but there were no cuts on his face, and he knew the throbbing would die down with time. His upper body was a mess at first glance, but he knew most of the cuts were superficial. The cut in the left shoulder was more serious, but it would heal. Pock Mark had been toying with him and hadn't got to the serious business. He had fought through the wall of pain and had blanked it in the furious minutes of battle, but it returned now. So did his control though, and this time the pain went meekly into the white box and lay quiescent. The two men were dead. Boxer from a ruptured throat, Pockmark from a fractured skull. The head injury alone might not have killed Pockmark, but during the fight, his body had slipped to the floor and the knife beneath him had cut open his abdomen. Zeb flexed his wrists and rose to his feet gingerly, and when blood started circulating again, he went outside. The carcass of Studlander's vehicle lay smoking, the man himself was unrecognizable. Zeb made a mental note to thank Broker, who had come up with the idea of inserting the newly developed explosive between the lining of his backpack. The explosive, not available at any commercial outlet, made by another deep black agency, was pliable and could be molded to any shape. It could be used with timers, and the one on Zeb's backpack was disguised as a compass. He had known the men wanted him alive the moment they had used the flashbang and tasers on him in LaBelle's apartment. He hadn't expected a third man, but had set the timer to five hours, figuring that they would capture him at some point. Zeb hunted through the wreckage of the vehicle, but didn't find his backpack or its contents. Probably blown to pieces. He searched the remains of Studlander's body. No phone. He went inside and searched the two men. Both had throwaway phones, each with two stored numbers. One was the other phones, the second number on both was the same. That second number must have been Studlander's. He tried the phones but there was no signal. He pocketed them, collected their guns, kept one Glock and two magazines, and destroyed the others. He removed Boxer's shirt and tried it. It was a tight fit but it would have to do, Pockmark's was too small for him. He removed Pockmark's shirt, balled it up and soaked it under the tap. He washed his wounds slowly, the pain now a white heat that the box was trying hard to contain. He tore a strip off the shirt and fashioned it into a rough dressing that he applied to the wound. It would have to do till he got to a physician. Physicians will lead to cops. He flung the thought from his mind. First things first. He washed his face, ran his fingers through his hair, and using a shard of glass as a mirror, made himself as presentable as possible in the circumstances. He belted on Boxer's holster, covered it with the shirt, and stepped outside. Dawn was breaking, and the woods were alive with the rustle of its denizens. He had a rough idea of where he was, and set out at a pace as fast as his body would allow. He knew his crew would have lost GPS contact with him, and knowing them, they would be assembling a strike force. He didn't want Bawana, Roger and Bear descending on Boston with their war paint on. The woods started clearing after 40 minutes of hiking, during which he rested several times, the white heat becoming more difficult to contain. He stumbled to his knees once and nearly passed out, but the beast didn't let him. The beast wasn't ready to die. Not here. Not like this. He could see a snake in the distance. Paler than the surroundings, winding and curving. Not a snake, a road. He crossed it, and sat on the metal barrier and blacked out for a second. When he came to, the universe was still empty but for him. 
No savior had appeared miraculously. Neither had any more killers. He used his sweat-soaked shirt to wipe his face, adjusted it over his injuries, and looked to both sides. There wasn't anything to see. Tarmac with the central yellow divider vanished into the distance to his left and right. He squinted at the sky. It felt like it was 9 a.m., the weekend was just starting. No, his dulled brain responded. It's Friday. Last night was Thursday. Two hours later, the first set of lights appeared in the distance. He squinted and waited till they got closer, a dark sedan speeding in the emptiness. He drifted back and lay low. He would wait for the right vehicle. That came another four hours later, a white pickup truck wending its way in no particular hurry. Country music blasted from its open windows, and when it got 200 feet away, he spotted a solitary figure through the windscreen. He stepped on concrete and waved his hands. You wrestled with a bear, son? The grizzled old man asked him when he had leaned back on the torn leather seats, enjoying the warmth of the cab. Three of them. Running low on energy, his mind couldn't come up with any cover story, and the truth spilled out. The old man kept silent, darting glances at his companion, lowering his window a couple of times to spit out a stream of tobacco juice. Zeb leaned against the door, twisted to face the man, tried hard to focus but it was difficult. For some reason the man's face was blurred. Something dangled from the rear mirror. Zeb squinted and thought it looked like a cross. Behind it was something metallic that clinked. He leaned forward to get a closer look when the old man reached out behind him and produced a flask. He watched silently when Zeb drank and leaned back again and closed his eyes. Whatever was inside the flask filled Zeb with a delicious warmth. Got to keep awake. Man may take me to cops. Not ready for that. Let me rest for a second. Just a second. The truck slowed and then came to a stop, and the old man sat still as he watched his passenger and the road ahead of him. It felt like the two of them were alone in the woods, in their private bubble. He waved his hand in front of the unconscious man, he didn't stir. He turned the truck around and drove slowly back to the clearing where he had found the man. He locked the truck, glanced one more time at the wounded man and tracked back. The trail was easy to follow for a skilled woodsman like him, and twenty minutes later, he was at the cabin. The bodies and the burned-out vehicle corroborated the man's story. The injured man was still dead to the world when he reached his truck, turned it around again, and continued his journey in silence. The man woke up once, looked wildly around and mumbled. Got a call broker. The old man soothed him. In good time, son. Sleep now. You need your rest. The eyes grew wilder, the voice became urgent. No. Now. He'll panic. The unfocused eyes turned on him, and a hand grabbed the wheel. The truck swerved and when the old man had it under control, he wheeled to a gentle stop. You got a number? The passenger mumbled a number and lapsed into silence, when the driver looked at him, he was unconscious. The old man pulled out his phone from the glove compartment, donned a pair of glasses and punched the number slowly. It rang just once and was picked up promptly. Yeah, who's this? The voice had authority. Is this broker? The man asked him. The voice hesitated for a second. Who are you? The old man sighed. Look son, I am tired. I want to get home, wrap into my robe, and get a drink in me. Now I have an unconscious man with me who said he wanted to speak to someone called Broker. If you aren't him or don't know who that is, let's end this. Describe him, the voice was strained, urgent, panic lacing it. The old man did so and winced and moved the phone away when the voice at the other end yelled. We found him. Chapter 23 the acquisitions were happening quicker now, two more large wells were now under Wasserman's management, the usual facade of shell companies covering the ownership. The previous acquisitions had their production lowered, and after an appropriate passage of time, the drilling would stop. The Venezuelan oil minister was announced, the same candidate the principal had wined and dined. 
In his first interview, he commented that the country would have to relook at its priorities and decide who its friends were. He declined to elaborate when asked to clarify. The principal was happy, but Wasserman was less so. Stutelander and his two men had failed to report in. The grab at LaBelle's apartment had clearly failed. Stutelander had reported seeing Carter, but there had been no communication after that. LaBelle was dead, and while the cops had no clues, they were investigating the whereabouts of two vehicles reported by onlookers, as well as the military grade flashbangs. Wasserman wasn't worried about them. The cops could be led to a dead end, he was worried about the three men. Their ride had disappeared, the GPS trackers were dead. Their last known position was on the outskirts of Boston. He was reluctant to deploy more assets to find the men till he knew what had gone down. Carter might have them. For the first time a sense of unease came over him. They were three of his best men and knew who and where he was. He forced himself to analyze the situation. Even if Carter has them, what do they know? Not even they know who I really am. Stutelander knows where the ranch is, but this place is a fort. Not even Carter can get through. None of them know about the principal or what's going down. He made another call when he had calmed down. It was a request for funds to buy the largest well in Nevada. The principal agreed and they worked out transfer details. Funds weren't an issue. The principal had a war chest of billions. A thought struck him when he had hung up and punctured his calm exterior. Stutelander knows we are buying wells. Werner was stumped. That hadn't happened in a long time, and it certainly didn't want to admit it to the twins. It kept going back to them for more parameters, but they too had run out of ideas. It had run Elena Petrova's sheets through all the code-cracking algorithms it had, but all had failed. It had examined Petrova's reading habits, which Megan had fed, and had substituted letters and words from her favorite books. Nada. It turned to the Bible, and then to other holy books. It looked up keywords in Bob Woodward and Cal Bernstein's All the President's Men, two journalists that she greatly admired. That lead was useless. It ground its electronic teeth together in frustration, flapped its cabling, and went into thinking mode. Two ideas emerged. Where had Petrova visited? Where was she from? Zeb woke to a calm room with white walls and ceiling. A fan turned lazily high above him. He turned his head and met Bawana's grinning face. You had us worried, bro. Roger came into view, the old man behind him, and silently grabbed Zeb's hand tightly. Look what happens when we aren't with you. He stepped aside for the old man who studied Zeb keenly with green eyes, lifted his shirt and examined the dressing. Zeb lowered his eyes and saw that the dressing had been changed while he was out cold. His wounds had been cleaned and the superficial ones had been left alone. Pete Eastman, the old man introduced himself. Your guys gave me a fright, son. A couple of hours from my call to your guy broker, these two gentlemen appeared at my cabin, loaded for bear. He chuckled. Lucky I was the friendly sort, or else I would be laid out next to you. Zeb introduced himself, watched him move in the room, confidently, surely, despite his age and appearance. Thank you, sir. If you hadn't taken me in, I reckon I would have needed more than a dressing. Eastman clicked his tongue and shook his head. Nothing's really wrong with you, son. That sticker went in and out, didn't do much other than poking a hole into you. I reckon the dude didn't know what he was doing. He knew just what he was doing. Zeb corrected him grimly. Eastman handed him a wet towel to wipe his face. Is that so? Well, doesn't look like he'll be using that anymore. His teeth flashed briefly, revealing the gaps in them. The few teeth he had were strong and white. Zeb tested his legs, they felt fine. He rose and sat on the bed, his shoulder twinned sharply and settled down into a persistent burn. He tried his arm and found he could use it. He shrugged mentally. Eastman's right. It was just exhaustion and shock. The knife wound doesn't matter. I've been injured worse. A hand appeared in front of him, bearing a mug from which came the distinctive smell of coffee. Zeb took a cautious sip and closed his eyes when the beverage rolled through him, 
bringing him back to life. You seem to be used to this, sir. Bawana and Roger traded a laugh. You got lucky, Zeb, when Mr. Eastman came across you. The Texan's grin lit the room. Of all the people who could have picked you up, he was the one you needed. Zeb remembered the objects dangling in Eastman's truck. You were in the military, sir. The grin became a chortle. Mr. Eastman is a nom vet. He was an army medic. Zeb looked in the green eyes and his eyes saw all that Eastman had seen. The old man waved away Zeb's thanks and led him to the next room where he had laid out four places on a wooden table. He ladled out stew in four bowls and gestured at them to sit. Zeb felt the vibration first, an intangible change in the way molecules in air throbbed and moved. He used both hands to hurl the table on its side so that it faced away from them and kicked it toward the entrance. A wide sweep of his arm brought down Eastman and the Glock was already snug in his hand when two masked men surged through the dining room. His gun spoke twice and Bawana's and Rogers joined in and the men fell. Zeb dragged Eastman back into a narrow utility room as shadows flitted around the house, a radio crackled on one of the dead man's body and yells broke out from the outside. Bawana and Roger brought up the rear covering them, but no other men appeared. They'll take us outside, it'll be easier. The utility room was small and crammed with shelving on which lined cans of food, gasoline, flashlights, batteries, coils of rope, an axe and hunting knives. There were folded blankets neatly folded on a top of a barrel, and cans of paint were arranged on the floor. The room had no windows, and its sole entrance was to the dining room. A barrage of shots sounded, aimed at the dining room, but Eastman had built the cabin with care, with logs as thick as a grown man's width, and the bullets died inside the walls. Bawana looked at Zeb silently, no words needed to be spoken. They were safe for now, but they didn't know how large the bunch of attackers was. They would be cut down if they stepped outside. Not quite. We aren't dead yet. Eastman read their glances and chuckled surprisingly. He went to the barrel that was full of gas, for the generator, the old man explained, and tried to move it away. Bawana and Roger rushed to help him and moved the barrel as if it was empty. Eastman bent over the floor and blew dust away revealing a circular trap door with a rope through its center. He tugged at the rope, opened the door, thrust an arm through the darkness and turned on a light. They followed him down a ladder, Zeb who was bringing up the rear, closed the trap door behind him and locked it with a dead bolt. The steps went down twelve feet and widened into a narrow hollow under the ground. Concrete all around. Well lighted. A draft of air. He spent a lot of time digging and building this tunnel. I aged ten years in Kukai. Eastman cracked a smile when he saw the recognition in Zeb's crew. Siu Kai in Vietnam was where the Viet Cong had built an extensive network of tunnels to counter the better equipped American and South Vietnamese forces. It was from this underground maze that they mounted attacks on their enemy. I was attached to tunnel rats and went down a few times myself. I wanted an escape route when I was building this cabin. He waved his hands to encompass the narrow passage. Took me close to a year. He turned and gestured at them to follow him. This opens into a dry well that is camouflaged. It is a hundred yards away from the cabin and I am betting whoever these dudes are, they haven't discovered it. Eastman was right. The well ten feet deep had bricks built into it as steps. Zeb peered up, and all he could see was a canopy of foliage through which patches of blue shone. He reached out silently, and Roger placed a cable camera in his hand. His glock between his teeth he climbed swiftly, peered through and signaled clear. The well opening was surrounded by thick trees, and in their cover, Eastman drew the directions to his cabin and its layout of his cabin on the ground. He watched as the three men with him acknowledged and spoken commands. What about me? He whispered. That was my home those men crashed into. Roger gave him a spare Glock. You can use this, sir. The old man gave him a withering stare. Son, I was firing guns when you were still sucking milk. Bawana chuckled at the put down. Sir, please stay here and take out any hoods that approach. They might discover the tunnel, and if they come out here, you know what to do. 
We'll deal with the rest. He took the left, Roger the right, Zeb would go on the roof and counterattack from the top. Roger handed out bone phones to the four of them, and the three melted away. Zeb moved from tree to tree, rolling his feet on the ground, spreading his weight, listening. He could hear sounds in the distance, shouts and then silence. Fifteen minutes had elapsed since the attack. Enough time for them to check out the cabin and discover that it was empty. They might circle round and spread out in a search pattern. Gowana and Roger clicked in acknowledgement. Twenty feet away he came across the first search party. Two shadows drifted through the growth, five feet from each other, using the barrels of their AKs to part the woods for them. He waited for them to approach, and when the first man passed him, he ghosted behind him, one arm going over the hood's face, another on his neck. The hood collapsed but his partner glanced up, turned, raised his AK, and opened his mouth to yell a warning. Zeb shot him. A double tap from the silenced Glock that the woods ate. He waited but heard no shouts of alarm. Two more down, he whispered. Make that three. Bawana chuckled. Four, Roger was laconic. The fifth man took Zeb by surprise. He rose suddenly from the ground less than five feet away, his finger already on the trigger, barrel swinging in a short arc to cover Zeb, his mouth widening into a triumphant grin behind his mask. Zeb left the ground in a low dive, came under the rising barrel, and knocked it up and away. The shot sailed harmlessly in the air and his benchmade sank deep into the hard case. Zeb ducked under his flailing hands and kicked his feet from underneath. How many of you? Ten, the man gasped without resistance. Now three left. The rear of the cabin became visible, and after watching it for a while, he drifted to the left, past the dining room, the small living room, and when he approached the front, he stepped out from the cover of the woods. Bawana was leaning against a trunk, puffing on a cigar, while Roger skimmed through a collection of small arms and phones. He looked up at Zeb's approach. All throwaway phones. I questioned one badass, and he said they belong to a gang in Boston. Their leader is over there. He pointed to a man who lay bound and trussed against the cabin. Half an hour later, they had some answers. Flames, the gang leader, worked in a larger gang. His boss had given him the contract to take out the old man and his companions. Did he know why? He spat out blood. Flames took out men and women. He didn't ask why. Zeb questioned him some more and gave up when he got nothing productive. Gowana asked the gangster a question. Why Flames? Because I burn people, the hood replied proudly. They were the last words he uttered for a while. Bawana knocked him out cold and taped his mouth and tossed him like a rag doll against the cabin. Zeb requested Eastman to make the call, and the first cruiser appeared twenty minutes later. The cops who emerged from it looked shocked when they went through the house and at the bodies. Just who are you guys? one of them asked. Roger chewed on a blade of grass and the faintest trace of a smile swept his face. Just some dudes who don't like our lunch interrupted. They were released late evening, after a hands-off message poured down the line following a series of calls. Eastman was well-liked and respected, and his story corroborated Zeb's, and he too was released. Zeb and his team stayed the night with Eastman, and the next day they helped him mend the broken windows and fill the holes in the walls. Guy at my age, fishing is all I have for excitement. His eyes sparkled when they were loading their SUV after they had finished. Visit again and often, if all this accompanies you. Bawana drove them to Boston, and when they had left the reservation behind, he asked Zeb, you know who those hoods were? A Slovenian gang, originally from New York but now spreading their reach to other cities on the eastern seaboard. Bawana clicked his tongue impatiently. Yeah, I heard the cops. How did they find us, though? Wasserman was probably tracking one of the phones of his three men. I had forgotten all about them when I didn't get a signal. Once he knew where we were, he must have called in a few favors. Roger shifted in the back and growled. We need to pay him a visit. Wasserman finally found out that Studdlander was dead by a method so simple that he wondered why it hadn't come to him earlier. 
both he and Studlander wore electronic tags that were sold widely as fitness and activity monitoring devices. The wristbands fed data to the user's smartphone, which in turn relayed the information to a cloud-based application. Wasserman had access to Studlander's application, and when the device showed no recent information, he knew his second-in-command was dead. By then the GPS signals from Boxer's and Pockmart's phone had come back online, and those gave him an idea. He called Fadil Stinnick once he had triangulated the phone's location in the Blue Hills Reservation and asked him to send good men. Stinnick, a vicious criminal, had a tight grip on the south side of Boston where his drugs and prostitution business flourished. He had established himself in New York, but when crime didn't pay as much as it used to in that city, he had moved to Boston. Wasserman knew Stinnick would do the job. The Slovenian would sell his mother for the right price or slit her throat. Stinnick didn't care about subtlety, he killed brutally and often in public. A year back, one of his men had gunned down a businessman in a well-populated cafe in New York and had then drunk the man's beverage and walked out calmly. On another occasion, Stinnick himself had slit the throat of a woman in broad daylight, with numerous onlookers. His men went to prison, many of them were gunned down by cops, but Stinnick remained untouched and his business empire grew. He turned his attention back to Carter once he had made the arrangements. I had 20 good men. Now I am down to 12. We should have left Carter alone in Pinedale. He threw a sheaf of papers into the fire and watched them turn orange, then red, and then black and gray and ash. Leaving Carter alone wouldn't have changed anything. He started hunting the moment he discovered Petrova's body. Wasserman was in batten down mode. He was readying himself for a showdown with Carter, who he knew would come. He knew the kind of man Carter was. He was relentless in his pursuit, and he would know Wasserman was the only one who knew how the pieces fit together. He has four men and three women in New York. Eight of them in total, if his entire crew joins him. Eight against thirteen. His lips spread back in a silent snarl. Those are good odds. He doesn't know the kind of man I am. In any case, he has to survive the Slovenians. The thought came to Zeb when he was half asleep, lulled by the hiss of tires on black top, secure in the knowledge that the two men with him would obliterate any further attack. The thought gnawed away at his sleep and when he woke up, he fired a text to Megan. Send Wasserman's voice print to friendly agencies around the world. Werner had run the print against all the national and international databases it had access to, but what if a match was lying elsewhere? The twins had queried intelligence organizations in other countries and got nothing back. But they hadn't sent out the voice print. Megan looked at the text, silently smacked her forehead in reproach. I should have thought of that. She sent the file to 40 intelligence forces around the world and went back to studying Petrova's activities. The journalist letter to Balthazar still had them stumped, and she was now down to going through Petrova's life day by day, for as far back as Werner could get information on. Petrova was a voracious reader and was a regular visitor to the Laramie County Library in Cheyenne, and she also ordered books off various online retailers. Megan had keyed in all her borrows and purchases into Werner, but no code was apparent. She was now poring over a list of borrows that went three years back, and it was the books at the bottom of the list that had her frowning. Aramaic texts translated to English? She tapped her teeth with her a nail and ran further searches. The ancient language used the Phoenician alphabet, and several Middle Eastern languages could be traced back to it. The books Petrova had borrowed were all religious texts. But she wasn't religious. She was Jewish but a non-practicing one from all accounts and disliked all religions. She looked up the books and fist pumped silently while her twin gopped at her. Yes, the books Petrova had borrowed were available in ebook format in the original script. She purchased the books and uploaded them to Werner's database and wrote a command. Werner acknowledged, dusted off its bits and bytes, and got to work. Bawana was in no particular hurry and drove at a steady pace through a near empty road while his friends rested beside him. He cast a glance behind at Roger and got a slow wink from him. 
A surge of warmth spread through him, and he responded with a silent thumbs up. Roger never spoke of where he came from, but they all knew he was an orphan and had been reared by a foster family who hadn't exactly showered him with love. Roger had done the family a favor when he had run away at 17, had faked parental permission, and had joined the army. We are his family now just as we are Zeb's and they are mine. A pair of lights flashed and caught his attention. Bikes. Two of them. Nope six. He eased to the right, making room for them to pass. They didn't, and he then woke Zeb. Chapter 24 Zeb twisted to look behind. The bikes were approaching faster and were spread wide to cut out any overtaking traffic. You sure they're after us? Yeah. I made a few false turns but they stuck to us like limpets. What are they waiting for? Roger asked impatiently, as he opened a board under the rear seat and removed a modified state route, 25 sniper rifle that had full auto mode. He slapped a mini computer on top of it, one that would give self-aiming capabilities, and handed the equipment to Zeb. The three of them donned their Kevlar jackets in silence, Roger assisting Bawana with his. Want me to take the wheel? he asked Bawana knowing the black man loved the long gun. Nah, Zeb can handle it. Besides we may not get to use it, the ride's too choppy. His voice rose to a shout. Here they come. The first round embedded in the thick rear glass, and a white galaxy blossomed around it. More shots followed, and soon the rear was riddled with bullet marks. One of the lead riders waved his arm and pointed at the wheels. Guns flashed but all the shots went wide. It was hard enough taking a shot at a moving target. It was practically impossible to shoot the tires off when atop a fast bike. Those are self-inflating run-flat babies. Those dumbasses can shoot all day if they want. Bawana chortled. Whoa, looks like they've got another plan. Two riders came up fast, flanked his sides and made to overtake him. One rider looked briefly at Bawana, his helmeted face caught the sun and then it snapped round straight quickly. But it wasn't fast enough. The momentary distraction gave Bawana the opening he wanted. He swerved to the right, tires squealing, and the rider went flying in the air when the heavy SUV crashed into the Yamaha. The second rider went ahead, turned in his seat and rained shots at the windscreen. Many of them sailed harmlessly, but a few embedded in the armored glass and spread. Zeb lowered his window an inch, thrust his Glock out, and fired continuously in a roll of thunder, making the rider speed away. Visibility. They want to reduce our visibility, and then they'll crowd us and attack, he said grimly. The four riders behind had cut the distance, but made no immediate move to attack. Helmets bobbed at one another, and then two riders dropped behind, came closer, and one rider stood up, balanced and in a smooth move transferred to the second rider's pillion. His bike crashed to the road and spun angrily in a trail of sparks. What now? Roger murmured. He flicked a glance at the front, the rider ahead was continuing his assault on the windscreen, and now the bottom of the glass was nearly opaque. The road curved ahead over an embankment that fell steeply down to a small lake. A metal railing separated tarmac from steep slope. Whatever they want to do will have to be fast. Pretty soon we'll be flooded by cops and cruisers. Roger mused as he squinted his eyes to see what the riders were up to. Zeb lifted a pair of binos to his eyes and watched for a few seconds. His voice was calm and soft when he spoke. We're armored, aren't we? Steel-plated, Bawana confirmed. Bet that's not enough protection against a rocket launcher. Bawana flashed a look at the mirror swiftly and swore softly. Hold on. Brace yourself. Time to even this up a little more. He dropped his speed imperceptibly, let the distance reduce gradually, his eyes flicking constantly between his mirrors and the front. Now, he yelled, and jammed the brakes hard and simultaneously threw the vehicle in reverse. Tires squealed and smoked in protest and then bit into asphalt, found purchase, and one moment the SUV was hurling forward, the next it was rocking back and gaining speed. Bikes were nimble and had better maneuverability over a chunky SUV. 
but the riders were bunched close together and had been distracted by the transfer of one rider to another bike. The SUV's rear smashed into the closest rider who was swerving away evasively, but was too slow and too late. He went flying in the air and slammed against the metal railing, his bike skidded on the road in a trail of smoke sparks and metallic screeching. Another rider went wide to escape the spinning bike. That exposed him to the rain of bullets from the vehicle. The rider jerked under the impact and held onto the handlebars, but not for long. He slumped over the tank, lost control, and his bike fell and crushed him under it. Zeb and Roger were hurled back in their seats when Bawana brought the vehicle to another tire-burning stop and jerked the vehicle forward and put distance between themselves and the launcher-carrying bike. The pursuing bike made no attempt to close the distance, and when Roger trained his binoculars on them, he couldn't help chuckling. The hoods are arguing, probably wondering which end is the lethal one. Zeb scanned the road behind. It was still free of traffic except for the lone bike. The road ahead was similarly empty, the rider in front, a dark spot against concrete. They were on the embankment now, a stretch that was almost two miles long as it ran around the lake. We've no room to escape. The riders could come close behind us if they ignored our covering fire and fire a grenade up our asses. Bawana read his thoughts. This vehicle has braces on top, hasn't it? Yeah. Controls are right here. Why? Bawana tapped the dashboard. Zeb didn't reply. He broke the state route 25 into three component parts, secured them firmly to his right side, removed the computer and tossed it at Roger. He rotated his shoulder, it throbbed from the knife wounds but it would function. His mind and body were conditioned to deal with pain. You aren't, Roger's disbelieving words were blown away in the wind when Zeb slid open the door at his side, glanced once at his two men and launched himself in the air. His hands gripped the railing on top and powered his body up. It floated straight and parallel to the ground for a second, time during which Roger opened a hail of fire at the pursuers to keep them at bay, and then Zeb was on the roof. His wrists, arms and legs moved in smooth practiced motions, muscles remembering numerous occasions when he had to crawl up the roof of fast-moving vehicles. He lay prone on the top, his head facing the rear of the vehicle, his hands locked around the railings. He ignored the cold air tearing through his hair, reached behind blindly with his legs, found the open braces and thumped the roof with an elbow. Bawana pressed a button on the dash, and the braces tightened on his legs. Another button secured Zeb's middle to the roof with a middle brace. The fastenings had been designed to tension automatically and keep whatever they were holding firm on the roof. There were two more braces in front of him. They weren't needed. Two seconds to remove the component parts. Three more to assemble them. Ignore the approaching rider. Ignore the man trying to stand behind the rider. Ignore the tube on his shoulder. Zeb planted the scope and took his first view. All he saw was wildly bouncing terrain. The bike was coming in a straight line now, steady and firm. The rider behind had found his balance and was hoisting the launcher on his shoulder. Zeb thumped the roof with his elbow and gripped the rifle firmly. Bawana swerved suddenly, headed straight at the metal railing. Three tons of SUV at close to 100 miles an hour against a flimsy railing whose design was dictated by cost. No contest. The railing gave in an agonizing wail and tore reluctantly. Zeb's body was thrown around violently on the roof, and if it hadn't been for the fastenings, he would have been in the air. His hands had a death grip on the rifle, and they rose unconsciously to prevent any jarring blows to the SR-25. The SUV sailed over the embankment, cleared the sloping ground and started falling toward the blue waters below. The rifle came to his Zeb's shoulder, the scope to his eye. The world was moving slower. Tarmac came into view, then a bike and then the riders. The second rider was bending down, the bike was turning in their direction. He depressed the trigger with the rifle in full auto mode. He corrected his first burst and sprayed left to right top to bottom. He fired a longer burst. A third burst followed and the magazine emptied. He thought he had missed but then the bike wobbled and went over spinning. Zeb wasn't watching anymore. 
The braces had come free, and with one leg and one arm he launched himself off the roof and into the air. He fell wide off the vehicle, with the world spinning lazily around him. He loosened his body, let gravity do his work, and fell sideways in the water. He gasped at the cold and the shock of the impact, let himself sink for a few feet, and then thrashed out with his legs and broke to the surface and surveyed his surroundings. The road they had been on was now a long line of vehicles. A hammer landed on his back, and he turned to see Bawana's white smile. Good shooting, bro, but maybe next time you can take an easier shot? That was sheer dumb luck. He forced the words through chattering teeth. The bike was coming straight at us for a few seconds. Gave me a clear line of sight. Bawana helped him remove the now water-laden Kevlar jacket, and he immediately felt lighter. A hail turned them around, Roger waving from the bank of the lake. They swam toward it, Bawana pulling him along occasionally, with a powerful hand. The lake's bank was crowded with cops and spectators by the time they reached it, and hands stretched out to haul them in. Roger thrust blankets at them that he'd procured out of nowhere, and when Zeb had got his breath back, a stocky cop scratched his head and addressed him. Which movie are you guys shooting? Wasserman caught the news in the evening, he thought he had seen everything in his life, but even his jaded eyes remained glued to the screen. The footage was caught on a cell phone and it was blurry, the faces were indistinct, but even with all that, it was gripping. Carter and his companions' faces were never caught on camera, and the cops deflected all questions about the incident, but Wasserman didn't need confirmation from TV news coverage. He got that when Stinnick called him. He listened in silence as the man raged and threatened to bring retribution to the whole of Boston. Wasserman refrained from wondering aloud what the city had anything to do with Carter. He listened for some more time and then asked. All your men are dead. All but one who is now in custody. Will he rat on you? Stinnick laughed through his anger. My men never snitch. They know they will face a slow death if they do. I am going after Carter. No one takes apart my men like that and lives. I will dig out his intestines and line them up on Newberry Street. I will then drink his blood. Don't. Wasserman cut him short. Don't go there, don't even think of it. You'd better off finding a hole to hide in. Wasserman held the phone away as a yell burst through Stinnick, followed by a torrent of rage. His voice turned icy cold when the gangster paused for breath. Listen, Stinnick, you are a punk who has enjoyed some level of success by being violent. Sure you run South Boston, but you are still a low-level street thug. You saw what he did to your men, they had a grenade launcher, they had an open field of fire and yet he still took them out. Your guys didn't even scratch him. Carter, he said flatly, is unlike anyone you have ever come up against. Carter will eat you for breakfast, and he won't even notice you. These thoughts you have about taking him down. Think again. You'll live longer. Stinnick's harsh breathing slowed and became calmer. What about you? Where will you hide? Somewhere he can find me. Chapter 25 The principal reviewed the news footage several times, spoke to Wasserman, and got assurances that Carter would never find out about him. He tossed the phone away and waved the snifter under his nose and let the richness of Remy Martin soak through him. He had made inquiries about Carter the moment Wasserman had brought the man to his attention. He had met with Pentagon generals and had asked them, discreetly, about this man. He had lunched with the National Security Advisor and had asked him if he had ever come across that name. The answer from most quarters was that Carter was a good soldier, obeyed orders, but now was out of the military and in the private sector. A few people raised eyebrows and asked the principal his interest. He shrugged. He had come across Carter's business and was wondering if he should hire him as a security consultant. He's the best in the business, came the reply. He sniffed his drink again, and this time he smelled the deeper layers of aroma and closed his eyes in pleasure. Layers. No one knows what I am doing. Wasserman knows, but even he doesn't know why. Oil wells were being acquired two a week in different parts of the countries. 
Unwell was being closed every month, but still not a single person either in the industry or from the outside had noticed the goings-on. The principal chuckled. That was the genius of the plan. In the business world, these things always happened. Companies were acquired, stripped of their assets, and closed. No one accused them of a bigger sinister plan. What if Wasserman dies? What if Carter finds him? His eyes flew open, and he analyzed the problem with the same concentration he had invested in getting to where he was. It wasn't a new problem. He had thought about it several times, and like before, he reached the same conclusion. Wasserman was good, very good, it was highly unlikely he would be captured and made to talk. And even if he did, who would believe the word of a mercenary? Who would believe the preposterous plan he was executing on behalf of the principal? The principal took a sip and felt at peace when the liquid spread its warmth through him. He wasn't afraid of dying. It was an academic concept, he had never faced death and in fact in his position was very well protected. But deep down he knew he didn't fear death. The plan would be executed even if he died, and when the world woke up it would be too late. The order of the world would have changed irrevocably. Zeb spent just a day in New York before he was on the jet, this time to Johannesburg. The voice print that Megan had sent to various agencies found a match in South Africa. Peter Van Zyl, the Director General of the South African State Security Agency, wouldn't disclose the identity till he met with Zeb in person. No amount of cajoling and pleading had changed the big South African's mind, and after spending time with his crew, Zeb had made the 12-hour flight to the largest city in the country. The flight had given him time to reflect on the progress his team had made. Beth and Megan were close to cracking the code on Petrova's letter, the Aramaic texts were key, but Petrova seemed to have used several books, and the twins were scouring the internet for other texts that would decipher the letter. Claire reported that the Secretary of State had met with the Saudi and the Venezuelan oil ministers, and had come away satisfied that their comments were gaffes. The various intelligence agencies in the country were less convinced, however, not one of them had come across any covert plan. Claire had finished her call by ordering Zeb to meet her in D.C. once he returned from Joburg. Bawana and Roger had wanted to go after Fadil Stinnick, to teach him the simpler life to be enjoyed in the straight and narrow. Zeb had dissuaded them. The video clip had gone viral, and though their names had been kept out, he wanted his crew to maintain a low profile. In any case, Boston's cops had enough on Stinnick to make his life uncomfortable. Wasserman and whoever was behind him remained Zeb's priority. Just who is Wasserman, he mused as the Lear's wing caught the sun and turned gold. Zeb was waved through border control. When you were a guest of the head of the state security agency, things moved like greased lightning. An escort was waiting for him outside OR. Tombo International Airport, a smartly dressed police officer who snapped him a salute and insisted on taking his duffel bag. He held open the door to the jeep and when Zeb was inside, moved away with his lights flashing. Zeb had been to South Africa several times and during his last visit had worked with a team from the SSA to foil an Al-Qaeda terrorist plot. During the mission, he had taken a shot meant for a fast-rising star of the agency, Peter Van Zyl. Peter, as big as Bawana and Bear, was waiting impatiently when the jeep turned in and strode across the courtyard of the white-walled palatial building and grabbed Zeb before he had even stepped out and hugged him. His large eyes went over Zeb keenly, and the normally grim face relaxed into a smile. There's trouble whenever you come to my country. This time it's you who invited me, Zeb retorted, and watched his friend's smile fade. Half an hour later when coffees were consumed and small talk had run out, Van Zyl rose, pulled curtains over the large picture windows and darkened his office. He played with a remote and a white rectangle came up against a blank wall. He pressed a button and a face looked at them. That's Luke Wasserman. Zeb studied the man in the picture. As tall as him, probably an inch taller, Wasserman had piercing green eyes and white hair that was cut close. His right cheek had a scar, a cut or a burn, that hadn't healed well. There was another mark over his right eyebrow. No one knows how he got those scars. Peter commented once and lapsed back into silence, letting Zeb study the man. 
The camera had caught Wasserman as he exited a coffee shop just before he stepped on the street. To anyone else, it would have been a photograph of a man going about his business. Zeb saw the coiled tension in the man's body, the flat gaze that took in everything without focusing on anything in particular. The photograph changed and this time showed Wasserman exiting a car. Van Zyl flicked through several photographs and kept the first one when he had finished. Who is he? Just the most dangerous killer I have known and that's including you, Van Zyl smiled mirthlessly and rose to pull back the curtains. He is a product of our Defense Intelligence Division, which is part of our National Defense Force. The DID was the South African equivalent of the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency. Most people think the DID is just another agency for gathering intel, but unknown to the public and known to just a very few people, it has a team of covert operatives who carry out all manner of proactive and reactive operations. Elimination or cleanup. Some of those operatives are assassins. Luke Wasserman was one such killer. He paused when a knock sounded on the door and an orderly brought in more coffee and poured for the two of them. Peter resumed when they were alone again. Wasserman wasn't your run-of-the-mill assassin. He got the job done, but he was used when we wanted to convey a particular message. A faint look of distaste appeared and vanished swiftly from his face. He was brutally efficient at that, and the results were spectacular. There was a nationally owned mine which had labor unrest, miners going on strike. The government negotiated, did everything it could to get the mine running again, but the union leader was stubborn. The politicians gave up and turned to the police. They gave up and looked at the dead. The thin smile flashed again. Yes, the DID's operatives worked like government mercenaries. Wasserman was deployed and one week later, the mine was producing again. The union leader? He was found beneath a mine car, his head crushed. Accidents happen, but no accident results in a man's genitals being torn off and stuffed in his mouth. The government covered up the killing, and things were back to normal. Wasserman was too brutal for the dead, and he was quietly made to leave the agency. This goes back 10-12 years, long before my time. He became a merc, and initially operated in various countries in Africa. Namibia, Sudan, Somalia, Mozambique, all the hotspots in this continent. A village needed to be subdued for mining operations on its land, Wasserman was called in. A tribal warlord had to be silenced, Luke Wasserman was there. A presidential candidate had to be eliminated, Wasserman could do that job in his sleep. He moved to Europe and was involved in the Kosovan conflict. He carried out assassinations in several East European countries. By then, he was also getting hot. Several agencies were after him, but he was as elusive as a fox. He came to South Africa seven years back, underwent a face change operation, and acquired a new identity. He barked once, laughter with no humor in it, and pointed at the picture. That's the new look, Wasserman. You must be thinking how we lost track of him if we had him under surveillance. We didn't. Those aren't surveillance photographs. Those came from a news reporter who was following some pop star. We arrested the reporter when the celebrity created a fuss and came across Wasserman's pictures. We didn't recognize him initially, but some smart facial recognition software made him. We then tracked down the plastic surgeon and got more details. But Wasserman had disappeared. He surfaced, or his signature surfaced from time to time, and from those we pieced together that your country was now his base. We had nothing more on him till you sent the voice print. He doesn't sound different from other assassins. Peter shook his head. Assassins work in the shadows, they don't leave their signatures on a kill. Wasserman leaves his mark on his assignments. He takes pride in his kills being known. His eyes took on a faraway look. He was once hired by a mining contractor in Sudan several years back, one who wasn't very particular about how the job was done. The contractor wanted to mine chromite, but the deposits were beneath a few tribal villages. Those villagers had occupied that land since time began, and no amount of money cajoling or bribes worked. Wasserman came in. 
he drove in with a bunch of his men in ten open-topped jeeps and casually opened fire. No warning, no talking, no smiling. Just random fire that killed twenty villagers, many of them women and children. He returned the next day and lined up women and children, about thirty of them. Again, he didn't utter a word. Just got his men to line the women and kids up. The women weren't touched. He went to their children, made them step forward and with a machete, severed their right leg and right arm. He didn't kill them. He didn't harm the women. He just amputated the legs and arms of five-year and six-year-old kids. Darkness filled the room, killed light, killed all sound except their breathing. They sat motionless for a long time, lost in their thoughts, trying to erase the images of the village, of the mothers and their children. Zeb stirred first. You could have told me all this over the phone. Peter's eyes glittered. I wanted to see how badly you wanted him. I don't care why you're after him, my friend. But if there's anyone who can get him, it's you. Find him. Kill him. Those mothers need recompense. Three days later, Zeb was in D.C. The twins were closer now, and several parts of the letter were transcribed. Petrova described a man who was so powerful that he could bend systems in several states to his will, a person who everyone knew but at the same time was invisible. She laid out a trail of people disappearing and accidental deaths, and linked it to the man. All those people worked in the oil industry. However, his identity still remained elusive. Beth and Megan set Werner on the disappearances and deaths. In Boston, the cops had finally apprehended Fadil Stinnick, who readily gave up one Leonard Wicks. Leonard Wicks didn't exist, and the email, phone and money trail led to a complicated maze that the cops were trying to unravel. Broker snorted. Any bets that Leonard Wicks is Luke Wasserman? No one took him up on it. Zeb met Claire outside her office, in a coffee shop near DuPont Circle, that looked more like a comic book store than a purveyor of fine beverages. Claire wasn't alone, she had an older man with her, a man whose grey buzz cut and steely eyes made people take a second look. DC was home to several kinds of political animals, but Claire's companion was as high up the food chain as one could get. General Daniel Klaus, National Security Advisor, grumped when Zeb joined them and pointedly glanced at his watch. Ignore him, he's yet to tear anyone's head off today, Claire's eyes were mirthful as she clasped the general's hand to take the sting out of her words. Zeb had met the general several times and knew the NSA was a strong champion of the agency. We are uneasy, Claire read the surprise in Zeb's eyes at the NSA's presence. Nothing points to a world-changing event. That's good, isn't it? Maybe that guy had it wrong. General Klaus growled. Son, do you really believe that? No, sir, Zeb admitted readily. I was ready to write off Felix Domingo's confession, but these attacks on me are too determined. Wasserman wants to stop me and doesn't care about being subtle anymore. There's Petrova's letter on top of that. Broker had shared their findings thus far with Claire, and Zeb knew the NSA was read in. The general shifted in the hard-backed chair uneasily. You know how many politicians there are in this country, with the highest security clearances? Too many, his hands bunched into fists. If any one of them was who Petrova was referring to, he broke off and looked away. The general didn't have a life outside his job. He was a rare breed, an apolitical man who lived alone and threw all his energy into his job. We don't have enough to suspect anyone, Daniel, Claire patted his arm. Besides, Petrova's man could be a billionaire businessman. He needn't be a politician. They thrashed various disaster possibilities around, but were no closer to any lead by the time they broke up. Intelligence agencies were looking for Luke Wasserman all over the country, but he too was proving to be an enigma. Not for long, Zeb said cryptically. You know where he is? The NSA asked in surprise. No, sir. But he'll call me. That's the only way he can get me for sure. Zeb left them an hour later, walked to the mall and hung about for another hour, all the while thinking, trying to piece together the jigsaw that had him stumped. 
Random thoughts came and went the way people moved about in the monument, brownie in motion under a hot blue sky. The Lincoln Memorial failed to inspire him for the first time he could remember, and he walked to its left, to the polished marble structure on which over 58,000 names were etched, those who had fought in a distant land, a war that had shaped the country. He stood for a long time, his reflection looking back at him as visitors, relatives and families moved past him, snapped photographs, planted flags, traced names. A mother clasped her daughter's hand and led her away, the flag the daughter had planted fluttered for a few minutes and then fell sideways. Zeb bent, picked the flag and righted it and planted it straight. He rose and straightened his shoulders and turned right, to the towering white spire that reflected in the dark marble, and beckoned at him. Oil Minister's Power Oil Influence Assassin Petrova The thoughts rolled over on themselves, bounced against the walls of his mind refused to fit into neat slots, refused to walk into the embracing arms of cognitive nerves that would bring reason and rationality. He looked blindly up at the towering obelisk, recollected dimly that it was one of the world's largest stone structures. He circled it, walked past the fifty flags surrounding the memorial, past furiously clicking cameras, and sat on an open green space with a view of the rear of the most famous residence on the planet. Families came and went, some played, some broke out picnic hampers and enjoyed the warmth of the golden disc in the endless blue far above. A frisbee landed near him, he threw it back unconsciously, and thanks floated in the wind. What will change the world? A suited man drifted in his vision, carrying a briefcase, speaking into a cell phone. The world didn't stop turning because a reporter died, because several people had died. It didn't care. Time was a meaningless concept in the galaxy. The Earth kept orbiting, regardless of what its inhabitants did. Gravity and its sideways move had kept it revolving for a few billion years, and it would continue to do so. A shout roused him briefly from his deep thought, kids racing against each other, one of whom was in a wheelchair. A girl was last, but she was powering it hard, her face red, her eyes shining, her mouth open. Her friends turned to look back at her, urged her on, and then she was falling, the wheel of her chair hitting an invisible ridge, slewing her sideways. Zeb moved without conscious thought, automatic reflexes snapping into action. His hands reached out and caught the girl before she touched ground. He put her back in her chair, pointed her in the right direction, and her race resumed. If their actions have had no effect, why are they desperate to stop me? Wasserman must be down to just a few more men, his assassin is dead. But he still wants me out. He went back to the gray fog seeking, searching, the beast prowling. After what felt like hours he came back to the present to see dusk had fallen, to the right, the capital's dome glowed orange and gold. A mother played with her children, a flag rested beside them. She brought out a pack of cards, shuffled them, and produced tricks to squeals of delight. Zeb stared as she performed sleight-of-hand tricks, made cards disappear, waved a hand over a few while with the other hid one up her sleeve. Sleight-of-hand He propped himself up on an elbow and watched, letting the images imprint themselves in his mind without conscious thought. A hand waved, a card disappeared and another one appeared, more happy squeals. She looked up a few times when she sensed his gaze, but he didn't move. Distraction she directed another look at him, gathered the cards, her kids, and led them away. Zeb lay still, staring at where they had been. Illusion. That time in Iraq. Then he was the butcher of the Middle East, a mysterious assassin who claimed to be an Al-Qaeda killer, out to exterminate Hand of Fire leaders who had broken away from Al-Qaeda. The butcher killed senior Hof commanders in Iraq, and after each kill, uploaded propaganda videos on the internet. In each video the butcher appeared with his face masked, an Al-Qaeda flag in the background, and proclaimed his intent to wipe out the treacherous hand of fire. The kills and videos not only stoked up the simmering conflict between the two terrorist groups, they lessened the impact of the recruitment drives of the two organizations. Western forces used the antagonism between the Hof and Al-Qaeda to mount strategic attacks and reclaim territory. The Hoff was on the back foot now, all because of the butcher. Dark fell and pinpricks of light pierced the vast canopy above. It was a similar night in Syria when he, disguised as the butcher, 
had waited for a Hof leader to finish his business with a prostitute. The terrorist was in no hurry, he started boasting about a master plan against the great Satan. Later that same year, Zeb had foiled a Hof terrorist attack in New York. Zeb lay there for the pixels to swim around, fall in place, rise again and rearrange themselves. An hour later when cold set in, the picture was still incomplete, but he had an idea what it would reveal. He rose, dusted himself, and headed to the Smithsonian metro stop. Something tugged the corner of his eye. He turned and saw a flag lying on the grass, the mother had forgotten it in her haste to escape his gaze. Zeb picked it up, folded it neatly, jogged back to the obelisk and draped it alongside several others on the steel fence surrounding the memorial. He fired up his laptop once he was back in his hotel room and ran searches. He read through the links, dug through several encrypted databases and got more downloads. He logged into Werner and looked up the searches the twins had programmed, the various trails the artificial intelligence program was pursuing to crack Petrova's letter. He commanded Werner with a separate series of tasks and logged off. He still didn't know who was behind Wasserman, but the picture was sharpening. Sleight of hand. The main action was elsewhere all along. Chapter 26 Wasserman hung up after a long call with the principal. The calls were getting fewer, now that the plan was rolling along smoothly, there was less need for communication. There was only one thorn that remained. Zeb Carter. He alone could possibly put together the squares. The principal was unable to get more on him. A couple of Pentagon generals had frowned when the principal had approached them. The principal backed off smoothly, inquisitiveness was good, but discretion was better. The fools questioned the Saudi and Venezuelan ministers, applied pressure on the governments, and got nothing for all that. That was a master stroke of misdirection, the principal congratulated Wasserman. Now all that's left is this man. Once you take care of him, we are home and dry. Wasserman stepped outside the ranch building, to the front yard and sat on a wooden bench taking in the night. Subdued sounds came from within the ranch, the kitchen winding down for the night, his men patrolling the building. The ranch had no guests, no visitors. He had shut down that operation till the plan was completed. In the distance, a match flared as one of the guards lit a smoke. Wasserman stifled his irritation. His men were good, so what if one of them indulged in a smoke? Where will Carter be? Where can I pin him down? He gave thought to it, and came to the reluctant conclusion that he couldn't. Carter seemed to be constantly on the move, going after him would consume his resources, would leave him thin. He considered attacking his office in New York. Carter's crew hung out there, just earlier in the day, one of his assets in the city had provided visual confirmation. It won't be easy. The Columbus Avenue building bristled with security, both human and electronic. Security consulting is his business after all. He'll have it locked down like a fortress. He brushed impatiently at the silken thread of a spider's web that clung stubbornly to his jacket. His head slowed when the thought crept in his mind. Walk into my parlor. Werner was sipping the electronic equivalent of carrot juice as it sorted through the Aramaic text and rearranged the letters and formed meaningful words from them. It paused for a nanosecond when another search string came its way and raised an eyebrow. It linked to another book that was conveniently loaded in its memory. It feverishly browsed the book and fist pumped when the book provided the missing keys. But wait, there was more to the search string. It frowned when it read the parameters. They weren't related to the letter, but were commands to dig out news on any oil-related developments in any part of the world, going back for two years. Werner shrugged. Who knew how humans thought? The search was easy, and it fired off spiders to trawl through the gazillions of electronic pages on the internet. Wasserman took stock of his men the next day, assessed them for capabilities, and was satisfied with what he saw. They were top-notch mercenaries, all of them ex-servicemen who had served in various armies of the world. Some were American, a few were South African, and the rest were Mexican and European. He knew all of them well and they knew him. 
he got one of them to drive him through the ranch and point out various security measures. There were motion detectors, pressure pads, night vision security cameras, electric fences, all monitored centrally from the ranch building. The corral was full of horses, he had men move the animals to a remote stable. The main building itself was under constant surveillance, every inch was covered by an electronic eye. They had enough weapons and ammunition to hold off a month-long siege. There were M16s, HK416 stairs and SIGs, complemented by numerous handguns. Wasserman nodded at his men. The showdown would happen here, on his home ground. Two days later, he made the call to his asset in New York. Werner finished printing the decoded sheets, and if it had human senses, it would have winced from the twin squeals. It separately printed all the oil developments in the country, but those were ignored temporarily. Bear, Chloe and Broker crowded around Megan and Beth as they read Petrova's letter aloud. The letter, addressed to Connor, was in a conversational tone that underlined the friendship between the two, and started starkly. I will most likely be dead once you read this. Six years back, I was in Cheyenne attending a reception organized by the mayor for several senators and visiting politicians from Europe, Mexico, and Argentina. The event was to promote the city and make it more attractive for investment and tourism. You know how these events go. I was invited by the mayor who knew me and wanted me to favorably cover the event. This particular shindig was no different from the thousands you and I have attended, and once I had completed my interviews, I took a break and went to the ladies' room. It was there that I had my first encounter with the man. I was alone in one of the stalls and was preparing to emerge when I heard the door open. There was no clacking of heels and that gave me pause. I was surprised when I heard a man speak on his phone and thought he must have come in by mistake. I decided to wait him out. That incident changed my life. That man was discussing certain arrangements and asked whether everything was in place. When he got a confirmation, he asked how whatever was being planned would be cleaned. You'll kill all of them, he asked. I froze at those words and for a moment I panicked. I must have made some kind of sound since he went quiet. The stalls in this hotel are fully enclosed with floor-to-ceiling concrete separators and hence he wouldn't know if any stall was occupied till he tried the doors. He did try them. I saw the knob on my door turning slowly and when it didn't give, it was released. I stood there for several moments and relaxed only when I heard the door slamming shut. I waited for several moments and when I didn't hear anything, I exited the stall. He was there. He was pointing his phone at my stall and his camera flashed when I emerged. I recognized him immediately and blind panic consumed me. I ran out without looking back and left the hotel immediately. I checked into another hotel in Lower Manhattan that evening, and it was only after several hours that I could calm down and think properly. The man I saw was one of the most recognized faces in the country. I didn't know what to do. I thought about going to the NYPD, but it would be just his word against mine, and what did I really have? A couple of words I overheard in a lady's room. I returned to Lander the next day, to my folks' place, filed my report for the event, and decided to investigate the man. Megan frowned and skimmed through the rest of the sheets rapidly. No name. Beth turned to Werner and typed out a string. Werner promptly came back with a message, no names were mentioned in the letter. Let's get on with it, we'll figure out the name later, Broker exclaimed impatiently. Megan turned back to the letter. I interviewed people who knew him and who had worked with him in various capacities. I said I was doing a background piece on him whenever I was asked. No one probed further. The man was so famous that such pieces were common. One night my pickup truck had its windows smashed and a message was left for me, tied to a brick. Back off, it said. I took it to the sheriff who said he would investigate, but I knew from his demeanor he wouldn't. I was right. Nothing came of his investigation. Probably some drunk kids, he shrugged. I continued digging, and a picture began to emerge of a ruthless man who tolerated no opposition. 
he invested in companies, and whenever he had a labor problem or shareholder disagreement, accidents happened. In one of his companies, an automotive parts manufacturer, the union leader had a fatal driving accident. He was drunk and the cops wrote it off as an accident while DUI. In another company, a couple of minority shareholders who disagreed with him were assaulted and their homes were burgled by masked hoods. Both were scared to speak, but when I assured them anonymity, they pointed at the man. The man had inherited his wealth, this was public knowledge. His parents were ranchers, humble people who worked hard. The man's wealth came from a relative in the family, and when she passed away, her wealth was left to him. I pulled out all details of investments and studied them. I made a dossier, but I have deliberately masked details for a reason you'll know later. Megan flipped to the last few pages. The first annexure ran to a few pages, but all names, dates, event details were filled with nonsensical letters and words. She expelled a frustrated breath, but carried on reading at Beth's urging. I spoke to a former private secretary of his. She had worked with him for a few years and had once filed a harassment case against him. That case had been quietly dropped. I couldn't find anything more on her, but finally located her in a small town in Maryland. She wouldn't confirm or deny anything, but hinted that he had bought her silence with a combination of threats and bribes. She let slip that in a different world, he would be in prison. I pressed her for more details but she clammed up, in fact she looked scared and even went on to say she could lose her life. I think my meeting her was the tripwire. They must have been tracking me or her because two weeks later, I was abducted. Three hooded men broke into my house late at night and dragged me to a waiting truck. I didn't have time to scream or raise my alarm, it was so smoothly and professionally done. My mouth was clamped shut with a large hand, and before I could draw breath, it was taped. My legs were swiftly bound and my thrashing was quickly subdued. I started panicking and started screaming behind my restraints, but my noises were muffled, and not a soul in Lander hurt me. I was thinking I would be dragged off and killed, but they had something worse planned for me. They dumped me in the back of the truck and drove me for hours, not stopping once. I passed out sometime in the night, and when I came to, I was lying on a crude bed in a shack in the middle of nowhere. There was a dim light in the room, but it was enough for me to see their unmasked faces. One was bald and broad and had a broken nose, another had marks on his face, and a third had a ponytail. They raped me for more than an hour, taking turns. I screamed and yelled and swore and cursed but there was no one to hear me. I passed out a few times but every time they slapped me or poured water on me and revived me. Beth took over the reading when Megan's fingers tightened on the sheet and her breath shuddered. I thought they would kill me once they had finished because their faces were uncovered, but they had other plans. The bald one leaned over me when they had finished and said this was the only warning I would get. They didn't mention the man, they didn't have to. The connection was obvious. I lay there for several hours when they left and when daylight came, I struggled and finally got myself free. I think they deliberately loosened my restraints because they wanted me to escape. I blacked out a couple of times while washing up. I walked for miles and then I came across a road and got a ride. It turned out that I was close to the Wind River Range. I got back to Lander and collapsed and didn't leave my bed for two days. On the third day, I decided to kin the story. I also decided not to go to the cops, I knew it wouldn't get me anywhere. I got myself tested by a discreet physician, and thankfully, I was free of any viruses or infection. I put my house on the market and within a week got offers for it. I took the first offer, closed my affairs in Lander and bought an apartment in Cheyenne. Connor, I thought a new life in a city would help me put everything behind me, but you know that isn't how it works. A story lives in us and pursues us till we publish it. I controlled myself initially, tried to forget the man, forget the rape, but the story didn't forget me. I started investigating again, but this time I used fake identities, used throwaway phones and used simple disguises, like a wig and glasses, when I met people. Connor, I know for sure the man will have more tripwires to warn him about me. However careful I am, I know I can't beat the security he has around him. 
Once he knows I am looking into him, he'll kill me. Obviously he won't do that himself. I wouldn't be surprised if my rapists come back one night and finish me off. I will not give you his identity, doing so will put you and your family in danger. However, there are enough clues in this letter. You are the best journalist I know, and you will be able to make him. My last interview was with one of his chauffeurs. That driver overheard too much and was sacked the same day. The next day, was nearly crushed to death by a runaway truck in New York. He died from his injuries, but not before he spoke to me. He had heard the man speaking on his phone, talking about something big. Something that would alter the balance of power in the world. It was that one line that got him killed. God bless. Your friend, Elena. Bear took the sheets from Beth's nerveless hands, went through them swiftly and looked at Broker. Can't we crack the code on the annexure? Broker grimaced. I'm pretty sure Werner would have, if it could. Unfortunately, while we know a bit more, we still don't know enough about the man. That poor woman, Beth shuddered. Connor said she was one of the best journalists in the country, probably in the world. I can't even imagine how she survived that rape. She must have been made of steel to come back from that horror. She thrust her chin at Bawana, her five-foot-seven frame quivering with rage, dwarfed by him. Her death should not be in vain. It won't, a voice called out, her rapists are dead. Zeb strode in the office and picked up the second set of papers Werner had printed. You know who he is? Megan asked him hopefully, after they had greeted him. Not yet, but we will know soon enough, and when we do, Elena Petrova will publish her story. Chapter 27 Wasserman finished his call to his asset in New York, the one who had reported Carter's presence in the city. Wasserman asked him to continue his surveillance, and after a few more instructions, hung up. He plugged his phone to his laptop and copied the recording of the call he had just made. He used a software application to break the audio file into smaller chunks and listen to each segment. He selected two segments and saved them in a separate folder. He sent the two files to an email address that belonged to an overweight kid who lived off a diet of soda, chocolates, and burgers. The kid was the best hacker he knew and frequently surfed the networks of the Pentagon and other high security organizations. His instructions to the hacker were simple. The two files were to be inserted into a telecom company's data feed. One file with the right words to alert Carter, the second to triangulate my location. Wasserman wasn't given to rubbing hands in satisfaction. Satisfaction to him was the burning fire of Remy Martin that sped through him. He finished his drink and called out for his men. A battle was looming. Wasserman was ready. Werner cocked an ear and sighed when he heard no instructions. These humans. At times they flooded him with instructions, at others, days went before he was put to work. It searched the internet for that cute supercomputer in China. Now that one was something. It had sleek lines, and its RAM and computing speed made Werner tremble in anticipation, and so it sent out an internet call. Chess. They could play chess. But wait, what was that? Werner paused and listened. Through the zettabytes of data that it trawled, a name flashed. Zeb Carter. Werner forgot the cute computer and chased the data packet that contained the name. It was a fragment from a voice call with more words before and after the name. Watch him and New York were part of the fragment. Werner checked the fragment. Was it large enough? Maybe but no harm in trying. It ran a voice print match and in seconds got a reply. The fragment was Wasserman's voice. Fist pump. It went back to the source of the data stream and searched for more nuggets. Hours later it struck gold. The second packet was bundled with other streams and hence was harder to spot. But it had the same voice print and this time the fragment was fuller. Let me know when he leaves the city. Where did these originate from? Where was the caller? Werner pulled up a geographic map, laid out the cell phone towers the fragments had touched, 
looked up the various cell phone numbers and then traced the numbers to owners. The phone was registered to an address in Wyoming, a ranch near Evanston. Werner ran one last check. Yeah, that same cell phone had made a few calls way back in time which had the same voice print. Wasserman's voice. Werner flashed the address on its screen, put its feet up and grabbed the carrot juice. It was the best in the world. It had no competition. This isn't about oil ministers, is it? Broker queried Zeb when they had studied the rest of the printouts and also the address Werner had flashed. Nope. It is beyond and deeper than that. Roger rolled his eyes. We could drill a hole and reach the other side of the earth before Zeb started spilling what he knows. Zeb smiled briefly, looked up a Bloomberg chart on the computer and beckoned them with a follow me gesture. He led them to the bubble, where he dialed out to Claire. I think you need General Klaus sitting on this ma'am, he told her when she came on. She hung up and he called minutes later when he got her text message. The general growled at Broker when he came on the line. Broker, you're taking good care of your ass I notice while Zeb puts his on the line. My ass is better looking than his, came the retort. It needs to be looked after. Claire cut through the banter. You found something Zeb. This isn't about oil. It is ma'am. But not in the way we were thinking of. He explained at length to an audience that was silent, except for a sharply drawn breath from Claire. No one spoke for a minute when he had finished, and then the general's voice came on in disbelief. Six years and no one noticed? Why would anyone, sir? These are pretty common occurrences in the business world. Even so, someone would have noticed that the wells have stopped producing, Claire protested. It's not an uncommon phenomenon, Zeb explained. I looked up the data before this chain of events started. Wells were running dry, were shutting down due to lack of funds ever since fracking began. This is the Wild West all over again. There is this enormous natural resource underneath us that promises energy independence, and everyone wants to pile in on it. In the clamor, what's a few wells shutting down? They heard a clicking sound, General Klaus playing with his pen in frustration. But what's the end game? It's all very well to buy a few wells. So what? Zeb told them, and the temperature in two offices in Washington, D.C. dropped. Are you sure? Yes, sir, but my findings won't stand up in a court. We'll take care of that, Claire was brisk all business. Do you know who's behind it? Not yet, but I know who does. Why are you hanging around then? Go ask him. It won't be pretty. Zeb admitted. What happens to our country won't be either if we don't stop them. General Klaus's voice was hard and unrelenting. So when are you folks heading out? Beth's voice was muffled as she spoke around a mouthful of yogurt. Bawana grinned and waited for her to swallow before responding. Bossman says we need to ammo up and understand Wasserman's ranch before we go in guns blazing. A week from his return, he said. Bawana, Roger and the twins were in a cafe near their office, a favorite haunt of the twins. Zeb had left for DC following the call and was briefing Claire in greater detail, laying out the trail that led to Wasserman. In his absence, Bawana, Roger and Bear had stocked the Lear with enough equipment and weapons to mount an attack on a small country. Broker had reached out to his network and had amassed as much intel on the ranch and its inhabitants. All hard as nails badasses, he commented, tossing the files at Bawana and Roger. All of them are ex-servicemen. All were discharged from their militaries dishonorably. Wasserman has assembled a bunch of scum who know how to fight. Roger sat silently, gazing through the glass windows of the cafe, watching the city go by. The plan was for the bear, Bawana, Roger and Zeb to attack the ranch while broker Chloe and the twins based themselves in the nearby ranch. He was jolted out of his reverie when Bawana punched him in the shoulder. You good to go, bro? Yeah. One week can't go quick enough. Bear, Bawana, Roger and Zeb were in Evanston two days later. They had flown commercial to Jackson separately, had rendezvoused there, 
collected their equipment in one of their vehicles, and had driven across rugged country. You think he fell for it? Bear yelled at Zeb who was driving with the sunroof slid open. Zeb slid a glance at him and suppressed a smile at the sight of Bear's beard quivering against the force of the wind. Only one way to find out. Zeb figured Wasserman had deliberately made his call on unsecure phones to draw them in. He'll probably have someone watching us. He made a few calls and arranged for decoys, four men who were similar in looks to the four of them, and using a rear exit that very few knew of, the four had left New York behind. Bawana leaned forward and shouted in his ear. So what's the plan? Same as always. Go in hard, get our man, get his intel, shut him down and then shut down the man. They were ten miles away from the ranch when he left US-189 and followed a barely visible dirt track that cut across the country and curved in the direction of the ranch. He drove the dust-colored vehicle into a thicket when they were eight miles away, and they unloaded their gear in silence. From satellite photographs they knew the ranch's boundary, three miles from where they were, had wired fencing, but beyond that they knew little of Wasserman's security. They waited till dark had set in and when the first stars appeared, they set out in a single file, Zeb ahead, Bawana bringing up the rear. They moved like ghosts on the flat land, leaving no trail behind, and when they saw the flash of wire in nightlight, they halted. They spread out and dropped down while Bawana carefully unwrapped a case and brought out a drone. It was dull black with the same anti-reflective surface that was seen on stealth aircraft, and was equipped with emission neutralization technology. The drone, like other stealth aircraft, left a barely visible signature on radar. Zeb had used the drone on several missions, but this one was an upgrade, and bristled with more technology than he cared to name. As long as it can fly undetected and take video and stills. It rose silently with Roger at the control, Bear and Bawana on a monitor to guide him. It hovered once over them and vanished into the dark. Four cameras switched on beneath the rotors and sent a single feed to the monitor, a feed that never failed to surprise Zeb with its crystalline clarity. Night vision technology combined with. Broker voice trailed off when he saw the disinterest on Zeb's face. Infrared beams, Bear grunted when the drone pinged the night and got back an acknowledgement. That's probably the first line of defense. Can it detect pressure pads? Bawana asked hopefully. Nope. But with your build, who needs pressure pads? First sentry, Zeb interrupted them. Hold it right there. They watched the guard pace along the side of the main building, keeping close to its shadows. Roger played with the controls and zoomed in on his face and pointed silently at the night vision goggles around his neck. Bear whistled softly when the man turned around and his rifle came into view. That's an HK-417, uses NATO rounds. Wasserman has his men well equipped. The drone moved on and spotted eight more patrolling men, all similarly equipped and when it had completed a full circle, Roger hovered it out of sight of the first lighted window. He lit a thermal imager on the drone, and orange and yellow blobs appeared on one half of the monitor. An hour later, they had an idea of the layout of the main building, and another hour later, they got to know the outer buildings. All empty. I guess Wasserman cleared them out, knowing what was coming. Bawana tapped the monitor and zoomed in on one of the stables zoomed out again when they saw it was deserted. Thirteen men. Zeb looked at his crew, seeking confirmation. Yeah. And I think we spotted Wasserman in one of those rooms. Bear agreed. Fourteen then. We're still good to go. He could have forty in there and we'd still be good. Bawana snorted. Zeb bumped fists with them silently, watched them pack their gear and split. The three men would position themselves in a rough triangle while he made his entry. Zero, he called out while driving away, and got three acknowledgements in his bone phone. Zero came before action. Zero was the call to ready the beast. Chapter 28 Zeb reached a private airstrip after two hours of hard driving, made his way to the deserted building deserted but for the solitary figure lounging against its wall. 
The figure straightened when the SUV's headlights caught him and approached the vehicle sideways, an arm shielding his eyes from the bright lights. Zeb turned off the beams and night reclaimed itself again. You, Zeb Carter. The man's voice was rough and gravelly, as if it shaped words rarely. Zeb gripped his hand silently and followed the man to a disused runway on which stood a Cessna Citation, its nose pointing toward the stretch of concrete that blurred into the night. You've done this before. The pilot's voice was flat, a statement not a question. Zeb didn't reply. He laid down the gear he was carrying, a halo chute in gray, coated with the same specialty chemicals that were painted on the drone, a bodysuit that he donned, handgun, blade and magazines, and finally a small backpack that he strapped on. The pilot helped him with the chute, his oxygen mask and tank, adjusted the backpack so that it wouldn't interfere with the rest of his gear, and when he was ready, Zeb gave him a thumbs up, and the night came to life with the roar of engines. The Cessna gained altitude, and when it reached 40,000 feet, it circled and headed to the coordinates Zeb had given the pilot. The night was clear, the sky was empty, the air was cold, and the universe was Zeb's when he left the comfort of the plane. The dials on his wrist read out his speed and counted down to chute opening, but Zeb didn't glance at them, the clock in his head was running down silently, and the beast inside him kept track of the speed. Zeb glanced down saw just shades of dark. He looked up, the Cessna was out of sight. He was alone in the cold vastness, just the wind for company. One minute. He ran through his landing sequence, flexed his toes and fingers inside his suit. Two minutes. He tapped a panel on his left arm and it glowed to life, a fast-moving dot showing his position. He pulled when 3,000 feet separated him from ground, when he was falling at more than 100 miles an hour. The chute tugged and unfurled above, the mad descent stopped abruptly and became gentle, slower. He corrected for drift, and through the thin wisps of clouds saw the darkness shape itself into the ranch, which morphed into its component buildings as he drew closer. In another minute he was on top of the main building, a couple of feet away from where he had planned to be. He removed the chute swiftly, folded it, and thrust it under a metal grating, and the bodysuit followed. He was down to his combat suit beneath which he wore his armor, he strapped his weapons, mounted his backpack, and tested his mic and got answering clicks. About time too, Bawana mumbled softly. The top of the building was flat and smooth and free of sentries. Zeb had landed over what was the living room, the largest room in the building, which ran to its side and front and opened into several other rooms. He went along the roof to the rear of the building, lay face down and peered over the edge. The first guard came into sight ten minutes later, and he timed the man's movement. The guard disappeared round a corner, and instead of returning, another man emerged. A rolling patrol, smart move, reduces monotony. But maybe not so smart, or else they would have watchers on the roof. They figured no one would get past their perimeter, but didn't think of a halo jump. Wasserman paced the living room uneasily, his eyes constantly flicking between the windows and the hallways in sight. It was two in the morning, a time when the rest of the world was asleep. He had cut back on his sleep ever since his man had confirmed Carter's presence in New York, in his planned attack in five days. He was prepared, there was no more communication with the principal, but he was still uneasy. The last time he had felt like this was in Sudan, just before his team had been ambushed. He turned into the hallway, walked past several rooms and entered the control room. Rows of monitors faced him all carrying camera images. A man in thick glasses, Carl Nickel, his security man monitored them constantly, his head bobbing to a beat that piped into his ears through thick headphones. Wasserman tapped Carl's shoulder in irritation, he told the man several times not to listen to music. Music dulled the senses, slowed reaction times. Did Carl listen? No. Anything. The headphones came off, the head shook. Nothing, boss. The night's deader than a corpse. See for yourself. He turned the central monitor in Wasserman's direction, who waved it away impatiently. Radar. All quiet. Infrared's cool too. Patrols up? Yeah. They aren't even smoking. The disquiet didn't go away. He pulled out his phone and called his man in New York. 
The phone rang several times before a sleep-laden voice came on. The voice sharpened when his man heard Wasserman's voice. Yeah, Carter was still in the city. He had seen him just that morning at the cafe. He had two other men with him. Wasserman made to hang up, but something stopped him and he barked a question. The man stifled a yawn. Did Carter go regularly? No. It was the first time he had been to the cafe. The words went through Wasserman's ears, raced through his brain, and even before it had decoded their import, his mouth opened in a warning yell. The phone died in his hand. He cursed and tried again but got no signal. Carl was looking at him blankly, music still spewing through his headphones. Wasserman spotted his phone, grabbed it, and tossed it away when he got no signal. He ripped the man's headset off. Connect me to the patrol. Nickel read his voice and silently passed him a headset. Wasserman shouted into it but got no reply. He tried again and flung the headset in rage. He grabbed Nickel and hauled him up. We're under attack. Go warn the men. We have no comms. He shoved the man toward the door and watched him stumble out. He turned to the monitors and peered closely at each one of them. The lights went out. The generators kicked in, and they came back in a second. Floodlights lit the outside of the ranch and turned night into day. Not for long. The outside lights went out one by one till the night reclaimed its territory. Bear put down his M24 after shooting down the lights from his side and watched the drone hover over the front of the building. He nudged it forward gently and when it had reached the end, circled it back. Roger had shot out the floodlights at his end and was operating a similar drone at the rear of the ranch. Both carried jammers for mobile and radio networks which were effective up to a mile. Did I miss anything? Bawana murmured in their bone phones. He glanced at a monitor in front of him which had a split view. One received images from the body cam on the front of Zeb's suit, the other from the rear body cam. I hustled my ass for a mile, slice through the power cables, then crawl forward so that I'm just within a mile of the ranch and find that you're still enjoying the view. Get to work Zeb. He complained. He didn't wait for a response, knowing it wouldn't be forthcoming. He turned to the bulky case by his side, stripped it open to reveal his favorite sniping rifle, the M82. He assembled it, laid it on a bipod, mounted a night force scope and his universe was bathed in hues of green. He slapped a 10-round magazine in the Barrett, pulled the gun against his shoulder, rested his cheek against his stock and settled down. Zeb's bodysuit was coated with a friend identifier that glowed through Bawana's night vision. He mounted a last device on the underside of the barrel, a mini-computer that gave self-aiming capabilities to the weapon. Such mini-computers had started making an appearance commercially, but this one went further. It synced with the drone's images on the monitor, and calculated angles, humidity, wind speeds, and gave the sniper the ability to shoot blind. He went into his breathing cycle and waited. Zeb waited for the sentry to go past his position, and then slithered down silently using a drain pipe and the webbing on his gloves to slow his descent. He wasn't too worried about the guard turning around to spot him, but Juana's clicks in his ear meant he was covered and the drones had spotted him. He landed, lay prone on the ground and listened. He thought he heard muffled shouting from within the ranch, but the structure was solid and he couldn't be sure. He tapped the wall, some kind of wood, a solid build that offered shelter and sanctuary. Not against a .50 calories bullet. He rose and went after the guard who disappeared round the corner. The guard was fumbling with his radio when Zeb reached him and felled him with the barrel of his gun. He caught the man, grabbed his rifle and stopped it from clanking and with a swift glance behind him, dragged him away from the building and after securing him thrust him against a bush. He started out and stopped just in time when a warning hiss sounded in his ear. Another guard had just appeared and looked around in confusion, the other sentry should have crossed him. Zeb saw him take a step forward and collapse like a sack when his head disappeared. He rushed forward, dragged the body and concealed it in deep shadow. He peered round the corner, spotted the window that would give him entry to the kitchen. Kitchen's the least used room in a house full of men. 
He timed his move but before he could thrust forward, a window opened behind him and a voice called out. Sergey. Zeb bent low and turned around to find a man with glasses peering out, away from him. The voice called out again, low and urgent. The head turned in his direction. Zeb was close enough to him to see the man's eyes widen behind the thick glasses, and then the man was falling, his shout muffled against Zeb's glove, and then he stopped moving. Zeb was dragging him away, when a voice exclaimed in surprise from close behind him. He flung himself away, twisted on his back, his gun materializing from thin air. It spoke once but the guard staggered twice, once from Zeb's shot, the other from the giant hammer that Bawana triggered from 900 yards away. Thanks Bawana. Next time can you not leave it so late? Zeb said breathlessly as he dragged both the bodies away. Bawana's chuckle broke into his ear. Just keeping you on your toes bro. He waited for Zeb to emerge from the thicket. The sooner you go in, the better Zeb. Next time we may not be so lucky. Roger, Zeb acknowledged. There were initially nine men outside, five inside, now those were reduced to six and four. But those six could turn up at any time. Bear and Roger were keeping track of them, but their warning could be too late. He ran back to the window the spectacled man had opened, extracted his cable camera, and peered inside. It was well lighted but empty. He could see a hallway through the half-open door. I can go back to the kitchen, but Wasserman knows he's under attack now. He might have a man there. He signaled to his watching men and hoisted himself over the sill and was inside. A second later, he turned off the light and the room went dark. Roger's voice drawled softly. Now all you gotta do is find Wasserman. How hard can that be? Carl, Wasserman called out from the control room. He waited for a few more minutes, swore under his breath, went to a cabinet and removed a Kevlar vest. He tightened it around him, pocketed a Smith & Wesson spare mags, grabbed a flashlight and peered cautiously. He turned off the control room's lights and moved out with his gun arm extended. He spoke into radio, cursed himself mentally when he remembered, called out softly. Jake? Yeah. We're under attack. Warn the others. See if you can locate Carl. He went to warn those outside. Radio is down. Cell phones aren't working either, boss. I know that, damn it. Why do you think I'm talking out loud to you? Jake moved off, stopped when he called out again. Get them all inside. We are too thin inside. Yeah. He heard Jake drifting away, thought of telling him not to poke his head outside, there were likely to be snipers, but discarded the thought. His men were experienced, this was basic tradecraft. There were ten more rooms on the ground floor other than the living room and the control room, study, kitchen, dining room, bathrooms, bedrooms. Wasserman had three men spread out downstairs and two upstairs to cover the empty bedrooms. Two not three downstairs. Carl's probably dead. He took two steps ahead, paused and turned back. Perimeter security is down. But the house has cameras inside, which are powered by generator. He went back to the control room, moved the mouse and brought up the camera feeds. Six cameras, all of them panning the various hallways below, all of them concealed in the fire alarm detectors. Living room to kitchen was empty. That shadow there turned out to be one of his men. Passage to main bedrooms was empty. One other hallway had his man looking alert, his back to a wall, covering all the entrances that he could see. Carter could be anywhere. Wasserman rose, picked up his gun and turned to leave. The flicker of movement caught his eye. Utility room. Carter was heading down the hallway, leading away from it. That would go past the kitchen where Darren was located, and further down was Pickles. Wasserman's lips twisted in anticipation. Carter was trapped. Chapter 29 Zeb moved out of the room, down the passage which was 20 feet long and had several doorways. He peered through the first one, it was an indoor gym. The next one was a storage room, the third was empty. It's a big ranch, rooms to spare which can be converted to bedrooms. 
The next doorway was wider and brightly lit from within. He crouched, thrust his cable camera through. Kitchen. The kitchen was large, as big as the ground floor of many modern homes. Wooden cabinets gleamed, the double-door refrigerator hummed softly, and oven's red light winked on and off. He watched for a long time but there was no movement from inside, his radar didn't ping. He rose and continued down the hallway. Too quiet. Then it wasn't anymore. He threw himself flat down when the shadow fell on the floor ahead. A barrel poked through first and ripped open blindly. Lead shredded walls and threw up debris and dust. The gunman appeared, crouched low, his eyes searching, his HK seeking. He lost a fraction of a second, expecting to find Zeb at chest level. His first round collapsed the gunman's right leg, the second caught him high on the shoulder, and the third went into his head. Zeb rose and moved forward, knowing the shooting would draw other hoods in. He raised a leg to step over the dead shooter, when he felt a presence behind him. Shooter The gunman came out of nowhere, probably from the kitchen. His trigger finger was whitening, his eyes were cold. Zeb threw himself back, slid down, but knew it was too late. There wasn't any room in the narrow passage. A single burst would find him. The heavy bullet left Bawana's M82 at close to 3,000 feet per second. Its armor-piercing capability was designed to stop trucks, aircraft, and even tanks. It punched through the first three brick walls and lost a little speed and kinetic energy, but even what was left was enough. The shooter disintegrated in front of Zeb's eyes. His body collapsed like a sack, the HK clanked to the floor. Zeb took a deep breath and collected himself. He made sure both the gunmen were dead and looked down the hallway. How did they know I was here? The walls were bare, nothing hanging off them behind which cameras could be concealed. He looked at the lights. The fixtures were too small to hold anything. The fire alarm detectors on the ceiling caught his eye. He shot them out in tight bursts and got another idea. He took thin spoons from the kitchen, shut the doors of all the rooms in the hallway, and jammed them tight by wedging the spoons underneath them. All the gunmen outside have moved in now, Bear warned him. His voice grew taut. Shooter on your nine. None of us can take a shot. Too much interference. No cover ahead. No cover behind. I jammed all the open doors shut. Cover worked both ways. Zeb counted down to two in his mind and opened up with his Glock, firing through the separating wall, left to right, top to bottom. He followed up with another burst, and when he had finished, he leapt high in the air with his legs outstretched. He jammed them against the two opposite walls, grabbed his gun between his teeth and using his hands to power himself spidered up toward the ceiling. People registered objects at eye level first, even trained operatives. High up versus eye level. It gave him an advantage. He cocked his head and listened and watched. No gunman appeared. He's down. About four feet ahead of you, on the floor. He isn't moving. Bear called out. Zeb fired another burst in the direction of the body, crabbed forward, and used the cable camera around the wall. The shooter was dead. You doing that Jackie Chan thing again, aren't you? Bawana's voice was low and steady, as if it was another day at the office. They are seven down now. That many more left. The three of us will take our shots. We might get lucky and get a few. The living room was empty but warm when Wasserman entered. The fire crackling away was the only sound in the house. He had heard shooting in the corridors, but he knew Carter had come out on top. The lack of comms was crippling, and the enormity of the ranch added to his problems. Grudgingly he admitted that so far Carter had beaten all his planning. He had gotten one of his men to peer out, using NVGs to see if the snipers could be located. That man was lucky to be alive. The bullet that appeared had grazed his cheek and had gone through two walls. Wasserman lowered his gun arm and headed to the fireplace to stir the logs. He picked up the poker and bent over the fire and stilled when the voice came from behind a couch. Quite the place you have here. 
Zeb rose from behind the couch nearest to a window, his gun trained on Wasserman. He gestured silently, and the poker dropped. Wasserman's gun dropped at another voiceless command. He stared silently at the man who had started it all. Not quite, but he was the executor. Wasserman met his gaze, his green eyes steady, strands of his long white hair waving and bending from the hiss of the flames. Mr. Carter, I presume, Wasserman's eyes flicked sideways for a moment. That hair's too long. That voice. A second voice came from behind his left shoulder, a rich voice that he was more familiar with. You're not the only one who uses decoys, Carter. Zeb threw himself backward and crashed through the window when the first shot blew a hole through where he had been. More spits of flame lanced out and followed his flight, but he had dropped to the ground and rolled away in the darkness. Sorry, Zeb, Bawana was apologetic. Neither drone picked him up. My scope can't see through walls. A head popped out of the window Zeb had exited through, and snapped back hastily when a round burst through the remaining glass. Need to get back in. Bear and Roger read his mind, and directed him round the curving wall of the ranch, to a room that didn't have any glowing thermal sign. Zeb rose cautiously, tried the window, it swung easily. Hot night, open windows. Or a trap. Can any one of you see me? He spoke for the first time. I got you dude, a Texan voice drawled. Hop right in, I'll cover you. I've got an idea. Bear Raj, why don't you get one drone on Wasserman using his heat sig? The other can circle and spot the remaining shooters. Bear swore softly at Bawana's suggestion. Men's got brains. But why didn't you think this up sooner? I carry the gear. I do the shooting. You want me to do the thinking too. Bawana's voice trailed off, and seconds later a heavy round crashed far behind Zeb. Got one. But Zeb this isn't foolproof. Zeb nodded in the darkness and clambered into the room. An unused bedroom, going by the pristine condition of its furniture. He peered through the darkened corridor and ran the layout of the ranch in his mind from what he had seen. He positioned himself and headed back in the direction of the living room. That room commanded the best view, that room was where Wasserman would be. He knows I want him alive. He will draw me in. Wasserman trapped him. The first sign of it was a yell in his ears, and then came a stream of shots through the walls from way behind him. Zeb raced to the end of the hallway, checked out empty rooms, rejected them for not enough cover or escape routes. He entered a game room, navigated a pool table, and headed to another exit. He poked his head through the door and ducked back rapidly. Two gunmen Wasserman, the real one between them. A gunman somewhere behind, shooting through walls. More will join either end. The shooters with Wasserman opened up, a barrage of rolling thunder that made holes through the wall and struck equipment. A ball punctured and bounced limply on the floor. A baseball bat shuddered. The gunmen were efficient. They changed magazines one at a time while the other continued firing. The barrage became a roar when the shooter behind was joined by Moore and sought to pin Zeb down. Zeb bent to a crouch, then fell flat and considered his options. There weren't any. The two exits were covered. There were no windows. Dust and wooden splinters flew through the air. My men aren't shooting. Probably don't have the angles. Bullets came closer to where he was. Seeking him at ground level. This place will have more holes than Swiss cheese, and I'm right in its center. I give up, he yelled. What are you doing? Bear roared in his ears. I surrender, he shouted again, and one gun fell silent. He repeated his words again, and after a pause, Wasserman replied. Throw your gun out. Show yourself. Hands raised. You know the drill. Don't, it's a trap. Bawana warned. Zeb flung his Glock through the doorway. He rose and thrust one hand out cautiously, then another, and at Wasserman's command, emerged fully. Wasserman, about ten feet away, jerked his head, 
and one of the gunmen came forward and patted Zeb down. Stop shooting. We have him. Wasserman yelled at his men. A muffled reply came back, and the shooting from behind stopped. The gunman relieved Zeb of his magazines and benchmade, and at their sight, Wasserman's eyes narrowed. Just those? Search him thoroughly. He'll have more weapons on him. The shooter shook his head. That's all he's got. How do you communicate with your snipers? Zeb didn't reply, the shooter found the bone phone and smashed it. He looked into the body cam in the front, raised his middle finger at those watching the feed, and smashed it. He destroyed the rear camera, and went back to Wasserman. Shall we kill him? Wasserman didn't reply, his green eyes were narrowed and when he spoke his voice was thoughtful. You knew we wanted you alive. That's why you surrendered. What game are you playing, Carter? Does he have explosives on him? He snapped at the searcher. He's clean, boss. He can't do any harm. Wasserman pursed his lips thoughtfully but didn't come closer, didn't leave the sanctuary of the two men beside him. Secure him, he snapped an order and the same gunman stepped forward. He took two steps forward, paused when a barrage of shots sounded from both the front and the back of the house. He looked back at Wasserman who jerked his head impatiently and came on. He slung his HK behind his back when he was clear of the two behind him. Plastic ties came out of his pockets and he had his arms outstretched when the bullet shredded the wall on his right, tore through his chest cavity and embedded in the next wall. The second man with Wasserman gaped in shock and took a step forward to take a better look. No. Wasserman shouted and grabbed him, but it was too late. Another round burst through the wall and killed the second gunman. The shooter started falling sideways, but Wasserman moved swiftly to intervene. He grabbed his man by his collar, hauled him upright demonstrating tremendous strength, and used his body as a shield. Wasserman peered from behind his shield and trained his gun on Zeb. In the temporary silence the soft whirring of rotors could be heard, and from behind Wasserman, Zeb made out the dark shape of a drone in the hallway. That's how Bawana got his eyes. Your sniper doesn't have the angle to take me, does he? Wasserman's visible green eye gloated at Zeb. Too bad. He won't get another chance. He raised his gun and fired. It clicked on empty. The eyes widened for a moment and dropped to Zeb's gun that lay between them. Zeb dived for it but lost vital moments in avoiding the dead shooter Wasserman thrust his way. Wasserman got his hand on the gun and was raising it when Zeb snapped it out of his hand with a cutting blow that would have broken another man's wrist. He kicked the gun behind him and faced Wasserman. The two men stood poised for a moment, the air vibrating and throbbing between them. I have to hand it to you, Carter. I throw everything at you, but you keep coming. But it ends here. I'll take you apart, and when I'm done your men will have to search for your pieces. He attacked without warning, coming in low, going for Zeb's throat and abdomen using feints and decoys to disguise his attack. Zeb fell back against the ferocity of the onslaught, his movement restricted by the shooter's bodies. He narrowly avoided a blow to his throat, rolled, and caught it on his shoulder. His side flamed into fire. He ignored it, trapped Wasserman's hand on its return, and applied a lock. Wasserman broke the lock easily, and his lips curled when he read Zeb's eyes. You're not the only one who's trained in rare fighting skills, Carter. Before he had finished, his left leg rose in a paralyzing blow. Zeb parried but Wasserman was lightning, he anticipated the move, reversed and a hammer sank into Zeb's middle. Zeb doubled over and Wasserman applied a chokehold. Zeb let his body sag before the hold tightened and the sudden weight caught Wasserman off guard. Zeb slipped out of the hold and went on the attack, but Wasserman wasn't there. The mercenary had stepped back and was dancing lightly on his feet. Zeb drew air through his lungs, whirled round and fled when Wasserman surged forward to attack. An incredulous laugh rose from Wasserman, and he followed. Zeb timed his steps and at the third he rose in the air, pivoted off the wall and turned on Wasserman. 
The sudden move caught the chasing man unaware, and he slowed, and then Zeb was on him. He chopped at the mercenary's body, catching him on the neck. He numbed his thigh with a brutal kick. Wasserman fell back, and for the first time he went on the defensive. That didn't last long. Barely had Zeb landed when he launched an attack. What's with you, Carter? He punctuated his words with a hammer blow that caught Zeb on the side of his head. What drives you? Who was Petrova to you? You think you are Batman? His leg whirled in a spinning kick, Zeb blocked it, but couldn't evade the hard edge of Wasserman's palm to his ribs and dimly he felt something crack inside him. Have to end this soon. You're on a vengeance mission. Because something happened to you. The words burned through the air, seeped through him and he hesitated for a moment. Wasserman grabbed the opportunity to repeat the blow on his cracked rib. White heat lanced through Zeb and his breath caught. Wasserman's eyes were narrow behind his constantly moving hands. That's it, isn't it? You lost someone? Your family? What happened to them? He whirled like a dervish, his arms and legs swinging like a deadly scythe, creating a spinning force Zeb couldn't penetrate. Someone killed your wife? Kids. The ranch flew away, wall by wall. Barren earth took its place. Darkness covered them. Thick. Heavy. Oppressive. You know what I do to wives. I rape them, and then I cut their breasts. A hand flashed. Zeb caught it on his cheek. His ears rang. Nothing subdues a man quicker than seeing his wife's breasts stuffed in her genitals. Wasserman's words came to him from a distance over the roaring in his ears. The darkness bore down on them. Slowed their movements as if they were underwater. A knife-edged hand came his way, floating slowly. He bent under it, caught it, but it slipped away. A second hand followed. He parried just in time. He tried to attack, but his limbs felt leaden. If that doesn't tame men, I go after their children. He saw Wasserman's mouth move. The lips shaped to form words. Then the words reached him. He read them. Processed them. By then Wasserman had dived past him. A slow motion move, strangely elegant, his body aimed like an arrow, his green eyes unblinking on Zeb. Zeb turned slowly to face him. Wasserman's hand reached the gun. His fingers curled around it. Started raising it. Pity you don't have a wife or kids. I checked. Imagine what I would have done to them. The mercenary's voice faded in and out. The gun rose, turned slowly in Zeb's direction. Bet you would have a pretty wife. Just thinking of her. Zeb didn't know when he moved. His chest was tight with a pressure he had never felt before. His legs moved of their own volition. Then he was on Wasserman looking down into his eyes. His hands wrestled with the gun in the mercenary's grip. I would have made you watch. Wasserman's voice was strained as he threw his weight behind the gun. The barrel inched toward Zeb. I would have made you see her face. The darkness compressed into a thin line. It snaked and sped its way to Zeb. Entered him. Spread through him. Engulfed him till he became darkness. Wasserman's words came slower. I would have then started on your children. The darkness moved. It crushed Wasserman's wrist. It snapped his elbow like a matchstick. It dislocated his shoulder and turned the limb to jelly. The darkness flew inside the gun. Became the bullet. It turned into flame and motion and speed, and death flew out. Chapter 30 the Uinta County Sheriff rolled up early in the morning to investigate flashes and pops that neighbors had reported. He was met with blank-faced men, dressed in dark suits, wearing shades even though the sun hadn't risen. They spun him a tail and handed a phone to him. The sheriff spoke into it briefly, decided he had other battles to wage, and his patrol car disappeared. 
Gowana walked around the ranch with Roger and Bear when the sun rose and inspected his shooting. He rapped on a wall with his knuckles. Cedar, maybe pecan too. Probably cut from trees on the ranch. Solid looking, but unfortunately not good enough against armor piercing rounds. You'd planned to shoot blind all along? Bear poked a stubby finger through a bullet hole and shook his head at the size of it. Zeb and I had discussed it. We had enough live practice, but every mission is different. I took the first shot randomly, and when I found it worked. He shrugged. Once Wasserman's shooter had smashed Zeb's body cams and bone phone, Roger and Bear had raced to the ranch and had taken out the remaining gunman. Bawana had remained in hiding to pilot one drone and fire whenever opportunity arose. He had seen every detail of the fight on his monitor, played silently, since the drones didn't have audio pickup capabilities. He had shouted the question uppermost in their minds when they finally reached Zeb. Do you have a death wish? His friend had stared back at them with those dark eyes that had depths no one had plumbed. Roger kicked the hard ground when they stopped to bathe in the sun, looked at the ranch and shook his head in disbelief. I can't believe he didn't surround the ranch with better protection. Bear's grin was white through his beard. Good for us. He probably thought he would never be found and saw no need. Besides, don't forget this was also a dude ranch. It had to be as authentic as possible. They went inside, walked past a specialist recovery team that the agency used to sanitize incidents, and joined Zeb who was looking over Megan's shoulder. She was running Wasserman's hard drive through a decryption program, while her sister and broker were working on other electronic trails. Chloe was working on the paper trail, her petite frame almost invisible behind heaps of files. Broker, Chloe and the twins were camped in Evanston when the takedown happened, and had rushed to the ranch as soon as Wasserman had been killed. Broker had barred the rest of the crew from helping them. This is quite different from pressing a lever on a gun, he had said in a superior tone. Zeb looked up and shook his head at Roger's raised eyebrow. Loads of stuff in here that connects all the dots but nothing on the man yet. Give us time Zeb. Megan said impatiently. And get out of here. These geeks need room to think, Chloe chimed in. Bawana narrowed his eyes at Zeb once they were outside again. You know who he is, don't you? I know how to find him. One month later. The principal exited his limo, nodded a greeting to the restaurant manager who held the door open for him and escorted him to his seat. His security detail flanked out and positioned themselves inside and outside the restaurant. The restaurant on 14th Street was a discreet one which catered to the powerful and the wealthy. It had earned a reputation for being a safe haven, where its patrons could dine and discuss business without fear of being eavesdropped on or harassed by paparazzi. The principal had been frequenting the eatery for several years and was treated like royalty, which he was. He sat on the comfortable cushion with a gentle sigh, looked around and didn't see anyone he recognized. They all recognized him of course, his face was splashed on TV regularly. The waiter approached and placed a cup of coffee in front of him, made to his liking. He thanked the man wordlessly and picked the menu up even though he knew what he was going to order. It was the same order he placed every day, every year. A southwestern omelette made with two eggs, seasoned with the herbs of his choice, accompanied with a plate of finely sliced bacon and a large glass of freshly made apple juice. He put down his menu to place his order, and started at the sight of the man sitting opposite him. The stranger was lean, brown-haired and had dark eyes that seemed to swirl and eddy. He looked behind at two of his security personnel who were rushing toward his table, their hands reaching inside their jackets. He shook his head imperceptibly. The man was empty-handed, it wouldn't do for his men to be violent in the presence of other guests. I am having a private breakfast, he told the stranger. I would appreciate it if I were left alone. I am sure you would. But today, you have me for company. The man snapped out his napkin and placed it neatly over his lap. He helped himself to a glass of water and drank it, his eyes never leaving the principal's face. 
I'm sorry I don't know you. I really don't want company. I am Zeb Carter. You have probably heard of me. Relax I'm here just to talk. The stranger did not acknowledge the two security men standing behind him. The principal's face didn't change. Years of being in the public eye had taught him to master his emotions, but a chill raced through him. Carter. Despite his iron control, something must have shown on his face since Carter smiled slightly. I bet you never imagined I would reach you here. Wasserman promised he would take care of me, didn't he? I don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Carter. I don't know anyone called Wasserman. If you don't leave me alone, I will have my men eject you. The principal put steel in his voice, and his eyes flicked to the two men behind Carter. They stepped forward, placed their hands on Carter, and lifted him off his chair. He didn't offer any resistance. Don't you want to know what happened to Wasserman? The principal hesitated, covered it up smoothly, and nodded to the men. They dropped him back on his seat and stepped back. Humor me, Mr. Carter. What's this about? It might pass the time while I dig into my breakfast. Why don't you get your goons to search me? You can speak freely once you know I am not wired. The principal eyed him suspiciously, and then gestured at one of his men. One man held Carter's arms while another patted him down thoroughly, removed a Glock, spare magazines, a wicked-looking knife, a long cable, and a phone. No wire? McDermott asked. The two men shook their heads. One of them removed the magazine from the Glock, another inspected Carter's phone, removed its battery, and rendered it dead. They pushed Carter back in his seat when they had finished. The waiter came forward at a hand signal from Carter, and placed a plate in front of the principal from which rose aromatic flavors. The waiter placed a similar plate in front of Carter, and when the principal raised an eyebrow, the man had the temerity to grin. I've never been to this place before. Heard a lot of it. I might as well sample the fare while I'm here. You played a good game, Shane McDermott, Carter waved his fork at the principal, and on hearing his name, McDermott went cold. You're the special advisor to the president on Middle Eastern foreign policy. You have access to the most sensitive intelligence in the country. Heck, you have the president's ear. You shape what we do in that region, how we react to events. Not a single policy decision is taken without your influence. There are very few people of Arabic origin in politics, and none more senior than you. But nobody suspects you. You can do no wrong. You were born to an Iraqi father who immigrated to this country long before you were born. He settled in Wyoming, made a life for himself, built a ranch, married into the local community, and raised you. You inherited the ranch when your folks passed away, got a pile of money from some great aunt in Europe. All that only added to the feel-good story about you. You were the American dream come true. Born to an immigrant, making it to one of the most powerful positions in the country. This isn't anything new, Carter. McDermott moistened his lips and tried to make his tone as dry as possible. My story has been covered innumerable times by the media. The president wouldn't have appointed me if I hadn't passed all the background checks and withstood the scrutiny. Carter ignored him and his fork jabbed in the air. So where did it go wrong, McDermott? What made you turn against our country? A fire burned inside McDermott, but he kept an outward calm. He took a cooling sip of water, proud that his hands didn't tremble when holding the glass. He laughed scornfully at Carter. Are you seriously accusing me of some kind of conspiracy? Of plotting against the nation? I would sue you out of existence if it wasn't funny. I am not accusing. I am stating. Carter replied calmly. You engineered the assassination of the former Saudi and Venezuelan oil ministers and then got your own appointees in place. You used several fronts to acquire fracking companies and gas and oil deposits, and then shut down the drilling. You planned and executed all this to attack the country's energy independence. McDermott sucked in his breath sharply, 
but Carter didn't pay any attention to him. He turned to one of the men behind him. Can you turn that wall TV our way and get the manager to tune into any news channel? The close protection agent was nonplussed for a moment, but went to do Carter's bidding after a glance in McDermott's direction. McDermott kept his rage in control. He had negotiated with hard-nosed presidents and dictators. This Carter was a nobody. An inconsequential person. Carter would not derail his plan. His vision would come true. Wasserman would, his train of thought came unstuck at the rolling ticker on the TV. Several fracking companies under investigation. A serious-looking reporter explained that various regulatory agencies were looking into the suspicious acquisition of several exploration companies. They were not only investigating the sources of funds, but also the management of those companies. He rattled out a series of names and a deep burn pierced through McDermott. All those are mine. He dimly heard the FBI getting into the act, looking for explanations why exploration had stopped at all those companies. The reporter assured the nation that all these companies were small. They would have no impact on oil and gas production in the country. We timed the media release so that you wouldn't have advance warning. Carter swiveled back in his seat to face McDermott. The plan was to buy more companies, buy larger ones. Take a significant stake in the country's energy resources. You would turn off some wells. You would use the cash flows and balance sheets of others to acquire more. McDermott thought fast, composed himself, and patted his lips delicately. Carter, do you have any idea of how markets work? Reducing supply will drive the price up of a commodity. If you knew anything about our country's energy situation, you would realize that we need higher oil prices. The Saudis are the ones who want to destroy our energy independence. They have created a glut in the oil market, due to which prices are low, knowing that many of our companies cannot survive for long at these prices. If by shutting down a few of our companies, the price goes up, that'll only benefit our fracking industry. He waved a hand carelessly at the TV, and allowed another disbelieving laugh. And you think I am behind all that? Can you comprehend the sums of money to execute this fantasy? It has been fun knowing you, but I must get going. Some of us have more important jobs than spinning a fanciful story. He let steel show in his eyes. Carter, next time you shoot your mouth, you'd better be able to back your words up or I'll have you cleaning toilet bowls in Idaho. He rose to leave and found his way blocked by Carter. Sit down. I don't need proof. This isn't a court of law. Something in Carter's eyes and voice made his hair rise. He made a show of glancing at his wrist and settled down. I can spare another 15 minutes. Zeb watched the special advisor seat himself and put on a game face. High prices weren't what you were after. Control of assets was your game. Manipulation and destruction of the country's energy and financial systems was your goal. But this wasn't your creation alone. Someone else was behind you. McDermott's face blanched. He drank his water in one swallow, and once he had finished, color returned to his face. You would have gotten away with it too, if it hadn't been for Elena Petrova. She heard you in that hotel all those years back. She started investigating, and when you got wind of that, you ordered her killing. McDermott opened his mouth to protest, but Zeb continued relentlessly. She died before she could reveal how far she'd gotten with her story. What you didn't know is she sent a letter. McDermott's composure deserted him for the first time, and his fingers trembled slightly. Zeb smiled easily. She didn't name you in that letter, otherwise you wouldn't be sitting here. You would be incarcerated in a prison. Or maybe you would have had a convenient accident. She left clues in the letter, but we couldn't crack them initially. Who's we? McDermott blustered. A bunch of people who care more for this country than you. Zeb paused. You wanted to know about Wasserman. He's dead if you haven't worked that out by now. We took him out in your ranch in Wyoming. Your go-to man didn't talk though. He died before he could. 
A thick sheen of sweat had appeared on McDermott's forehead. His eyes looked away for a moment when Zeb mentioned Wasserman's death. All we had to go on was Petrova's letter. I studied it again and this time it came to me. Petrova's clue to your identity was so simple, which is why we overlooked it. He stopped to drink from his glass and felt McDermott inch closer. She wrote her letter in Aramaic. Guess how many politicians in D.C., those who really wield power, have a university degree in that language? How many speak it fluently and have published papers in that language? Zeb continued when McDermott made no protest. Once we knew about you, evidence became easy. Bahamas. Zeb mentioned a bank and date. That was when Wasserman and you opened an account for the slush fund for Wasserman to use. You think banks like those keep their secrets? He shook his head. You'd be surprised at how fast they'll cooperate when the United States threatens to drive them out of business. They gave names for the account holders. Aliases, but guess what? They had photographs and fingerprints, and those nail your identity. Wasserman's as well. The money trail from that bank account leads to your go-to man. He paid law firms from that account. He moved money to other offshore accounts. Those other accounts belonged to assassins that Wasserman hired to kill some workers. You could still explain all that away. You could say Wasserman turned rogue. He acted without your knowledge. Unfortunately for you, Wasserman recorded all his calls. They were encrypted, of course, he wasn't a fool. But the people I have with me, they break that kind of encryption in their sleep. Most of those calls were bland, but one stands out. You're commissioning him to hire an international assassin to kill the Saudi minister. You didn't say that bluntly, but with all that we have, it's easy to make out what you really meant. He waited for McDermott to counter his delivery, protest, rage, but the special advisor had gone pale. His fingers were twitching, his eyes were unreadable. Then there is the evidence Petrova collected. She made a dossier, which you never found, and mailed that along with the letter. Wasserman? When did he die? McDermott's voice was hoarse. I was wondering when you'd ask. More than a month back. You wouldn't know because you had stopped communicating with him. We maintained his email account, all his correspondence, and managed the ranch, giving the impression he was alive. Carter's eyes were cold, colder than any pair McDermott had seen. He controlled a shiver when his voice continued flat, hard. The ISIS are behind you, aren't they? McDermott's knife fell on his plate with a loud clatter. He picked it up clumsily, and when he raised his eyes, Carter was sporting a thin smile. Your dad wasn't a radical Muslim, but somewhere down the line you turned, you started believing in them, started following them. McDermott found it hard to breathe. How much does he know? You met their emissaries during one of your visits to Iraq several years back. It was then you hatched this plan, didn't you? He knows that too. The words pounded a throbbing beat in McDermott's mind, drowned out all thought. How? He forced the words through lips that felt like they had taken a beating. You've heard of the Butcher of the Middle East? McDermott nodded dumbly. Everyone had heard of the masked Al-Qaeda killer who went after ISIS commanders in Iraq and Syria. The Butcher didn't just kill. He took photographs, made recordings. One of those recordings was of a group of senior ISIS leaders in a heavily protected apartment in Mosul. They were making plans, strategizing. With them was a white man, a man in disguise. We never found out who he was then, but once I knew who you were, I went back to those photographs and the recording. Carter pointed a finger at McDermott's forehead. The finger moved to his ears. It was dead easy to see behind the wig and beard once we knew your identity. That recording places you with the ISIS. It makes sense. They have the enormous sums you mentioned. Funds to buy companies and influence politicians and governments. You had smart people helping you. Their waiter came to clear the plates away. Carter looked at him once and he vanished without saying a word. 
You got the two oil ministers killed so that your men would be appointed. Candidates that you had cultivated for a long while. You bribed ministers and entire departments so that they would be frontrunners. Their role was to cause chaos in the markets with periodic statements and off-the-cuff comments. Sure, they would backtrack later, but the damage would have been done. Acquisition of assets in tandem with spooking the market. Carter shook his head in disbelief. You worked for years on this project. Years of living a double life. Your official role gave you all the inside information you needed. You would have continued executing your plan. Going after bigger assets. Maybe using lobbying firms too to smooth your way. McDermott couldn't keep his eyes away from the dining knife that Carter was toying with. The man's voice was as sharp as its blade. I am guessing at some point, when you had control of a certain number of assets, ISIS would reveal themselves as the masterminds. Maybe they would time that to a brutally violent act. Like taking out the president or some other very high-profile person, with you as an inside man, anything was possible. The words were loud in the room, but no one turned around in their direction. Financial systems would collapse. The people's confidence in government and commercial institutions would vanish. If ISIS owned several energy assets could assassinate at will, what couldn't they do? The country would take years to recover. That would be the ISIS's victory. And it could work, because everyone associates those terrorists with crude, shocking violence. No one credits them for financial terrorism and long-term stealthy planning. The pounding became harder, faster. How do you know all this? Carter's eyes were a bottomless ocean. I'm the butcher. McDermott sat winded. He looked at the man in front of him who showed not a flicker of emotion, whose eyes were cold and merciless, and then he knew why one Pentagon general had said softly. If Carter is after you, you might just as well commit suicide. Why, McDermott? This country gave everything to you. What made you betray it? The pounding broke McDermott's control. He pressed a button in his pocket, rose and yelled, ignoring the startled looks from other patrons. I might be born here, but this isn't my country. He shouted. I belong with my brothers who are fighting a great war. And you know what, Carter? We'll still get there. Carter's eyes were glacial. You fell for the ISIS rhetoric blindly. All that they're after is power. They're no better than a bunch of dictators. Cruder, more violent, but at the end, just dictators who want to control masses of people. That's what the West thinks, Carter. Spittle flew off McDermott's mouth and landed on Carter. The West has never understood us. Our way is the only way to live. What you call freedom is just an illusion. You chase wealth and think you are happy. Living in a caliphate, that is true freedom. People were starting to look around. He ignored them. They were cattle. They would be dead soon. We'll bring this country down to its knees and extend our rule. The great Satan will be wiped out when we have finished. The true believers will rule the world. He knew he was frothing, he ignored it. Carter, a foot soldier, a nothing person, wouldn't be allowed to destroy his grand plan. Shots rang outside and he laughed crazily. His men had come. Movement caught his eyes. His mind took a long time processing what he was seeing. His security detail was surrounded by guns. Guns wielded by waiters, even by the maitred. Dully he swung his eyes back at Carter. This restaurant is fully staffed by my men. You're finished. The words came at him from a distance. Zeb watched him sag back, looking older, defeat etched deep on his face. The wall behind McDermott was polished, and in its reflection, he watched a man approaching. His face was bloody, his chest had a hole, but he staggered with a gun in one outstretched hand. He came behind Zeb, lifted the gun. Zeb pushed his chair back, sliding it smoothly on the polished wooden floor of the restaurant. His hand wrapped around the dining knife, whipped back snake-like and buried it deep into the approaching man's chest. His right hand dislodged the gun from the attacker's hand. 
Something warned him, he turned his head swiftly to see McDermott's hand diving under his jacket. The attacker's gun transferred smoothly to Zeb's hand. Gun became hand. Trigger became finger. The snub-nosed revolver came out of McDermott's jacket. Its barrel turned to Zeb. Three shots rang out. One went into the ceiling. Two went into Shane McDermott. Three weeks later. Why does he want to meet us and why there? Zeb frowned at Bawana, who was driving a large SUV to a private airfield, a couple of hours outside New York. Bawana shrugged. You'll have to ask him. He wants to see us, that's all he said. Zeb looked suspiciously at the rest of his crew and got Innocence back. Broker stroked the goatee he was sporting and snapped irritably. Don't look at me like that. You're the one who's best buddies with Prince Abdul. If he hasn't told you why, how would we know? Zeb got blank looks and shrugs from the twins and the rest of them. He settled back but couldn't shake the feeling that they knew. Prince Abdul had called him one night after McDermott's killing. He couldn't stop thanking Zeb during the half-hour call. By exposing the Saudi minister, Zeb had done an enormous favor for the king and the Saudi government. The relationship between the two countries might have changed, but they still were strong allies, the minister could have undermined that. Prince Abdul hadn't mentioned a meeting during the call. McDermott's death was made out to be a driving accident, and while his funeral drew a large attendance, the president didn't show up. In the media coverage surrounding McDermott's death, no one paid much attention to the untimely demise of the very recently appointed Venezuelan oil minister. The Saudi oil minister lost his job in a cabinet reshuffle and was never heard of again. Zeb suspected his body was buried somewhere in the desert. The new official flew to Washington, D.C. immediately, where he spent considerable time meeting his counterparts and key stakeholders in the U.S. government. The Saudi government was desperate to distance itself from the previous minister and pulled out all stops. Connor Balthazar published Elena Petrova's letter as a hypothetical what-if article and gave her credit. The article went viral, sparked a global debate on the ownership of and investment into energy resources, on financial terrorism and extremism. It forced Western governments to accept its plausibility. The president's shock had turned to outrage when presented with the evidence on McDermott. Beneath the rage was a deep unease that ISIS had been able to reach so deeply into government. None of the intelligence agencies had spotted McDermott in Mosul. None of the regulatory agencies had noticed the acquisition of energy companies. Things will change here. The president is going to kick ass. Hard. He wants results not endless reports. General Klaus had told Zeb and Claire when they met at their usual coffee shop in D.C. We were all caught napping, and if it hadn't been for Zeb, we would have woken up too late. The president had replaced the directors of two intelligence agencies and one regulatory body, but they were only the start of the forthcoming overhaul. The agency was the only benefactor in the shakeup. Claire's stock was sky high with the president and the few who knew of its existence. The funds from McDermott's Bahamas account were rerouted, and the agency's slush fund increased dramatically. The president was calling for closer cooperation with its allies to deal with ISIS. There was a sense of urgency and purpose in the corridors of power, something that hadn't been seen before. Zeb stopped paying attention once the initial headlines and the political commentary went into an endless loop. You did well, son. The general's hard face creased into a smile. You never gave up. He never does, Claire commented drawly, and the smile became a grin. He saw something in Zeb's face, and his smile faded. You've something on your mind, son? The butcher should go back. This hasn't ended. The screaming engines of a Gulf Stream drowned out his reverie. He donned his shades and watched a pristine white jet taxi to the end of the runway, turn around and make its way in their direction. That's not his usual transport, Zeb yelled over the roar of the aircraft. Broker frowned in reply. How would I know? Maybe the previous one was too small for him. 
You know how these Saudi royals are. Something's up. Before he could probe further, the aircraft opened, and a retinue of uniformed staff emerged. One of them unfurled a carpet on the stairs, yet another scampered down and showered flowers on the runway. Prince Abdul exited the aircraft regally, an umbrella held over his head, and made his way to them. His assistant and bodyguards followed a couple of steps behind. The prince left the shade of the umbrella when he neared them, extended his arms and hugged Zeb tight, and kissed him on his cheeks. He bent over and kissed Chloe in the twins' hands, and then stood back and silently inspected them. You didn't tell me. He wagged an admonishing finger at Zeb. I had to hear from other people that you found the assassin who killed my brother. Zeb mumbled an apology and glared at his team who were enjoying his discomfort. He hadn't mentioned the killer during the long call he had with the prince. The royal removed his shades and beamed at them. We are indebted to you, Zeb. You saved our honor yet again. Imagine the pressure on his royal highness if we hadn't found the killer. Now we can declare that justice has been done. He clapped his hands and one of his staff stepped forward with a tray. Zeb fidgeted uneasily, not liking where this was going. Sir, no thanks are necessary. I am not sure how you found out. He stopped when the prince held up his hand and stepped forward with an envelope. He held the envelope with both hands and handed it to Zeb with a flourish. My country cannot thank you enough. Please accept this as a sign of our gratitude. Sir, you've already honored us, Zeb protested. He looked at his friends for support, but all of them were looking away. The prince drew his eyebrows together. I noticed your aircraft the last time you visited. It's old. It's not worthy of transporting a close friend of the royal family. Aircraft. The prince nodded at the envelope and then turned to the Gulf Stream. This will be your jet from now on. He announced grandly. Mouth. Shut. Megan hissed at Zeb. He clicked his jaws together, looked at the Gulf Stream, his friends and the prince. Sir, this is too. Too small? The prince whirled at his assistant. When do we get that Boeing we ordered? Get it outfitted for Zeb, as soon as it arrives. The assistant nodded obsequiously, took notes, made calls. Prince Abdul turned back at Zeb and beamed. All taken care of, my friend. You'll have a bigger aircraft. I should have realized. My apologies. I would rather deal with ten assassins than a grateful Saudi prince. Sir, you don't understand. We don't need the Boeing. We don't even need this one. It's too flashy. The prince's whirling act came on again, and this time there was a note of accusation. I told you he needed a stealth fighter. When can you get one? Looks like we got a new plane, bro. Bawana chuckled softly over the prince's torrent of words. It took an hour to convince Prince Abdul that the Gulf Stream would do, and that they didn't need medals or cash rewards. The first stretch limo arrived, the length of half a city block, and after another round of hugs and kisses, the prince departed. You knew this all along? Zeb accused his team. Chloe couldn't contain her laugh. Word got to us. The prince was adamant that you didn't know beforehand. Zeb sighed ruefully. I give up. How do we get this thing off the ground now? You'll find that it came with two pilots. Ours. Roger replied laconically and headed to the aircraft. Zeb knew when he was beaten and followed his team silently. Where to boss? His pilot asked him when they had boarded. New York. Zeb's eyes were unseeing when the Gulf Stream roared down the stretch of concrete and parted ways with Earth. He looked out of the window as it circled once, but the greens and the browns of his country below didn't register. The sunset painted hues of orange on the wings, but he didn't notice. A pair of blue eyes watched him steadily, the faintest trace of humor in them. Watching the sunset? He shook his head imperceptibly. No need. My sun still rises and sets with you. 
the eyes smiled and became a fire that warmed him and carried him home. The End Bonus Chapter from Hunting You The Next in the Series Herb Hank Parker was having dinner with his family in Damascus, Virginia, when the masked men burst inside. Hank had a small construction business that wasn't ever going to make him extraordinarily rich, but it fed his children and kept his family happy, which was all that really mattered. Damascus had a population of less than a thousand people, and crime was almost unheard of. There was that time when a few kids had set fire inside a trash can, but Hank couldn't remember the last time a home had been burgled or a murder had been committed. There were three intruders, all of medium build, all brown or black-eyed, it was hard to see in the dining room's light. The three flanked the dining room, one at its head, two at each side. Each one of them carried a handgun that was casually, but effectively held. Hank recognized that stance, these men were used to carrying and using handguns. Petals, his six-year-old daughter, and Emily, his wife, started screaming on seeing the intruders. Nine-year-old Cody started hyperventilating. Hank had been to Iraq in a special unit that did nasty stuff to the enemy. He had lived through a war that he never spoke of. Hank kept calm. There's some money in the safe in the bedroom, he said evenly. My wallet's in the living room. There's some cash in it. We don't have any jewelry. Please take the cash and anything else you want. We won't offer any trouble. The hooded man at the head of the table looked at him in silence for a moment, then lifted his gun and shot Cody. A full minute of silence fell in the room and then Emily started screaming, petals heaved dryly, her eyes wide and unseeing. No. Hank left his seat like a rocket, his compact frame heaving the table to one side, his hands outstretched, reaching out for the nearest gunman to rip his heart out. A gun came crashing down on him, and when he came to, he was tied to a chair, his wife and daughter similarly restrained seated opposite him. Petals seemed to have gone into a fugue, Emily's eyes were glazed and she was moaning softly. Where's the money you stole from Big G? The masked man asked in a tone that was almost bored. Hank shook his head woozily, and when he looked at his son's body, it all came back to him. He turned to the masked man and tried to focus his eyes. The man's accent was American, but beyond that, Hank couldn't make out regional influences. Big G? I don't know him, man. I never stole any money from anyone. He strained against his bonds but they were tight and there was no wriggle room. His wife's eyes flickered at the sound of his voice, but she didn't look his way. Petals was still out of it. Thank the Lord for that. He forced his body to wake up, stay alert, and remain calm. My family needs me. He didn't look in Cody's direction. You got the wrong family, friend. Please take whatever money we have and leave. The masked hood crouched before him and Hank now saw his eyes were brown. Everyone starts off with a lie. The masked man nodded to one of his gunmen. The screaming began. Ninety minutes later, Hank lay on his side, his insides spilling out. Death was hovering close by, waiting, hiding in the dark mist that was closing in on him. His eyes stared dully on the floor, raising them was too much of an effort. If he lifted them, he would have seen the bodies of his wife and daughter slumped on the floor. A shadow moved, the hood knelt beside him and grabbed his hair and lifted his head. The man's face swam in Hank's vision but never focused. Now do you remember? The elevated angle brought his family into view, and something primeval stirred within Hank. In its dying moments, his memory unfolded a face and a name. A person that even death tiptoed around. Zebediah Carter. He has the money. Hank gasped out with his last breath and died with the hint of a smile on his face. Zeb Carter would avenge his family's death. Big G paced the small cell of his high-security prison in Guadalajara, Mexico, when word got to him that Hank Parker had named some other man just before he died. Big G was built like a tank, every inch of his body covered in tats. Muscles rippled when he walked, and his black eyes bored holes into anyone he came across. Nobody bothered him in the prison, 
Heck, he ran it like his private office, any number of prisoners ready to do his bidding. He had members of his gang in the prison who relayed commands to the outside world, using a network of corrupt officials. His gang ran like clockwork, even though Big G was incarcerated, living in a cell smaller than a bathroom in most American homes. His clenched fists were knotted to the size of boxing gloves at the thought that he, Big G, was reduced to pacing like an animal in a cage. All because of that snitch. Seven years ago, Big G was the undisputed criminal gang lord on the east coast of the United States. Having split from the Killer Booze, a fast-growing inner-city gang in Miami, Big G had built his criminal enterprise slowly, but surely, and always violently. He bartered with those gangs he couldn't subdue, killed the leaders of those gangs smaller than his, acquired territory, and became one of the most fearsome thugs on the eastern seaboard. His gang marking was simple, a large G tattooed on every man's neck. Spray-painted Gs on the walls of the territories they controlled. His crew was over 200 strong and was a major supplier of drugs from New Hampshire to Miami. His gang's reach extended to Chicago, Tennessee, and Atlanta, where he had chapters. Big G didn't limit his business to narcotics alone, however. He also ran women and children in numerous cities and towns in that area. He dealt in stolen cars, laundered money and ran protection rackets. The feds were after him, as were numerous other law agencies, but not one could find him, nor could they find anything on him. That changed when a snitch spilled Big G's dealings and whereabouts in return for witness protection. Caesar, a dealer who ran the gang in Virginia, had been with Big G right from the killer booze days. He was part of the inner circle, trusted with everything, and spent time with Big G on a daily basis. He had started changing when he had hooked up with a new woman. She wanted him to go straight and went about reforming him. She bombarded his ears every minute till Caesar couldn't take it any longer and went to the feds. Big G got wind of it and fled to Mexico where he had connections, but the federales over there were quick to act on a tip-off and grabbed him when he crossed the border. Big G was carted off to the high-security prison where he still was. Big G uncurled his fists and breathed deeply, slow calming breaths that some crackhead had taught him. In. Pause. Out. In. Pause. Out. The crackhead swore by deep breathing and said it balanced inner chakras, whatever the fuck they were. Caesar. It was bad enough that he had turned snitch. He had also stolen $30 million from the gang. My money. Big G's gang had started hunting him the moment the gang lord had established his supremacy and dominance in the prison. Over four years of establishing contacts and bribing people had finally paid off. The gang got a contact in the Marshal Service, which ran the Witness Protection Program. The contact demanded a million dollars. Big G authorized it. One mil in return for 30? It was a no-brainer. More than the money, he wanted to lay his hands on Caesar and that bitch who had taken away his freedom. The contact revealed that Caesar was now one Herb Parker, living in Damascus with his family, and had quit the old ways. Big G ordered his men to look into Parker, and they dutifully reported that the timeline fit. Parker and his family were the right age. They smuggled photographs in the prison, and they were the clincher. Parker looked like Caesar. His wife looked like the bitch. That was enough for Big G. He ordered the hit, and when his men reported that Caesar and his family had died, Big G closed his eyes for a moment. They flashed open the next second when his man said they hadn't recovered the money. Big G's eyes riddled the man in front of him, and for a moment he was tempted to snap the criminal's scrawny neck. His hood must have sensed his life was in danger, for he spoke rapidly. Caesar had mentioned a name. He had said that person would have the money. That man's name was Zebediah Carter. Big G tried to place the man. Nope, he hadn't heard of him. Find him. Find my money. Then kill him. Slowly. He ordered and exited the cell. He walked down the prison corridor, enjoying the silence that fell when he approached. 
everyone feared him. Now this man Carter would feel his wrath. End of bonus chapter. Author's message. Thank you for taking the time to read behind you. If you enjoyed it, please consider telling your friends and posting a short review. Check out Ty Patterson on his website, typatterson.com. Search for the Facebook group of Ty Patterson's readers on Facebook and join it.